Prologue Yali's Question We all know that history has proceeded very differently for peoples from different parts of the globe. In the 13,000 years since the end of the last Ice Age, some parts of the world developed literate industrial societies with metal tools, other parts developed only non-literate farming societies, and still others retained societies of hunter-gatherers with stone tools. Those historical inequalities have cast long shadows on the modern world because the literate societies with metal tools have conquered or exterminated the other societies. While those differences constitute the most basic fact of world history, the reasons for them remain uncertain and controversial. This puzzling question of their origins was posed to me 25 years ago in a simple personal form. In July 1972, I was walking along a beach on the tropical island of New Guinea, where, as a biologist, I study bird evolution. I had already heard about a remarkable local politician named Yali, who was touring the district then. By chance, Yali and I were walking in the same direction on that day, and he overtook me. We walked together for an hour, talking during the whole time. Yali radiated charisma and energy. His eyes flashed in a mesmerizing way. He talked confidently about himself, but he also asked lots of probing questions and listened intently. Our conversation began with a subject then on every New Guinean's mind, the rapid pace of political developments. Papua New Guinea, as Yali's nation is now called, was at that time still administered by Australia as a mandate of the United Nations, but independence was in the air. Yali explained to me his role in getting local people to prepare for self-government. After a while, Yali turned the conversation and began to quiz me. He had never been outside New Guinea and had not been educated beyond high school, but his curiosity was insatiable. First, he wanted to know about my work on New Guinea birds, including how much I got paid for it. I explained to him how different groups of birds had colonized New Guinea over the course of millions of years. He then asked how the ancestors of his own people had reached New Guinea over the last tens of thousands of years, and how white Europeans had colonized New Guinea within the last 200 years. The conversation remained friendly, even though the tension between the two societies that Yali and I represented was familiar to both of us. Two centuries ago, all New Guineans were still living in the Stone Age. That is, they still used stone tools similar to those superseded in Europe by metal tools thousands of years ago, and they dwelt in villages not organized under any centralized political authority. Whites had arrived, imposed centralized government, and brought material goods whose value New Guineans instantly recognized, ranging from steel axes, matches, and medicines to clothing, soft drinks, and umbrellas. In New Guinea, all these goods were referred to collectively as cargo. Many of the white colonists openly despised New Guineans as primitive, even the least able of New Guinea's white masters, as they were still called in 1972, enjoyed a far higher standard of living than New Guineans, higher even than charismatic politicians like Yali. Yet Yali had quizzed lots of whites as he was then quizzing me, and I had quizzed lots of New Guineans. He and I both knew perfectly well that New Guineans are on the average at least as smart as Europeans. All those things must have been on Yali's mind when, with yet another penetrating glance of his flashing eyes, he asked me, Why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it to New Guinea, but we black people had little cargo of our own? It was a simple question that went to the heart of life as Yali experienced it. Yes, there still is a huge difference between the lifestyle of the average New Guinean and that of the average European or American. Comparable differences separate the lifestyles of other peoples of the world as well. Those huge disparities must have potent causes that one might think would be obvious. Yet Yali's apparently simple question is a difficult one to answer. I didn't have an answer then. Professional historians still disagree about the solution. Most are no longer even asking the question. In the years since Yali and I had that conversation, I have studied and written about other aspects of human evolution, history, and language. This book, written 25 years later, attempts to answer Yali. Although Yali's question concerned only the contrasting lifestyles of New Guineans and of European whites, it can be extended to a larger set of contrasts within the modern world. Peoples of Eurasian origin, especially those still living in Europe and Eastern Asia, plus those transplanted to North America, 
dominate the modern world in wealth and power. Other peoples, including most Africans, have thrown off European colonial domination but remain far behind in wealth and power. Still other peoples, such as the aboriginal inhabitants of Australia, the Americas, and southernmost Africa, are no longer even masters of their own lands, but have been decimated, subjugated, and in some cases even exterminated by European colonialists. Thus, questions about inequality in the modern world can be reformulated as follows. Why did wealth and power become distributed as they now are, rather than in some other way? For instance, why weren't Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians the ones who decimated, subjugated, or exterminated Europeans and Asians? We can easily push this question back one step. As of the year A.D. 1500, when Europe's worldwide colonial expansion was just beginning, peoples on different continents already differed greatly in technology and political organization. Much of Europe, Asia, and North Africa was the site of metal-equipped states or empires, some of them on the threshold of industrialization. Two Native American peoples, the Aztecs and the Incas, ruled over empires with stone tools. Parts of sub-Saharan Africa were divided among small states or chiefdoms with iron tools. Most other peoples, including all those of Australia and New Guinea, many Pacific islands, much of the Americas, and small parts of sub-Saharan Africa, lived as farming tribes or even still as hunter-gatherer bands using stone tools. Of course, those technological and political differences as of A.D. 1500 were the immediate cause of the modern world's inequalities. Empires with steel weapons were able to conquer or exterminate tribes with weapons of stone and wood. How, though, did the world get to be the way it was in A.D. 1500? Once again, we can easily push this question back one step further by drawing on written histories and archaeological discoveries. Until the end of the last Ice Age, around 11,000 B.C., all peoples on all continents were still hunter-gatherers. Different rates of development on different continents, from 11,000 B.C. to A.D. 1500, were what led to the technological and political inequalities of A.D. 1500. While Aboriginal Australians and many Native Americans remained hunter-gatherers, most of Eurasia and much of the Americas and Sub-Saharan Africa gradually developed agriculture, herding, metallurgy, and complex political organization. Parts of Eurasia and one area of the Americas independently developed writing as well. However, each of these new developments appeared earlier in Eurasia than elsewhere. For instance, the mass production of bronze tools, which was just beginning in the South American Andes in the centuries before A.D. 1500, was already established in parts of Eurasia over 4,000 years earlier. The stone technology of the Tasmanians, when first encountered by European explorers in A.D. 1642, was simpler than that prevalent in parts of Upper Paleolithic Europe tens of thousands of years earlier. Thus, we can finally rephrase the question about the modern world's inequalities as follows. Why did human development proceed at such different rates on different continents? Those disparate rates constitute history's broadest pattern and my book's subject. While this book is thus ultimately about history and prehistory, its subject is not of just academic interest, but also of overwhelming practical and political importance. The history of interactions among disparate peoples is what shaped the modern world through conquest, epidemics, and genocide. Those collisions created reverberations that have still not died down after many centuries and that are actively continuing in some of the world's most troubled areas today. For example, much of Africa is still struggling with its legacies from recent colonialism. In other regions, including much of Central America, Mexico, Peru, New Caledonia, the former Soviet Union, and parts of Indonesia, civil unrest or guerrilla warfare pits still numerous indigenous populations against governments dominated by descendants of invading conquerors. Many other indigenous populations, such as Native Hawaiians, Aboriginal Australians, Native Siberians, and Indians in the United States, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile, became so reduced in numbers by genocide and disease that they are now greatly outnumbered by the descendants of invaders. Although thus incapable of mounting a civil war, they are nevertheless increasingly asserting their rights. In addition to these current political and economic reverberations of past collisions among peoples, there are current linguistic reverberations. 
especially the impending disappearance of most of the modern world's 6,000 surviving languages, becoming replaced by English, Chinese, Russian, and a few other languages whose numbers of speakers have increased enormously in recent centuries. All these problems of the modern world result from the different historical trajectories implicit in Yali's question. Before seeking answers to Yali's question, we should pause to consider some objections to discussing it at all. Some people take offense at the mere posing of the question for several reasons. One objection goes as follows. If we succeed in explaining how some people came to dominate other people, may this not seem to justify the domination? Doesn't it seem to say that the outcome was inevitable, and that it would therefore be futile to try to change the outcome today? This objection rests on a common tendency to confuse an explanation of causes with a justification or acceptance of results. What use one makes of a historical explanation is a question separate from the explanation itself. Understanding is more often used to try to alter an outcome than to repeat or perpetuate it. That's why psychologists try to understand the minds of murderers and rapists, why social historians try to understand genocide, and why physicians try to understand the causes of human disease. Those investigators do not seek to justify murder, rape, genocide, and illness. Instead, they seek to use their understanding of a chain of causes to interrupt the chain. Second, doesn't addressing Yali's question automatically involve a Eurocentric approach to history, a glorification of Western Europeans, and an obsession with the prominence of Western Europe and Europeanized America in the modern world? Isn't that prominence just an ephemeral phenomenon of the last few centuries, now fading behind the prominence of Japan and Southeast Asia? In fact, most of this book will deal with peoples other than Europeans. Rather than focus solely on interactions between Europeans and non-Europeans, we shall also examine interactions between different non-European peoples, especially those that took place within Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and New Guinea, among peoples native to those areas. Far from glorifying peoples of Western European origin, we shall see that most basic elements of their civilization were developed by other peoples living elsewhere and were then imported to Western Europe. Third, don't words such as civilization and phrases such as rise of civilization convey the false impression that civilization is good, tribal hunter-gatherers are miserable, and history for the past 13,000 years has involved progress toward greater human happiness? In fact, I do not assume that industrialized states are better than hunter-gatherer tribes, or that the abandonment of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle for iron-based statehood represents progress, or that it has led to an increase in human happiness. My own impression from having divided my life between United States cities and New Guinea villages is that the so-called blessings of civilization are mixed. For example, compared with hunter-gatherers, citizens of modern industrialized states enjoy better medical care, lower risk of death by homicide, and a longer lifespan, but receive much less social support from friendships and extended families. My motive for investigating these geographic differences in human societies is not to celebrate one type of society over another, but simply to understand what happened in history. Does Yali's question really need another book to answer it? Don't we already know the answer? If so, what is it? Probably the commonest explanation involves implicitly or explicitly assuming biological differences among peoples. In the centuries after A.D. 1500, as European explorers became aware of the wide differences among the world's peoples in technology and political organization, they assumed that those differences arose from differences in innate ability. With the rise of Darwinian theory, explanations were recast in terms of natural selection and of evolutionary descent. Technologically primitive peoples were considered evolutionary vestiges of human descent from ape-like ancestors. The displacement of such peoples by colonists from industrialized societies exemplified the survival of the fittest. With the later rise of genetics, the explanations were recast once again in genetic terms. Europeans became considered genetically more intelligent than Africans, and especially more so than Aboriginal Australians. Today, segments of Western society publicly repudiate racism. Yet many, perhaps most, Westerners continue to accept racist explanations privately or subconsciously. In Japan and many other countries, such explanations are still advanced publicly and without apology. 
Even educated white Americans, Europeans, and Australians, when the subject of Australian Aborigines comes up, assume that there is something primitive about the Aborigines themselves. They certainly look different from whites. Many of the living descendants of those Aborigines who survived the era of European colonization are now finding it difficult to succeed economically in white Australian society. A seemingly compelling argument goes as follows. White immigrants to Australia built a literate, industrialized, politically centralized, democratic state based on metal tools and on food production, all within a century of colonizing a continent where the Aborigines had been living as tribal hunter-gatherers without metal for at least 40,000 years. Here were two successive experiments in human development in which the environment was identical and the sole variable was the people occupying that environment. What further proof could be wanted to establish that the differences between Aboriginal Australian and European societies arose from differences between the peoples themselves? The objection to such racist explanations is not just that they are loathsome, but also that they are wrong. Sound evidence for the existence of human differences in intelligence that parallel human differences in technology is lacking. In fact, as I shall explain in a moment, modern Stone Age peoples are on the average probably more intelligent, not less intelligent, than industrialized peoples. Paradoxical as it may sound, we shall see that white immigrants to Australia do not deserve the credit usually accorded to them for building a literate industrialized society with the other virtues mentioned above. In addition, peoples who until recently were technologically primitive, such as Aboriginal Australians and New Guineans, routinely master industrial technologies when given opportunities to do so. An enormous effort by cognitive psychologists has gone into the search for differences in IQ between peoples of different geographic origins now living in the same country. In particular, numerous white American psychologists have been trying for decades to demonstrate that black Americans of African origins are innately less intelligent than white Americans of European origins. However, as is well known, the peoples compared differ greatly in their social environment and educational opportunities. This fact creates double difficulties for efforts to test the hypothesis that intellectual differences underlie technological differences. First, even our cognitive abilities as adults are heavily influenced by the social environment that we experienced during childhood, making it hard to discern any influence of pre-existing genetic differences. Second, tests of cognitive ability, like IQ tests, tend to measure cultural learning and not pure innate intelligence, whatever that is. Because of those undoubted effects of childhood environment and learned knowledge on IQ test results, the psychologists' efforts to date have not succeeded in convincingly establishing the postulated genetic deficiency in IQs of non-white peoples. My perspective on this controversy comes from 33 years of working with New Guineans in their own intact societies. From the very beginning of my work with New Guineans, they impressed me as being on the average more intelligent, more alert, more expressive, and more interested in things and people around them than the average European or American is. At some tasks that one might reasonably suppose to reflect aspects of brain function, such as the ability to perform a mental map of unfamiliar surroundings, they appear considerably more adept than Westerners. Of course, New Guineans tend to perform poorly at tasks that Westerners have been trained to perform since childhood and that New Guineans have not. Hence, when unschooled New Guineans from remote villages visit towns, they look stupid to Westerners. Conversely, I am constantly aware of how stupid I look to New Guineans when I'm with them in the jungle, displaying my incompetence at simple tasks, such as following a jungle trail or erecting a shelter, at which New Guineans have been trained since childhood and I have not. It's easy to recognize two reasons why my impression that New Guineans are smarter than Westerners may be correct. First, Europeans have for thousands of years been living in densely populated societies with central governments, police, and judiciaries. In those societies, infectious epidemic diseases of dense populations, such as smallpox, were historically the major cause of death, while murders were relatively uncommon and a state of war was the exception rather than the rule. Most Europeans who escaped fatal infections also escaped other potential causes of death and proceeded to pass on their genes. Today, most live-born Western infants survive fatal infections as well and reproduce themselves, regardless of their intelligence and the genes they bear. 
In contrast, New Guineans have been living in societies where human numbers were too low for epidemic diseases of dense populations to evolve. Instead, traditional New Guineans suffered high mortality from murder, chronic tribal warfare, accidents, and problems in procuring food. Intelligent people are likelier than less intelligent ones to escape those causes of high mortality in traditional New Guinea societies. However, the differential mortality from epidemic diseases in traditional European societies had little to do with intelligence and instead involved genetic resistance dependent on details of body chemistry. For example, people with blood group B or O have a greater resistance to smallpox than do people with blood group A. That is, natural selection promoting genes for intelligence has probably been far more ruthless in New Guinea than in more densely populated, politically complex societies, where natural selection for body chemistry was instead more potent. Besides this genetic reason, there is also a second reason why New Guineans may have come to be smarter than Westerners. Modern European and American children spend much of their time being passively entertained by television, radio, and movies. In the average American household, the TV set is on for seven hours per day. In contrast, traditional New Guinea children have virtually no such opportunities for passive entertainment and instead spend almost all of their waking hours actively doing something, such as talking or playing with other children or adults. Almost all studies of child development emphasize the role of childhood stimulation and activity in promoting mental development and stress the irreversible mental stunting associated with reduced childhood stimulation. This effect surely contributes a non-genetic component to the superior average mental function displayed by New Guineans. That is, in mental ability, New Guineans are probably genetically superior to Westerns, and they surely are superior in escaping the devastating developmental disadvantages under which most children in industrialized societies now grow up. Certainly there is no hint at all of any intellectual disadvantage of New Guineans that could serve to answer Yali's question. The same two genetic and childhood developmental factors are likely to distinguish not only New Guineans from Westerners, but also hunter-gatherers and other members of technologically primitive societies from members of technologically advanced societies in general. Thus, the usual racist assumption has to be turned on its head. Why is it that Europeans, despite their likely genetic disadvantage and, in modern times, their undoubted developmental disadvantage, ended up with much more of the cargo? Why did New Guineans wind up technologically primitive despite what I believe to be their superior intelligence? A genetic explanation isn't the only possible answer to Yali's question. Another one, popular with inhabitants of northern Europe, invokes the supposed stimulatory effects of their homeland's cold climate and the inhibitory effects of hot, humid, tropical climates on human creativity and energy. Perhaps the seasonally variable climate at high latitudes poses more diverse challenges than does a seasonally constant tropical climate. Perhaps cold climates require one to be more technologically inventive to survive, because one must build a warm home and make warm clothing, whereas one can survive in the tropics with simpler housing and no clothing. Or the argument can be reversed to reach the same conclusion. The long winters at high latitudes leave people with much time in which to sit indoors and invent. Although formerly popular, this type of explanation too fails to survive scrutiny. As we shall see, the peoples of Northern Europe contributed nothing of fundamental importance to Eurasian civilization until the last thousand years. They simply had the good luck to live at a geographic location where they were likely to receive advances, such as agriculture, wheels, writing, and metallurgy, developed in warmer parts of Eurasia. In the New World, the cold regions at high latitude were even more of a human backwater. The sole Native American societies to develop writing arose in Mexico, south of the Tropic of Cancer. The oldest New World pottery comes from near the equator in tropical South America and the New World Society generally considered the most advanced in art, astronomy, and other respects, was the classic Maya society of the tropical Yucatan and Guatemala in the first millennium A.D. Still a third type of answer to Yali invokes the supposed importance of lowland river valleys in dry climates, where highly productive agriculture depended on large-scale irrigation systems that in turn required centralized bureaucracies. 
This explanation was suggested by the undoubted fact that the earliest known empires and writing systems arose in the Tigris and Euphrates valleys of the Fertile Crescent and in the Nile Valley of Egypt. Water control systems also appear to have been associated with centralized political organizations in some other areas of the world, including the Indus Valley of the Indian subcontinent, the Yellow and Yangtze Valleys of China, the Maya Lowlands of Mesoamerica, and the coastal desert of Peru. However, detailed archaeological studies have shown that complex irrigation systems did not accompany the rise of centralized bureaucracies, but followed after a considerable lag. That is, political centralization arose for some other reason and then permitted construction of complex irrigation systems. None of the crucial developments preceding political centralization in those same parts of the world were associated with river valleys or with complex irrigation systems. For example, in the Fertile Crescent, food production and village life originated in hills and mountains, not in lowland river valleys. The Nile Valley remained a cultural backwater for about 3,000 years after village food production began to flourish in the hills of the Fertile Crescent. River valleys of the southwestern United States eventually came to support irrigation agriculture and complex societies, but only after many of the developments on which those societies rested had been imported from Mexico. The river valleys of southeastern Australia remained occupied by tribal societies without agriculture. Yet another type of explanation lists the immediate factors that enabled Europeans to kill or conquer other peoples, especially European guns, infectious diseases, steel tools, and manufactured products. Such an explanation is on the right track, as those factors demonstrably were directly responsible for European conquests. However, this hypothesis is incomplete because it still offers only approximate, first-stage explanation identifying immediate causes. It invites a search for ultimate causes. Why were Europeans, rather than Africans or Native Americans, the ones to end up with guns, the nastiest germs, and steel? While some progress has been made in identifying those ultimate causes in the case of Europe's conquest of the New World, Africa remains a big puzzle. Africa is the continent where proto-humans evolved for the longest time, where anatomically modern humans may also have arisen, and where native diseases like malaria and yellow fever killed European explorers. If a long head start counts for anything, why didn't guns and steel arise first in Africa, permitting Africans and their germs to conquer Europe? And what accounts for the failure of Aboriginal Australians to pass beyond the stage of hunter-gatherers with stone tools? Questions that emerge from worldwide comparisons of human societies formerly attracted much attention from historians and geographers. The best-known modern example of such an effort was Arnold Toynbee's 12-volume study of history. Toynbee was especially interested in the internal dynamics of 23 advanced civilizations, of which 22 were literate and 19 were Eurasian. He was less interested in prehistory and in simpler non-literate societies. Yet the roots of inequality in the modern world lie far back in prehistory. Hence, Toynbee did not pose Yali's question, nor did he come to grips with what I see as history's broadest pattern. Other available books on world history similarly tend to focus on advanced literate Eurasian civilizations of the last 5,000 years. They have a very brief treatment of pre-Columbian Native American civilizations and an even briefer discussion of the rest of the world except for its recent interactions with Eurasian civilizations. Since Toynbee's attempt, worldwide syntheses of historical causation have fallen into disfavor among most historians as posing an apparently intractable problem. Specialists from several disciplines have provided global syntheses of their subjects. Especially useful contributions have been made by ecological geographers, cultural anthropologists, biologists studying plant and animal domestication, and scholars concerned with the impact of infectious diseases on history. These studies have called attention to parts of the puzzle, but they provide only pieces of the needed broad synthesis that has been missing. Thus, there is no generally accepted answer to Yali's question. On the one hand, the proximate explanations are clear. Some peoples developed guns, germs, steel, and other factors conferring political and economic power before others did. And some peoples never developed these power factors at all. 
On the other hand, the ultimate explanations, for example, why bronze tools appeared early in parts of Eurasia, late and only locally in the New World, and never in Aboriginal Australia, remain unclear. Our present lack of such ultimate explanations leaves a big intellectual gap, since the broadest pattern of history thus remains unexplained. Much more serious, though, is the moral gap left unfilled. It is perfectly obvious to everyone, whether an overt racist or not, that different peoples have fared differently in history. The modern United States is a European-molded society, occupying lands conquered from Native Americans and incorporating the descendants of millions of sub-Saharan black Africans brought to America as slaves. Modern Europe is not a society molded by sub-Saharan black Africans who brought millions of Native Americans as slaves. These results are completely lopsided. It was not the case that 51% of the Americas, Australia, and Africa was conquered by Europeans, while 49% of Europe was conquered by Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, or Africans. The whole modern world has been shaped by lopsided outcomes. Hence, they must have inexorable explanations, ones more basic than mere details concerning who happened to win some battle or develop some invention on one occasion a few thousand years ago. It seems logical to suppose that history's pattern reflects innate differences among people themselves. Of course, we're taught that it's not polite to say so in public. We read of technical studies claiming to demonstrate inborn differences, and we also read rebuttals claiming that those studies suffer from technical flaws. We see in our daily lives that some of the conquered peoples continue to form an underclass, centuries after the conquests or slave imports took place. We're told that this, too, is to be attributed not to any biological shortcomings, but to social disadvantages and limited opportunities. Nevertheless, we have to wonder. We keep seeing all those glaring, persistent differences in people's status. We're assured that the seemingly transparent biological explanation for the world's inequalities as of A.D. 1500 is wrong, but we're not told what the correct explanation is. Until we have some convincing, detailed, agreed-upon explanation for the broad pattern of history, most people will continue to suspect that the racist biological explanation is correct after all. That seems to me the strongest argument for writing this book. Up to the starting line. What happened on all the continents before 11,000 B.C.? A suitable starting point from which to compare historical developments on the different continents is around 11,000 B.C. This date corresponds approximately to the beginnings of village life in a few parts of the world, the first undisputed peopling of the Americas, the end of the Pleistocene era and last Ice Age, and the start of what geologists term the Recent Era. Plant and animal domestication began in at least one part of the world within a few thousand years of that date. As of then, did the people of some continents already have a head start or a clear advantage over peoples of other continents? If so, perhaps that head start, amplified over the last 13,000 years, provides the answer to Yali's question. Hence, this chapter will offer a whirlwind tour of human history on all the continents for millions of years, from our origins as a species until 13,000 years ago. All that will now be summarized in less than 20 pages. Naturally, I shall gloss over details and mention only what seems to me the trends most relevant to this book. Our closest living relatives are three surviving species of great ape, the gorilla, the common chimpanzee, and the pygmy chimpanzee, also known as bonobo. Their confinement to Africa, along with abundant fossil evidence, indicates that the earliest stages of human evolution were also played out in Africa. Human history, as something separate from the history of animals, began there about 7 million years ago. Estimates range from 5 to 9 million years ago. Around that time, a population of African apes broke up into several populations, of which one proceeded to evolve into modern gorillas, a second into the two modern chimps, and the third into humans. The gorilla line apparently split off slightly before the split between the chimp and the human lines. Fossils indicate that the evolutionary line leading to us had achieved a substantially upright posture by around four million years ago, then began to increase in body size and in relative brain size around 2.5 million years ago. Those proto-humans are generally known as Australopithecus africanus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus, 
which apparently evolved into each other in that sequence. Although Homo erectus, the stage reached around 1.7 million years ago, was close to us modern humans in body size, its brain size was still barely half of ours. Stone tools became common around 2.5 million years ago, but they were merely the crudest of flaked or battered stones. In zoological significance and distinctiveness, Homo erectus was more than an ape, but still much less than a modern human. All of that human history, for the first five or six million years after our origins, about seven million years ago, remained confined to Africa. The first human ancestor to spread beyond Africa was Homo erectus, as is attested by fossils discovered on the Southeast Asian island of Java and conventionally known as Java Man. The oldest Java Man fossils, of course they may actually have belonged to a Java woman, have usually been assumed to date from about a million years ago. However, it has recently been argued that they actually date from 1.8 million years ago. Strictly speaking, the name Homo erectus belongs to these Javan fossils, and the African fossils classified as Homo erectus may warrant a different name. At present, the earliest unquestioned evidence for humans in Europe stems from around half a million years ago, but there are claims of an earlier presence. One would certainly assume that the colonization of Asia also permitted the simultaneous colonization of Europe, since Eurasia is a single landmass not bisected by major barriers. That illustrates an issue that will recur throughout this book. Whenever some scientist claims to have discovered the earliest X, whether X is the earliest human fossil in Europe, the earliest evidence of domesticated corn in Mexico, or the earliest anything anywhere, that announcement challenges other scientists to beat the claim by finding something still earlier. In reality, there must be some truly earliest X, with all claims of earlier Xs being false. However, as we shall see, for virtually any X, every year brings forth new discoveries and claims of a purported still earlier X, along with refutations of some or all of previous year's claims of earlier X. It often takes decades of searching before archaeologists reach a consensus on such questions. By about half a million years ago, human fossils had diverged from older Homo erectus skeletons in their enlarged, rounder, and less angular skulls. African and European skulls of half a million years ago were sufficiently similar to skulls of us moderns that they were classified in our species, Homo sapiens, instead of in Homo erectus. This distinction is necessarily arbitrary, since Homo erectus evolved into Homo sapiens. However, these early Homo sapiens still differed from us in skeletal details, had brains significantly smaller than ours, and were grossly different from us in their artifacts and behavior. Modern stone tool-making peoples, such as Yali's great-grandparents, would have scorned the stone tools of half a million years ago as very crude. The only other significant addition to our ancestors' cultural repertoire that can be documented with confidence around that time was the use of fire. No art, bone tool, or anything else has come down to us from early Homo sapiens except for their skeletal remains, plus those crude stone tools. There were still no humans in Australia, for the obvious reason that it would have taken boats to get there from Southeast Asia. There were also no humans anywhere in the Americas, because that would have required the occupation of the nearest part of the Eurasian continent, Siberia, and possibly boat-building skills as well. The present shallow Bering Strait, separating Siberia from Alaska, alternated between a strait and a broad intercontinental bridge of dry land, as sea level repeatedly rose and fell during the Ice Ages. However, boat building and survival in cold Siberia were both still far beyond the capabilities of early Homo sapiens. After half a million years ago, the human populations of Africa and western Eurasia proceeded to diverge from each other and from East Asian populations in skeletal details. The population of Europe and Western Asia between 130,000 and 40,000 years ago is represented by especially many skeletons, known as Neanderthals and sometimes classified as a separate species, Homo neanderthalensis. Despite being depicted in innumerable cartoons as ape-like brutes living in caves, Neanderthals had brains slightly larger than our own. They were also the first humans to leave behind strong evidence of burying their dead and caring for their sick. Yet their stone tools were still crude by comparison with modern New Guinean's polished stone axes and were usually not yet made in standardized diverse shapes, 
each with a clearly recognizable function. The few preserved African skeletal fragments contemporary with the Neanderthals are more similar to our modern skeletons than to Neanderthal skeletons. Even fewer preserved East Asian skeletal fragments are known, but they appear different again from both Africans and Neanderthals. As for the lifestyle at that time, the best preserved evidence comes from stone artifacts and prey bones accumulated at southern African sites. Although those Africans of a hundred thousand years ago had more modern skeletons than did their Neanderthal contemporaries, they made essentially the same crude stone tools as Neanderthals, still lacking standardized shapes. They had no preserved art. To judge from the bone evidence of the animal species on which they preyed, their hunting skills were unimpressive and mainly directed at easy-to-kill, not-at-all-dangerous animals. They were not yet in the business of slaughtering buffalo, pigs, and other dangerous prey. They couldn't even catch fish. Their sites immediately on the seacoast lack fish bones and fish hooks. They and their Neanderthal contemporaries still rank as less than fully human. Human history at last took off around 50,000 years ago, at the time of what I have termed our Great Leap Forward. The earliest definite signs of that leap come from East African sites with standardized stone tools and the first preserved jewelry, ostrich shell beads. Similar developments soon appear in the Near East and in southeastern Europe, then, some 40,000 years ago, in southwestern Europe, where abundant artifacts are associated with fully modern skeletons of people termed Cro-Magnons. Thereafter, the garbage preserved at archaeological sites rapidly becomes more and more interesting and leaves no doubt that we are dealing with biologically and behaviorally modern humans. Cro-Magnon garbage heaps yield not only stone tools, but also tools of bone, whose suitability for shaping, for instance into fish hooks, had apparently gone unrecognized by previous humans. Tools were produced in diverse and distinctive shapes so modern that their functions as needles, awls, engraving tools, and so on, are obvious to us. Instead of only single-piece tools, such as handheld scrapers, multi-piece tools made their appearance. Recognizable multi-piece weapons at Cro-Magnon sites include harpoons, spear throwers, and eventually bows and arrows, the precursors of rifles and other multi-piece modern weapons. Those efficient means of killing at a safe distance permitted the hunting of such dangerous prey as rhinos and elephants, while the invention of rope for nets, lines, and snares allowed the addition of fish and birds to our diet. Remains of houses and sewn clothing testify to a greatly improved ability to survive in cold climates, and remains of jewelry and carefully buried skeletons indicate revolutionary aesthetic and spiritual developments. Of the Cro-Magnon's products that have been preserved, the best known are their artworks, their magnificent cave paintings, statues, and musical instruments, which we still appreciate as art today. Anyone who has experienced firsthand the overwhelming power of the life-sized painted bulls and horses in the Lascaux cave of southwestern France will understand at once that their creators must have been as modern in their minds as they were in their skeletons. Obviously, some momentous change took place in our ancestors' capabilities between about 100,000 and 50,000 years ago. That great leap forward poses two major unresolved questions regarding its triggering cause and its geographic location. As for its cause, I argued in my book The Third Chimpanzee for the perfection of the voice box and hence for the anatomical basis of modern language, on which the exercise of human creativity is so dependent. Others have suggested instead that a change in brain organization around that time, without a change in brain size, made modern language possible. As for the site of the Great Leap Forward, did it take place primarily in one geographic area, in one group of humans who were thereby enabled to expand and replace the former human populations of other parts of the world? Or did it occur in parallel in different regions, in which each of the human populations living there today would be descendants of the populations living there before the leap? The rather modern-looking human skulls from Africa, around a hundred thousand years ago, have been taken to support the former view, with the leap occurring specifically in Africa. Molecular studies of so-called mitochondrial DNA were initially also interpreted in terms of an African origin of modern humans, though the meaning of those molecular findings is currently in doubt. 
On the other hand, skulls of humans living in China and Indonesia hundreds of thousands of years ago are considered by some physical anthropologists to exhibit features still found in modern Chinese and in Aboriginal Australians, respectively. If true, that finding would suggest parallel evolution and multi-regional origins of modern humans rather than origins in a single Garden of Eden. The issue remains unresolved. The evidence for a localized origin of modern humans, followed by their spread and then their replacement of other types of humans elsewhere, seems strongest for Europe. Some 40,000 years ago, into Europe came the Cro-Magnons, with their modern skeletons, superior weapons, and other advanced cultural traits. Within a few thousand years, there were no more Neanderthals, who had been evolving as the sole occupants of Europe for hundreds of thousands of years. That sequence strongly suggests that the modern Cro-Magnons somehow used their far superior technology and their language skills or brains to infect, kill, or displace the Neanderthals, leaving behind little or no evidence of hybridization between Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons. The Great Leap Forward coincides with the first proven major extension of human geographic range since our ancestors' colonization of Eurasia. That extension consisted of the occupation of Australia and New Guinea, joined at that time into a single continent. Many radiocarbon-dated sites attest to human presence in Australia-slash-New Guinea between 40,000 and 30,000 years ago, plus the inevitable somewhat older claims of contested validity. Within a short time of that initial peopling, humans had expanded over the whole continent and adapted to its diverse habitats, from the tropical rainforests and high mountains of New Guinea to the dry interior and wet southeastern corner of Australia. During the Ice Ages, so much of the ocean's water was locked up in glaciers that worldwide sea levels dropped hundreds of feet below their present stand. As a result, what are now the shallow seas between Asia and the Indonesian islands of Sumatra, Borneo, Java, and Bali became dry land. So did other shallow straits, such as the Bering Strait and the English Channel. The edge of the Southeast Asian mainland then lay 700 miles east of its present location. Nevertheless, central Indonesian islands between Bali and Australia remained surrounded and separated by deep-water channels. To reach Australia-slash-New Guinea from the Asian mainland at that time still required crossing a minimum of eight channels, the broadest of which was at least 50 miles wide. Most of those channels divided islands visible from each other, but Australia itself was always invisible from even the nearest Indonesian islands, Timor and Tanimbar. Thus, the occupation of Australia-slash-New Guinea is momentous in that it demanded watercraft and provides by far the earliest evidence of their use in history. Not until about 30,000 years later, or 13,000 years ago, is there strong evidence of watercraft anywhere else in the world from the Mediterranean. Initially, archaeologists considered the possibility that the colonization of Australia-slash-New Guinea was achieved accidentally by just a few people swept to sea while fishing on a raft near an Indonesian island. In an extreme scenario, the first settlers are pictured as having consisted of a single pregnant young woman carrying a male fetus. But believers in the fluke colonization theory have been surprised by recent discoveries that still other islands lying to the east of New Guinea were colonized soon after New Guinea itself, by around 35,000 years ago. Those islands were New Britain and New Ireland in the Bismarck Archipelago and Buca in the Solomon Archipelago. Buca lies out of sight of the closest island to the west and could have been reached only by crossing a water gap of about a hundred miles. Thus, early Australians and New Guineans were probably capable of intentionally traveling over water to visible islands and were using watercraft sufficiently often that the colonization of even invisible distant islands was repeatedly achieved unintentionally. The settlement of Australia New Guinea was perhaps associated with still another big first, besides humans' first use of watercraft and first range extension since reaching Eurasia the first mass extermination of large animal species by humans. Today, we regard Africa as the continent of big mammals. Modern Eurasia also has many species of big mammals, though not in the manifest abundance of Africa's Serengeti plains, such as Asia's rhinos and elephants and tigers, and Europe's moose and bears, and, until classical times, lions. 
Australia New Guinea today has no equally large mammals, in fact no mammal larger than 100-pound kangaroos. But Australia New Guinea formerly had its own suite of diverse big mammals, including giant kangaroos, rhino-like marsupials called diprotodonts, and reaching the size of a cow, and a marsupial leopard. It also formerly had a 400-pound ostrich-like flightless bird, plus some impressively big reptiles, including a one-ton lizard, a giant python, and land-dwelling crocodiles. All of those Australian New Guinean giants, the so-called megafauna, disappeared after the arrival of humans. While there has been controversy about the exact timing of their demise, several Australian archaeological sites, with dates extending over tens of thousands of years and with prodigiously abundant deposits of animal bones, have been carefully excavated and found to contain not a trace of the now extinct giants over the last 35,000 years. Hence, the megafauna probably became extinct soon after humans reached Australia. The near simultaneous disappearance of so many large species raises an obvious question. What caused it? An obvious possible answer is that they were killed off or else eliminated indirectly by the first arriving humans. Recall that Australian New Guinean animals had evolved for millions of years in the absence of human hunters. We know that Galapagos and Antarctic birds and mammals, which similarly evolved in the absence of humans and did not see humans until modern times, are still incurably tamed today. They would have been exterminated if conservationists had not imposed protective measures quickly. On other recently discovered islands where protective measures did not go into effect quickly, exterminations did indeed result. One such victim, the dodo of Mauritius, has become virtually a symbol for extinction. We also know now that, on every one of the well-studied oceanic islands colonized in the prehistoric era, human colonization led to an extinction spasm whose victims included the moas of New Zealand, the giant lemurs of Madagascar, and the big flightless geese of Hawaii. Just as modern humans walked up to unafraid dodos and island seals and killed them, prehistoric humans presumably walked up to unafraid moas and giant lemurs and killed them too. Hence, one hypothesis for the demise of Australia's and New Guinea's giants is that they met the same fate around 40,000 years ago. In contrast, most big mammals of Africa and Eurasia survived into modern times because they had co-evolved with proto-humans for hundreds of thousands or millions of years. They thereby enjoyed ample time to evolve a fear of humans, as our ancestors' initially poor hunting skills slowly improved. The dodo, moas, and perhaps the giants of Australia New Guinea had the misfortune suddenly to be confronted, without any evolutionary preparation, by invading modern humans possessing fully developed hunting skills. However, the overkill hypothesis, as it is termed, has not gone unchallenged for Australia New Guinea. Critics emphasize that, as yet, no one has documented the bones of an extinct Australian New Guinean giant with compelling evidence of its having been killed by humans, or even of its having lived in association with humans. Defenders of the overkill hypothesis reply, you would hardly expect to find kill sites if the extermination was completed very quickly and long ago, such as within a few millennia some 40,000 years ago. The critics respond with a counter-theory. Perhaps the giants succumbed instead to a change in climate, such as a severe drought on the already chronically dry Australian continent. The debate goes on. Personally, I can't fathom why Australia's giants should have survived innumerable droughts in their tens of millions of years of Australian history and then have chosen to drop dead almost simultaneously, at least on a time scale of millions of years, precisely and just coincidentally when the first humans arrived. The giants became extinct, not only in dry central Australia, but also in drenching wet New Guinea and southeastern Australia. They became extinct in every habitat without exception, from deserts to cold rainforest and tropical rainforest. Hence, it seems to me most likely that the giants were indeed exterminated by humans, both directly, by being killed for food, and indirectly, as the result of fires and habitat modification caused by humans. But regardless of whether the overkill hypothesis or the climate hypothesis proves correct, the disappearance of all of the big animals of Australia New Guinea had, as we shall see, heavy consequences for subsequent human history. 
those extinctions eliminated all the large wild animals that might otherwise have been candidates for domestication and left native Australians and New Guineans with not a single native domestic animal. Thus, the colonization of Australia and New Guinea was not achieved until around the time of the Great Leap Forward. Another extension of human range that soon followed was the one into the coldest parts of Eurasia. While Neanderthals lived in glacial times and were adapted to the cold, they penetrated no farther north than northern Germany and Kiev. That's not surprising, since Neanderthals apparently lacked needles, sewn clothing, warm houses, and other technology essential to survive in the coldest climates. Anatomically modern peoples who did possess such technology had expanded into Siberia by around 20,000 years ago. There are the usual much older disputed claims. That expansion may have been responsible for the extinction of Eurasia's woolly mammoth and woolly rhinoceros. With the settlement of Australia and New Guinea, humans now occupied three of the five habitable continents. Throughout this book, I count Eurasia as a single continent, and I omit Antarctica because it was not reached by humans until the 19th century and has never had any self-supporting human population. That left only two continents, North America and South America, they were surely the last ones settled, for the obvious reason that reaching the Americas from the Old World required either boats, for which there is no evidence even in Indonesia until 40,000 years ago and none in Europe until much later, in order to cross by sea, or else it required the occupation of Siberia, unoccupied until about 20,000 years ago, in order to cross the Bering Land Bridge. However, it is uncertain when, between about 14,000 and 35,000 years ago, the Americas were first colonized. The oldest unquestioned human remains in the Americas are at sites in Alaska dated around 12,000 BC, followed by a profusion of sites in the United States, south of the Canadian border, and in Mexico in the centuries just before 11,000 BC. The latter sites are called Clovis sites, named after the type site near the town of Clovis, New Mexico, where their characteristic large stone spear points were first recognized. Hundreds of Clovis sites are now known, blanketing all 48 of the lower U.S. states south into Mexico. Unquestioned evidence of human presence appears soon thereafter in Amazonia and in Patagonia. These facts suggest the interpretation that Clovis sites document the Americas' first colonization by people, who quickly multiplied, expanded, and filled the two continents. One might at first be surprised that Clovis descendants could reach Patagonia, lying 8,000 miles south of the U.S.-Canada border, in less than a thousand years. However, that translates into an average expansion of only eight miles per year, a trivial feat for a hunter-gatherer likely to cover that distance even within a single day's normal foraging. One might also at first be surprised that the Americas evidently filled up with humans so quickly that people were motivated to keep spreading south toward Patagonia. That population growth also proves unsurprising when one stops to consider the actual numbers. If the Americas eventually came to hold hunter-gatherers at an average population density of somewhat under one person per square mile, a high value for modern hunter-gatherers, then the whole area of the Americas would eventually have held about 10 million hunter-gatherers. But even if the initial colonists had consisted of only 100 people and their numbers had increased at a rate of only 1.1% per year, the colonists' descendants would have reached that population ceiling of 10 million people within a thousand years. A population growth rate of 1.1% per year is again trivial. Rates as high as 3.4% per year have been observed in modern times when people colonized virgin lands, such as when the HMS Bounty mutineers and their Tahitian wives colonized Pitcairn Island. The profusion of Clovis Hunters' sites within the first few centuries after their arrival resembles the site profusion documented archaeologically for the more recent discovery of New Zealand by ancestral Maori. A profusion of early sites is also documented for the much older colonization of Europe by anatomically modern humans and for the occupation of Australia and New Guinea. That is, everything about the Clovis phenomenon and its spread through the Americas corresponds to findings for other unquestioned virgin land colonizations in history. What might be the significance of Clovis sites bursting forth in the centuries just before 11,000 B.C., 
rather than in those before 16,000 or 21,000 BC. Recall that Siberia has always been cold, and that a continuous ice sheet stretched as an impassable barrier across the whole width of Canada during much of the Pleistocene Ice Ages. We have already seen that the technology required for coping with extreme cold did not emerge until after anatomically modern humans invaded Europe around 40,000 years ago, and that people did not colonize Siberia until 20,000 years later. Eventually, those early Siberians crossed to Alaska, either by sea across the Bering Strait, only 50 miles wide even today, or else on foot at glacial times when Bering Strait was dry land. The Bering Land Bridge, during its millennia of intermittent existence, would have been up to a thousand miles wide, covered by open tundra, and easily traversable by people adapted to cold conditions. The land bridge was flooded and became a strait again most recently when sea level rose after around 14,000 BC. Whether those early Siberians walked or paddled to Alaska, the earliest secure evidence of human presence in Alaska dates from around 12,000 BC. Soon thereafter, a north-south ice-free corridor opened in the Canadian ice sheet, permitting the first Alaskans to pass through and come out into the Great Plains around the site of the modern Canadian city of Edmonton. That removed the last serious barrier between Alaska and Patagonia for modern humans. The Edmonton pioneers would have found the Great Plains teeming with game. They would have thrived, increased in numbers, and gradually spread south to occupy the whole hemisphere. One other feature of the Clovis phenomenon fits our expectations for the first human presence south of the Canadian ice sheet. Like Australia New Guinea, the Americas had originally been full of big mammals. About 15,000 years ago, the American West looked much as Africa's Serengeti Plains do today, with herds of elephants and horses pursued by lions and cheetahs and joined by members of such exotic species as camels and giant ground sloths. Just as in Australia New Guinea, in the Americas most of those large mammals became extinct. Whereas the extinctions took place probably before 30,000 years ago in Australia, they occurred around 17,000 to 12,000 years ago in the Americas. For those extinct American mammals whose bones are available in greatest abundance and have been dated especially accurately, one can pinpoint the extinctions as having occurred around 11,000 B.C. Perhaps the two most accurately dated extinctions are those of the Shasta ground sloth and Harrington's mountain goat in the Grand Canyon area. Both of those populations disappeared within a century or two of 11,100 B.C. Whether coincidentally or not, that date is identical with an experimental error to the date of Clovis Hunter's arrival in the Grand Canyon area. The discovery of numerous skeletons of mammoths with Clovis spear points between their ribs suggests that this agreement of dates is not a coincidence. Hunters expanding southward through the Americas, encountering big animals that had never seen humans before, may have found those American animals easy to kill and may have exterminated them. A counter-theory is that America's big mammals instead became extinct because of climate changes at the end of the last ice age, which, to confuse the interpretation for modern paleontologists, also happened around 11,000 B.C. Personally, I have the same problem with a climatic theory of megafaunal extinction in the Americas as with such a theory in Australia New Guinea. The Americas' big animals had already survived the ends of 22 previous ice ages. Why did most of them pick the 23rd to expire in concert in the presence of all those supposedly harmless humans? Why did they disappear in all habitats, not only in habitats that contracted, but also in ones that greatly expanded at the end of the last ice age? Hence, I suspect that Clovis hunters did it, but the debate remains unresolved. Whichever theory proves correct, most large wild mammal species that might otherwise have later been domesticated by Native Americans were thereby removed. Also unresolved is the question whether Clovis hunters really were the first Americans. As always happens, whenever anyone claims the first anything, claims of discoveries of pre-Clovis human sites in the Americas are constantly being advanced. Every year, a few of those new claims really do appear convincing and exciting when initially announced. Then the inevitable problems of interpretation arise. Were the reported tools at the site really tools made by humans, or just natural rock shapes? Are the reported radiocarbon dates really correct, and not invalidated by any of the numerous difficulties that can plague radiocarbon dating. 
If the dates are correct, are they really associated with human products rather than just being a 15,000-year-old lump of charcoal lying next to a stone tool actually made 9,000 years ago? To illustrate these problems, consider the following typical example of an often quoted pre-Clovis claim. At a Brazilian rock shelter named Pedro Furada, archaeologists found cave paintings undoubtedly made by humans. They also discovered, among the piles of stones at the base of a cliff, some stones whose shapes suggested the possibility of their being crude tools. In addition, they came upon supposed hearths whose burnt charcoal yielded radiocarbon dates of around 35,000 years ago. Articles on Pedro Furada were accepted for publication in the prestigious and highly selective international scientific journal Nature. But none of those rocks at the base of the cliff is an obviously human-made tool, as are Clovis points and Cro-Magnon tools. If hundreds of thousands of rocks fall from a high cliff over the course of tens of thousands of years, many of them will become chipped and broken when they hit the rocks below, and some will come to resemble crude tools, chipped and broken by humans. In Western Europe and elsewhere in Amazonia, archaeologists have radiocarbon dated the actual pigments used in cave paintings, but that was not done at Pedro Furada. Forest fires occur frequently in the vicinity and produce charcoal that is regularly swept into caves by wind and streams. No evidence links the 35,000-year-old charcoal to the undoubted cave paintings at Pedro Furada. Although the original excavators remain convinced, a team of archaeologists who were not involved in the excavation but receptive to pre-Clovis claims recently visited the site and came away unconvinced. The North American site that currently enjoys the strongest credentials as a possible pre-Clovis site is Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, yielding reported human-associated radiocarbon dates of about 16,000 years ago. At Meadowcroft, no archaeologist denies that many human artifacts do occur in many carefully excavated layers. But the oldest radiocarbon dates don't make sense, because the plant and animal species associated with them are species living in Pennsylvania in recent times of mild climates, rather than species expected for the glacial times of 16,000 years ago. Hence, one has to suspect that the charcoal samples dated from the oldest human occupation levels consist of post-Clovis charcoal infiltrated with older carbon. The strongest pre-Clovis candidate in South America is the Monte Verde site in southern Chile, dated to at least 15,000 years ago. It too now seems convincing to many archaeologists, but caution is warranted in view of all the previous disillusionments. If there really were pre-Clovis people in the Americas, why is it still so hard to prove that they existed? Archaeologists have excavated hundreds of American sites unequivocally dating to between 2000 and 11,000 BC, including dozens of Clovis sites in the North American West, rock shelters in the Appalachians, and sites in coastal California. Below all the archaeological layers with undoubted human presence, at many of those same sites, Deeper, older layers have been excavated and still yield undoubted remains of animals, but with no further evidence of humans. The weaknesses in pre-Clovis evidence in the Americas contrast with the strength of the evidence in Europe, where hundreds of sites attest to the presence of modern humans long before Clovis hunters appeared in the Americas around 11,000 BC. Even more striking is the evidence from Australia New Guinea, where there are barely one-tenth as many archaeologists as in the United States alone, but where those few archaeologists have nevertheless discovered over a hundred unequivocal pre-Clovis sites scattered over the whole continent. Early humans certainly didn't fly by helicopter from Alaska to Meadowcroft and Monte Verde, skipping all the landscape in between. Advocates of pre-Clovis settlements suggest that for thousands or even tens of thousands of years, pre-Clovis humans remained at low population densities, or poorly visible archaeologically, for unknown reasons unprecedented elsewhere in the world. I find that suggestion infinitely more implausible than the suggestion that Monte Verde and Meadowcroft will eventually be reinterpreted, as have other claimed pre-Clovis sites. My feeling is that if there really had been pre-Clovis settlement in the Americas, it would have become obvious at many locations by now, and we would not still be arguing. However, archaeologists remain divided on these questions. 
The consequences for our understanding of later American prehistory remain the same, whichever interpretation proves correct. Either the Americas were first settled around 11,000 B.C. and quickly filled up with people, or else the first settlement occurred somewhat earlier. Most advocates of pre-Clovis settlement would suggest by 15,000 or 20,000 years ago, possibly 30,000 years ago, and few would seriously claim earlier. But those pre-Clovis settlers remained few in numbers or inconspicuous or had little impact until around 11,000 B.C. In either case, of the five habitable continents, North America and South America are the ones with the shortest human prehistories. With the occupation of the Americas, most habitable areas of the continents and continental islands, plus oceanic islands from Indonesia to east of New Guinea, supported humans. The settlement of the world's remaining islands was not completed until modern times. Mediterranean islands such as Crete, Cyprus, Corsica, and Sardinia between about 8,500 and 4,000 B.C., Caribbean islands beginning around 4,000 B.C., Polynesian and Micronesian islands between 1,200 B.C. and A.D. 1,000, Madagascar sometime between A.D. 300 and 800, and Iceland in the 9th century A.D., Native Americans, possibly ancestral to the modern Inuit, spread throughout the high Arctic around 2000 BC. That left, as the sole uninhabited areas awaiting European explorers over the last 700 years, only the most remote islands of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, such as the Azores and Seychelles, plus Antarctica. What significance, if any, do the continent's different dates of settlement have for subsequent history? Suppose that a time machine could have transported an archaeologist back in time for a world tour at around 11,000 B.C. Given the state of the world then, could the archaeologist have predicted the sequence in which human societies on the various continents would develop guns, germs, and steel, and thus predicted the state of the world today? Our archaeologist might have considered the possible advantages of a head start. If that counted for anything, then Africa enjoyed an enormous advantage at least five million more years of separate proto-human existence than on any other continent. In addition, if it is true that modern humans arose in Africa around 100,000 years ago and spread to other continents, that would have wiped out any advantages accumulated elsewhere in the meantime and given Africans a new head start. Furthermore, human genetic diversity is highest in Africa. Perhaps more diverse humans would collectively produce more diverse inventions. But our archaeologist might then reflect, what really does a head start mean for the purposes of this book? We cannot take the metaphor of a foot race literally. If by head start you mean the time required to populate a continent after the arrival of the first few pioneering colonists, that time is relatively brief. For example, less than a thousand years to fill up even the whole new world. If by head start you instead mean the time required to adapt to local conditions, I grant that some extreme environments did take time. For instance, 9,000 years to occupy the high Arctic after the occupation of the rest of North America. But people would have explored and adapted to most other areas quickly once modern human inventiveness had developed. For example, after the ancestors of the Maori reached New Zealand, it apparently took them barely a century to discover all worthwhile stone sources. Only a few more centuries to kill every last moa in some of the world's most rugged terrain, and only a few centuries to differentiate into a range of diverse societies, from that of coastal hunter-gatherers to that of farmers practicing new types of food storage. Our archaeologist might therefore look at the Americas and conclude that Africans, despite their apparently enormous head start, would have been overtaken by the earliest Americans within at most a millennium. Thereafter, the Americas' greater area— 50% greater than Africa's, and much greater environmental diversity would have given the advantage to Native Americans over Africans. The archaeologist might then turn to Eurasia and reason as follows. Eurasia is the world's largest continent. It has been occupied for longer than any other continent except Africa. Africa's long occupation before the colonization of Eurasia a million years ago might have counted for nothing anyway, because proto-humans were at such a primitive stage then. 
Our archaeologist might look at the upper Paleolithic flowering of southwestern Europe between 20,000 and 12,000 years ago with all those famous artworks and complex tools and wonder whether Eurasia was already getting a head start then, at least locally. Finally, the archaeologist would turn to Australia, New Guinea, noting first its small area, it's the smallest continent, the large fraction of it covered by desert capable of supporting few humans, the continent's isolation and its later occupation than that of Africa and Eurasia. All that might lead the archaeologist to predict slow development in Australia, New Guinea. But remember that Australians and New Guineans had by far the earliest watercraft in the world. They were creating cave paintings apparently at least as early as the Cro-Magnons in Europe. Jonathan Kingdon and Tim Flannery have noted that the colonization of Australia and New Guinea from the islands of the Asian continental shelf required humans to learn to deal with the new environments they encountered on the islands of central Indonesia. A maze of coastlines offering the richest marine resources, coral reefs and mangroves in the world. As the colonists crossed the straits, separating each Indonesian island from the next one to the east, they adapted anew, filled up that next island, and went on to colonize the next island again. It was a hitherto unprecedented golden age of successive human population explosions. Perhaps those cycles of colonization, adaptation, and population explosion were what selected for the Great Leap Forward, which then diffused back westward to Eurasia and Africa. If this scenario is correct, then Australia and New Guinea gained a massive head start that might have continued to propel human development there long after the Great Leap Forward. Thus, an observer transported back in time to 11,000 BC could not have predicted on which continent human societies would develop most quickly, but could have made a strong case for any of the continents. With hindsight, of course, we know that Eurasia was the one. But it turns out that the actual reasons behind the more rapid development of Eurasian societies were not at all the straightforward ones that our imaginary archaeologist of 11,000 BC guessed. The remainder of this book consists of a quest to discover those real reasons. Farmer Power – The Roots of Guns, Germs, and Steel As a teenager, I spent the summer of 1956 in Montana, working for an elderly farmer named Fred Hershey. Born in Switzerland, Fred had come to southwestern Montana as a teenager in the 1890s and proceeded to develop one of the first farms in the area. At the time of his arrival, much of the original Native American population of hunter-gatherers was still living there. My fellow farmhands were, for the most part, tough whites whose normal speech featured strings of curses and who spent their weekdays working so that they could devote their weekends to squandering their week's wages in the local saloon. Among the farmhands, though, was a member of the Blackfoot Indian tribe named Levi, who behaved very differently from the coarse miners, being polite, gentle, responsible, sober, and well-spoken. He was the first Indian with whom I had spent much time, and I came to admire him. It was therefore a shocking disappointment to me when, one Sunday morning, Levi too staggered in drunk and cursing after a Saturday night binge. Among his curses, one has stood out in my memory. Damn you, Fred Hershey, and damn the ship that brought you from Switzerland. It poignantly brought home to me the Indian's perspective on what I, like other white school children, had been taught to view as the heroic conquest of the American West. Fred Hershey's family was proud of him, as a pioneer farmer who had succeeded under difficult conditions. But Levi's tribe of hunters and famous warriors had been robbed of its lands by the immigrant white farmers. How did the farmers win out over the famous warriors? For most of the time since the ancestors of modern humans diverged from the ancestors of the living great apes, around seven million years ago, all humans on earth fed themselves exclusively by hunting wild animals and gathering wild plants, as the Blackfeet still did in the 19th century. It was only within the last 11,000 years that some peoples turned to what is termed food production, that is, domesticating wild animals and plants and eating the resulting livestock and crops. Today, most people on Earth consume food that they produce themselves or that someone else produced for them. At current rates of change, within the next decade, the few remaining bands of hunter-gatherers will abandon their ways, disintegrate or die out, thereby ending our millions of years of commitment to the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. 
Different peoples acquired food production at different times in prehistory. Some, such as Aboriginal Australians, never acquired it at all. Of those who did, some, for example the ancient Chinese, developed it independently by themselves, while others, including ancient Egyptians, acquired it from neighbors. But as we'll see, food production was indirectly a prerequisite for the development of guns, germs, and steel. Hence, geographic variation in whether or when the peoples of different continents became farmers and herders explains to a large extent their subsequent contrasting fates. Before we devote the next six chapters to understanding how geographic differences in food production arose, this chapter will trace the main connections through which food production led to all the advantages that enabled Pizarro to capture Atahualpa and Fred Hershey's people to dispossess Levi's. The first connection is the most direct one. Availability of more consumable calories means more people. Among wild plant and animal species, only a small minority are edible to humans or worth hunting or gathering. Most species are useless to us as food for one or more of the following reasons. They are indigestible, like bark, poisonous, monarch butterflies and deathcap mushrooms, low in nutritional value, jellyfish, tedious to prepare, very small nuts, difficult to gather, larvae of most insects, or dangerous to hunt. Rhinoceroses. Most biomass, living biological matter, on land is in the form of wood and leaves, most of which we cannot digest. By selecting and growing those few species of plants and animals that we can eat, so that they constitute 90% rather than 0.1% of the biomass on an acre of land, we obtain far more edible calories per acre. As a result, one acre can feed many more herders and farmers, typically ten to a hundred times more, than hunter-gatherers. That strength of brute numbers was the first of many military advantages that food-producing tribes gained over hunter-gatherer tribes. In human societies possessing domestic animals, livestock fed more people in four distinct ways, by furnishing meat, milk, and fertilizer, and by pulling plows. First and most directly, domestic animals became the society's major source of animal protein, replacing wild game. Today, for instance, Americans tend to get most of their animal protein from cows, pigs, sheep, and chickens, with game such as venison just a rare delicacy. In addition, some big domestic mammals served as sources of milk and of milk products, such as butter, cheese, and yogurt. Milked mammals include the cow, sheep, goat, horse, reindeer, water buffalo, yak, and Arabian and Bactrian camels. Those mammals thereby yield several times more calories over their lifetime than if they were just slaughtered and consumed as meat. Big domestic mammals also interacted with domestic plants in two ways to increase crop production. First, as any modern gardener or farmer still knows by experience, crop yields can be greatly increased by manure applied as fertilizer. Even with the modern availability of synthetic fertilizers produced by chemical factories, the major source of crop fertilizer today in most societies is still animal manure, especially of cows, but also of yaks and sheep. Manure has been valuable, too, as a source of fuel for fires in traditional societies. In addition, the largest domestic mammals interacted with domestic plants to increase food production, by pulling plows and thereby making it possible for people to till land that had previously been uneconomical for farming. Those plow animals were the cow, horse, water buffalo, bali cattle, and yak-cow hybrids. Here is one example of their value. The first prehistoric farmers of Central Europe, the so-called linear bandkaramic culture that arose slightly before 5000 BC, were initially confined to soils light enough to be tilled by means of handheld digging sticks. Only over a thousand years later, with the introduction of the ox-drawn plow, were those farmers able to extend cultivation to a much wider range of heavy soils and tough sods. Similarly, Native American farmers of the North American Great Plains grew crops in the river valleys, but farming of the tough sods on the extensive uplands had to await 19th-century Europeans and their animal-drawn plows.
All those are direct ways in which plant and animal domestication led to denser human populations by yielding more food than did the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. A more indirect way involved the consequences of the sedentary lifestyle enforced by food production. People of many hunter-gatherer societies move frequently in search of wild foods, but farmers must remain near their fields and orchards. The resulting fixed abode contributes to denser human populations by permitting a shortened birth interval. A hunter-gatherer mother who is shifting camp can carry only one child along with her few possessions. She cannot afford to bear her next child until the previous toddler can walk fast enough to keep up with the tribe and not hold it back. In practice, nomadic hunter-gatherers space their children about four years apart by means of lactational amenorrhea, sexual abstinence, infanticide, and abortion. By contrast, sedentary people, unconstrained by problems of carrying young children on treks, can bear and raise as many children as they can feed. The birth interval for many farm peoples is around two years, half that of hunter-gatherers. That higher birth rate of food producers, together with their ability to feed more people per acre, lets them achieve much higher population densities than hunter-gatherers. A separate consequence of a settled existence is that it permits one to store food surpluses, since storage would be pointless if one didn't remain nearby to guard the stored food. While some nomadic hunter-gatherers may occasionally bag more food than they can consume in a few days, such a bonanza is of little use to them because they cannot protect it. But stored food is essential for feeding non-food-producing specialists and certainly for supporting whole towns of them. Hence, nomadic hunter-gatherer societies have few or no such full-time specialists who instead first appear in sedentary societies. Two types of such specialists are kings and bureaucrats. Hunter-gatherer societies tend to be relatively egalitarian, to lack full-time bureaucrats and hereditary chiefs, and to have small-scale political organization at the level of the band or tribe. That's because all able-bodied hunter-gatherers are obliged to devote much of their time to acquiring food. In contrast, once food can be stockpiled, a political elite can gain control of food produced by others, assert the right of taxation, escape the need to feed itself, and engage full-time in political activities. Hence, moderate-sized agricultural societies are often organized in chiefdoms, and kingdoms are confined to large agricultural societies. Those complex political units are much better able to mount a sustained war of conquest than is an egalitarian band of hunters. Some hunter-gatherers in especially rich environments, such as the Pacific Northwest coast of North America and the coast of Ecuador, also developed sedentary societies, food storage, and nascent chiefdoms, but they did not go farther on the road to kingdoms. A stored food surplus built up by taxation can support other full-time specialists besides kings and bureaucrats. Of most direct relevance to wars of conquest, it can be used to feed professional soldiers. That was the decisive factor in the British Empire's eventual defeat of New Zealand's well-armed indigenous Maori population. While the Maori achieved some stunning temporary victories, they could not maintain an army constantly in the field and were in the end worn down by 18,000 full-time British troops. Stored food can also feed priests who provide religious justification for wars of conquest. Artisans, such as metal workers who develop swords, guns, and other technologies— and scribes who preserve far more information than can be remembered accurately. So far, I've emphasized direct and indirect values of crops and livestock as food. However, they have other uses, such as keeping us warm and providing us with valuable materials. Crops and livestock yield natural fibers for making clothing, blankets, nets, and rope. Most of the major centers of plant domestication evolved not only food crops, but also fiber crops notably cotton, flax, the source of linen, and hemp. Several domestic animals yielded animal fibers, especially wool from sheep, goats, llamas, and alpacas, and silk from silkworms. Bones of domestic animals were important raw materials for artifacts of Neolithic peoples before the development of metallurgy. Cow hides were used to make leather. One of the earliest cultivated plants in many parts of the Americas was grown for non-food purposes— the bottle gourd, used as a container. 
Big domestic mammals further revolutionized human society by becoming our main means of land transport until the development of railroads in the 19th century. Before animal domestication, the sole means of transporting goods and people by land was on the backs of humans. Large mammals changed that. For the first time in human history, it became possible to move heavy goods in large quantities, as well as people, rapidly overland for long distances. The domestic animals that were ridden were the horse, donkey, yak, reindeer, and Arabian and Bactrian camels. Animals of those same five species, as well as the llama, were used to bear packs. Cows and horses were hitched to wagons, while reindeer and dogs pulled sleds in the Arctic. The horse became the chief means of long-distance transport over most of Eurasia. The three domestic camel species, Arabian camel, Bactrian camel, and llama, played a similar role in areas of North Africa and Arabia, Central Asia, and the Andes, respectively. The most direct contribution of plant and animal domestication to wars of conquest was from Eurasia's horses, whose military role made them the jeeps and Sherman tanks of ancient warfare on that continent. They enabled Cortés and Pizarro, leading only small bands of adventurers, to overthrow the Aztec and Inca empires. Even much earlier, around 4000 BC, at a time when horses were still ridden bareback, they may have been the essential military ingredient behind the westward expansion of speakers of Indo-European languages from the Ukraine. Those languages eventually replaced all earlier Western European languages except Basque. When horses later were yoked to wagons and other vehicles, horse-drawn battle chariots, invented around 1800 BC, proceeded to revolutionize warfare in the Near East, the Mediterranean region, and China. For example, in 1674 BC, horses even enabled a foreign people, the Hyksos, to conquer then horseless Egypt and to establish themselves temporarily as pharaohs. Still later, after the invention of saddles and stirrups, horses allowed the Huns and successive waves of other peoples from the Asian steppes to terrorize the Roman Empire and its successor states, culminating in the Mongol conquests of much of Asia and Russia in the 13th and 14th centuries AD. Only with the introduction of trucks and tanks in World War I did horses finally become supplanted as the main assault vehicle and means of fast transport in war. Arabian and Bactrian camels played a similar military role within their geographic range. In all these examples, peoples with domestic horses or camels, or with improved means of using them, enjoyed an enormous military advantage over those without them. Of equal importance in wars of conquest were the germs that evolved in human societies with domestic animals. Infectious diseases like smallpox, measles, and flu arose as specialized germs of humans, derived by mutations of very similar ancestral germs that had infected animals. The humans who domesticated animals were the first to fall victim to the newly evolved germs, but those humans then evolved substantial resistance to the new diseases. When such partly immune people came into contact with others who had had no previous exposure to the germs, epidemics resulted in which up to 99% of the previously unexposed population was killed. Germs thus acquired ultimately from domestic animals played decisive roles in the European conquests of Native Americans, Australians, South Africans, and Pacific Islanders. In short, plant and animal domestication meant much more food and hence much denser human populations. The resulting food surpluses, and in some areas the animal-based means of transporting those surpluses, were a prerequisite for the development of settled, politically centralized, socially stratified, economically complex, technologically innovative societies. Hence, the availability of domestic plants and animals ultimately explains why empires, literacy, and steel weapons developed earliest in Eurasia and later, or not at all, on other continents. The military uses of horses and camels and the killing power of animal-derived germs complete the list of major links between food production and conquest that we shall be exploring. History's Haves and Have-Nots Geographic Differences in the Onset of Food Production Much of human history has consisted of unequal conflicts between the haves and the have-nots, between peoples with farmer power and those without it, or between those who acquired it at different times. It should come as no surprise that food production never arose in large areas of the globe for ecological reasons that still make it difficult or impossible there today. 
For instance, neither farming nor herding developed in prehistoric times in North America's Arctic, while the sole element of food production to arise in Eurasia's Arctic was reindeer herding. Nor could food production spring up spontaneously in deserts remote from sources of water for irrigation, such as Central Australia and parts of the western United States. Instead, what cries out for explanation is the failure of food production to appear until modern times in some ecologically very suitable areas that are among the world's richest centers of agriculture and herding today. Foremost among these puzzling areas, where indigenous peoples were still hunter-gatherers when European colonists arrived, were California and other Pacific states of the United States, the Argentine Pampas, southwestern and southeastern Australia, and much of the Cape region of South Africa. Had we surveyed the world in 4000 BC, thousands of years after the rise of food production in its oldest sites of origin, we would have been surprised, too, at several other modern bread baskets that were still then without it, including all the rest of the United States, England, and much of France, Indonesia, and all of sub-equatorial Africa. When we trace food production back to its beginnings, the earliest sites provide another surprise. Far from being modern bread baskets, they include areas ranking today as somewhat dry or ecologically degraded. Iraq and Iran, Mexico, the Andes, parts of China, and Africa's Sahel Zone. Why did food production develop first in these seemingly rather marginal lands and only later in today's most fertile farmlands and pastures? Geographic differences in the means by which food production arose are also puzzling. In a few places, it developed independently as a result of local people domesticating local plants and animals. In most other places, it was instead imported in the form of crops and livestock that had been domesticated elsewhere. Since those areas of non-independent origins were suitable for prehistoric food production as soon as domesticates had arrived, why did the peoples of those areas not become farmers and herders without outside assistance by domesticating local plants and animals? Among those regions where food production did spring up independently, why did the times at which it appeared vary so greatly? For example, thousands of years earlier in Eastern Asia than in the Eastern United States, and never in Eastern Australia. Among those regions into which it was imported in the prehistoric era, why did the date of arrival also vary so greatly? For example, thousands of years earlier in Southwestern Europe than in the Southwestern United States. Again, among those regions where it was imported, why in some areas, such as the southwestern United States, did local hunter-gatherers themselves adopt crops and livestock from neighbors and survive as farmers, while in other areas, such as Indonesia and much of sub-equatorial Africa, the importation of food production involved a cataclysmic replacement of the region's original hunter-gatherers by invading food producers? All these questions involved developments that determined which peoples became history's have-nots and which became its haves. At one extreme are areas in which food production arose altogether independently, with the domestication of many indigenous crops, and in some cases animals, before the arrival of any crops or animals from other areas. There are only five such areas for which the evidence is at present detailed and compelling. Southwest Asia, also known as the Near East or Fertile Crescent, China, Mesoamerica, the term applied to Central and Southern Mexico and adjacent areas of Central America, the Andes of South America, and possibly the adjacent Amazon Basin as well, and the Eastern United States. Some or all of these centers may actually comprise several nearby centers where food production arose more or less independently, such as North China's Yellow River Valley and South China's Yangtze River Valley. In addition to these five areas where food production definitely arose de novo, four others, Africa's Sahel Zone, Tropical West Africa, Ethiopia, and New Guinea, are candidates for that distinction. However, there is some uncertainty in each case. Although indigenous wild plants were undoubtedly domesticated in Africa's Sahel Zone just south of the Sahara, cattle herding may have preceded agriculture there, and it is not yet certain whether those were independently domesticated Sahel cattle or, instead, domestic cattle of fertile crescent origin whose arrival triggered local plant domestication. 
It remains similarly uncertain whether the arrival of those Sahel crops then triggered the undoubted local domestication of indigenous wild plants in tropical West Africa, and whether the arrival of Southwest Asian crops is what triggered the local domestication of indigenous wild plants in Ethiopia. As for New Guinea, archaeological studies there have provided evidence of early agriculture well before food production in any adjacent areas, but the crops grown have not been definitely identified. Among nine candidate areas for the independent evolution of food production, Southwest Asia has the earliest definite dates for both plant domestication, around 8,500 B.C., and animal domestication, around 8,000 B.C., it also has by far the largest number of accurate radiocarbon dates for early food production. Dates for China are nearly as early, while dates for the eastern United States are clearly about 6,000 years later. For the other six candidate areas, the earliest well-established dates do not rival those for Southwest Asia, but too few early sites have been securely dated in those six other areas for us to be certain that they really lagged behind Southwest Asia and, if so, by how much. The next group of areas consists of ones that did domesticate at least a couple of local plants or animals, but where food production depended mainly on crops and animals that were domesticated elsewhere. Those imported domesticates may be thought of as founder crops and animals because they founded local food production. The arrival of founder domesticates enabled local people to become sedentary and thereby increased the likelihood of local crops evolving from wild plants that were gathered, brought home, and planted accidentally, and later planted intentionally. In three or four such areas, the arriving founder package came from Southwest Asia. One of them is Western and Central Europe, where food production arose with the arrival of Southwest Asian crops and animals between 6,000 and 3,500 BC, but at least one plant, the poppy and probably oats and some others, was then domesticated locally. Wild poppies are confined to coastal areas of the Western Mediterranean. Poppy seeds are absent from excavated sites of the earliest farming communities in Eastern Europe and Southwest Asia. They first appear in early farming sites in Western Europe. In contrast, the wild ancestors of most Southwest Asian crops and animals were absent from Western Europe. Thus, it seems clear that food production did not evolve independently in Western Europe. Instead, it was triggered there by the arrival of Southwest Asian domesticates. The resulting Western European farming societies domesticated the poppy, which subsequently spread eastward as a crop. Another area where local domestication appears to have followed the arrival of Southwest Asian founder crops is the Indus Valley region of the Indian subcontinent. The earliest farming communities there in the 7th millennium BC utilized wheat, barley, and other crops that had been previously domesticated in the Fertile Crescent and that evidently spread to the Indus Valley through Iran. Only later did domesticates derived from indigenous species of the Indian subcontinent, such as humped cattle and sesame, appear in Indus Valley farming communities. In Egypt as well, food production began in the 6th millennium BC with the arrival of Southwest Asian crops. Egyptians then domesticated the sycamore fig and a local vegetable called chufa. The same pattern perhaps applies to Ethiopia, where wheat, barley, and other Southwest Asian crops have been cultivated for a long time. Ethiopians also domesticated many locally available wild species to obtain crops, most of which are still confined to Ethiopia, but one of them, the coffee bean, has now spread around the world. However, it is not yet known whether Ethiopians were cultivating these local plants before or only after the arrival of the Southwest Asian package. In these and other areas where food production depended on the arrival of founder crops from elsewhere, did local hunter-gatherers themselves adopt those founder crops from neighboring farming peoples and thereby become farmers themselves? Or was the founder package instead brought by invading farmers, who were thereby enabled to outbreed the local hunters and to kill, displace, or outnumber them? In Egypt, it seems likely that the former happened. Local hunter-gatherers simply added Southwest Asian domesticates and farming and herding techniques to their own diet of wild plants and animals, then gradually phased out the wild foods. That is, what arrived to launch food production in Egypt was foreign crops and animals, not foreign peoples. The same may have been true on the Atlantic coast of Europe, where local hunter-gatherers apparently adopted Southwest Asian sheep and cereals over the course of many centuries. 
In the Cape of South Africa, the local koi hunter-gatherers became herders, but not farmers, by acquiring sheep and cows from farther north in Africa, and ultimately from Southwest Asia. Similarly, Native American hunter-gatherers of the U.S. Southwest gradually became farmers by acquiring Mexican crops. In these four areas, the onset of food production provides little or no evidence for the domestication of local plant or animal species, but also little or no evidence for the replacement of human population. At the opposite extreme are regions in which food production certainly began with an abrupt arrival of foreign people as well as of foreign crops and animals. The reason why we can be certain is that the arrivals took place in modern times and involved literate Europeans, who described in innumerable books what happened. Those areas include California, the Pacific Northwest of North America, the Argentine Pampas, Australia, and Siberia. Until recent centuries, these areas were still occupied by hunter-gatherers, Native Americans in the first three cases, and Aboriginal Australians or Native Siberians in the last two. Those hunter-gatherers were killed, infected, driven out, or largely replaced by arriving European farmers and herders who brought their own crops and did not domesticate any local wild species after their arrival, except for macadamia nuts in Australia. In the Cape of South Africa, the arriving Europeans found not only koi hunter-gatherers, but also koi herders who already possessed only domestic animals, not crops. The result was again the start of farming dependent on crops from elsewhere, a failure to domesticate local species, and a massive modern replacement of human population. Finally, the same pattern of an abrupt start of food production dependent on domesticates from elsewhere and an abrupt and massive population replacement seems to have repeated itself in many areas in the prehistoric era. In the absence of written records, the evidence of those prehistoric replacements must be sought in the archaeological record or inferred from linguistic evidence. The best attested cases are ones in which there can be no doubt about population replacement because the newly arriving food producers differed markedly in their skeletons from the hunter-gatherers whom they replaced, and because the food producers introduced not only crops and animals, but also pottery. Southeastern Europe and Central Europe present a similar picture of an abrupt onset of food production, dependent on Southwest Asian crops and animals, and of pottery making. This onset, too, probably involved replacement of old Greeks and Germans by new Greeks and Germans, just as old gave way to new in the Philippines, Indonesia, and sub-equatorial Africa. However, the skeletal differences between the earlier hunter-gatherers and the farmers who replaced them are less marked in Europe than in the Philippines, Indonesia, and sub-equatorial Africa. Hence, the case for population replacement in Europe is less strong or less direct. In short, only a few areas of the world developed food production independently, and they did so at widely differing times. From those nuclear areas, hunter-gatherers of some neighboring areas learned food production, and peoples of other neighboring areas were replaced by invading food producers from the nuclear areas, again at widely differing times. Finally, peoples of some areas ecologically suitable for food production neither evolved nor acquired agriculture in prehistoric times at all. They persisted as hunter-gatherers until the modern world finally swept upon them. The peoples of areas with a head start on food production thereby gained a head start on the path leading toward guns, germs, and steel. The result was a long series of collisions between the haves and the have-nots of history. How can we explain these geographic differences in the times and modes of onset of food production? That question, one of the most important problems of prehistory, will be the subject of the next five chapters. To farm or not to farm? Causes of the spread of food production. Formerly, all people on earth were hunter-gatherers. Why did any of them adopt food production at all? Given that they must have had some reason, why did they do so around 8,500 B.C. in the Mediterranean habitats of the Fertile Crescent, only 3,000 years later in the climatically and structurally similar Mediterranean habitats of southwestern Europe, and never indigenously in the similar Mediterranean habitats of California, southwestern Australia, and the Cape of South Africa? Why did even people of the Fertile Crescent wait until 8,500 B.C. instead of becoming food producers already around 18,500 or 28,500 B.C.? From our modern perspective, all these questions at first seem silly because the drawbacks of being a hunter-gatherer appear so obvious. 
Scientists used to quote a phrase of Thomas Hobbes's in order to characterize the lifestyle of hunter-gatherers as nasty, brutish, and short. They seemed to have worked hard, to be driven by the daily quest for food, often to be close to starvation, to lack such elementary material comforts as soft beds and adequate clothing, and to die young. In reality, only for today's affluent first-world citizens who don't actually do the work of raising food themselves, does food production, by remote agribusiness, mean less physical work, more comfort, freedom from starvation, and a longer expected lifetime? Most peasant farmers and herders who constitute the great majority of the world's actual food producers aren't necessarily better off than hunter-gatherers. Time budget studies show that they may spend more rather than fewer hours per day at work than hunter-gatherers do. Archaeologists have demonstrated that the first farmers in many areas were smaller and less well-nourished, suffered from more serious diseases, and died on the average at a younger age than the hunter-gatherers they replaced. If those first farmers could have foreseen the consequences of adopting food production, they might not have opted to do so. Why, unable to foresee the result, did they nevertheless make that choice? There exist many actual cases of hunter-gatherers who did see food production practiced by their neighbors and who nevertheless refused to accept its supposed blessings and instead remained hunter-gatherers. For instance, aboriginal hunter-gatherers of northeastern Australia traded for thousands of years with farmers of the Torres Strait Islands between Australia and New Guinea. California Native American hunter-gatherers traded with Native American farmers in the Colorado River Valley. In addition, Khoi herders west of the Fish River of South Africa traded with Bantu farmers east of the Fish River and continued to dispense with farming themselves. Why? Still other hunter-gatherers in contact with farmers did eventually become farmers, but only after what may seem to us like an inordinately long delay. For example, the coastal peoples of northern Germany did not adopt food production until 1,300 years after peoples of the Linear Band Keramik culture introduced it to inland parts of Germany only 125 miles to the south. Why did those coastal Germans wait so long, and what led them finally to change their minds? From those precursors of food production already practiced by hunter-gatherers, it developed stepwise. Not all the necessary techniques were developed within a short time, and not all the wild plants and animals that were eventually domesticated in a given area were domesticated simultaneously. Even in the cases of the most rapid independent development of food production from a hunting-gathering lifestyle, it took thousands of years to shift from complete dependence on wild foods to a diet with very few wild foods. In early stages of food production, people simultaneously collected wild foods and raised cultivated ones, and diverse types of collecting activities diminished in importance at different times as reliance on crops increased. The underlying reason why this transition was piecemeal is that food production systems evolved as a result of the accumulation of many separate decisions about allocating time and effort. Foraging humans, like foraging animals, have only finite time and energy, which they can spend in various ways. We can picture an incipient farmer waking up and asking, Shall I spend today hoeing my garden, predictably yielding a lot of vegetables several months from now, gathering shellfish, predictably yielding a little meat today, or hunting deer, yielding possibly a lot of meat today, but more likely nothing. Human and animal foragers are constantly prioritizing and making effort allocation decisions, even if only unconsciously. They concentrate first on favorite foods, or ones that yield the highest payoff. If these are unavailable, they shift to less and less preferred foods. Many considerations enter into these decisions. People seek food in order to satisfy their hunger and fill their bellies. They also crave specific foods, such as protein-rich foods, fat, salt, sweet fruits, and foods that simply taste good. All other things being equal, people seek to maximize their return of calories, protein, or other specific food categories by foraging in a way that yields the most return with the greatest certainty in the least time for the least effort. Simultaneously, they seek to minimize their risk of starving. Moderate but reliable returns are preferable to a fluctuating lifestyle with a high time-averaged rate of return, but a substantial likelihood of starving to death. 
One suggested function of the first gardens of nearly 11,000 years ago was to provide a reliable reserve larder as insurance in case wild food supplies failed. Conversely, men hunters tend to guide themselves by considerations of prestige. For example, they might rather go giraffe hunting every day, bag a giraffe once a month and thereby gain the status of great hunter, than bring home twice a giraffe's weight of food in a month by humbling themselves and reliably gathering nuts every day. People are also guided by seemingly arbitrary cultural preferences, such as considering fish either delicacies or taboo. Finally, their priorities are heavily influenced by the relative values they attach to different lifestyles, just as we can see today. For instance, in the 19th century U.S. West, the cattlemen, sheepmen, and farmers all despised each other. Similarly, throughout human history, farmers have tended to despise hunter-gatherers as primitive, hunter-gatherers have despised farmers as ignorant, and herders have despised both. All these elements come into play in people's separate decisions about how to obtain their food. As we already noted, the first farmers on each continent could not have chosen farming consciously because there were no other nearby farmers for them to observe. However, once food production had arisen in one part of a continent, neighboring hunter-gatherers could see the result and make conscious decisions. In some cases, the hunter-gatherers adopted the neighboring system of food production virtually as a complete package. In others, they chose only certain elements of it and in still others they rejected food production entirely and remained hunter-gatherers. For example, hunter-gatherers in parts of southeastern Europe had quickly adopted southwest Asian cereal crops, pulse crops, and livestock simultaneously as a complete package by around 6000 BC. All three of these elements also spread rapidly through central Europe in the centuries before 5000 BC. Adoption of food production may have been rapid and wholesale in southeastern and central Europe because the hunter-gatherer lifestyle there was less productive and less competitive. In contrast, food production was adopted piecemeal in southwestern Europe, southern France, Spain, and Italy, where sheep arrived first and cereals later. The adoption of intensive food production from the Asian mainland was also very slow and piecemeal in Japan probably because the hunter-gatherer lifestyle based on seafood and local plants was so productive there. Just as a hunting-gathering lifestyle can be traded piecemeal for a food-producing lifestyle, one system of food production can also be traded piecemeal for another. For example, Indians of the eastern United States were domesticating local plants by about 2500 B.C., but had trade connections with Mexican Indians who developed a more productive crop system based on the trinity of corn, squash, and beans. Eastern U.S. Indians adopted Mexican crops, and many of them discarded many of their local domesticates piecemeal. Squash was domesticated independently. Corn arrived from Mexico around A.D. 200, but remained a minor crop until around A.D. 900, and beans arrived a century or two later. It even happened that food production systems were abandoned in favor of hunting-gathering. For instance, around 3000 BC, the hunter-gatherers of southern Sweden adopted farming based on southwest Asian crops, but abandoned it around 2700 BC and reverted to hunting-gathering for 400 years before resuming farming. All these considerations make it clear that we should not suppose that the decision to adopt farming was made in a vacuum as if the people had previously had no means to feed themselves. Instead, we must consider food production and hunting-gathering as alternative strategies competing with each other. Mixed economies that added certain crops or livestock to hunting-gathering also competed against both types of pure economies and against mixed economies with higher or lower proportions of food production. Nevertheless, over the last 10,000 years, the predominant result has been a shift from hunting-gathering to food production. Hence, we must ask, what were the factors that tipped the competitive advantage away from the former and toward the latter? That question continues to be debated by archaeologists and anthropologists. One reason for its remaining unsettled is that different factors may have been decisive in different parts of the world. Another has been the problem of disentangling cause and effect in the rise of food production. However, five main contributing factors can still be identified. 
The controversies revolve mainly around their relative importance. One factor is the decline in the availability of wild foods. The lifestyle of hunter-gatherers has become increasingly less rewarding over the past 13,000 years, as resources on which they depended, especially animal resources, have become less abundant or even disappeared. As we saw in Chapter 1, most large mammal species became extinct in North and South America at the end of the Pleistocene, and some became extinct in Eurasia and Africa, either because of climate changes or because of the rise in skill and numbers of human hunters. While the role of animal extinctions in eventually, after a long lag, nudging ancient Native Americans, Eurasians, and Africans toward food production can be debated, there are numerous incontrovertible cases on islands in more recent times. Only after the first Polynesian settlers had exterminated moas and decimated seal populations on New Zealand, and exterminated or decimated seabirds and land birds on other Polynesian islands, did they intensify their food production. For instance, although the Polynesians who colonized Easter Island around A.D. 500 brought chickens with them, chicken did not become a major food until wild birds and porpoises were no longer readily available as food. Similarly, a suggested contributing factor to the rise of animal domestication in the Fertile Crescent was the decline in abundance of the wild gazelles that had previously been a major source of meat for hunter-gatherers in that area. A second factor is that, just as the depletion of wild game tended to make hunting-gathering less rewarding, an increased availability of domesticable wild plants made steps leading to plant domestication more rewarding. For instance, climate changes at the end of the Pleistocene in the Fertile Crescent greatly expanded the area of habitats with wild cereals, of which huge crops could be harvested in a short time. Those wild cereal harvests were precursors to the domestication of the earliest crops, the cereals, wheat, and barley, in the Fertile Crescent. Still another factor tipping the balance away from hunting-gathering was the cumulative development of technologies on which food production would eventually depend, technologies for collecting, processing, and storing wild foods. What use can would-be farmers make of a ton of wheat grains on the stalk if they have not first figured out how to harvest, husk, and store them? The necessary methods, implements, and facilities appeared rapidly in the Fertile Crescent after 11,000 B.C., having been invented for dealing with the newly available abundance of wild cereals. Those inventions included sickles of flint blades cemented into wooden or bone handles for harvesting wild grains, baskets in which to carry the grains home from the hillsides where they grew, mortars and pestles or grinding slabs to remove the husks, the technique of roasting grains so that they could be stored without sprouting, and underground storage pits, some of them plastered to make them waterproof. Evidence for all of these techniques becomes abundant at sites of hunter-gatherers in the Fertile Crescent about 11,000 B.C. All these techniques, though developed for the exploitation of wild cereals, were prerequisites to the planting of cereals as crops. These cumulative developments constituted the unconscious first steps of plant domestication. A fourth factor was the two-way link between the rise in human population density and the rise in food production. In all parts of the world where adequate evidence is available, archaeologists find evidence of rising densities associated with the appearance of food production. Which was the cause and which the result? This is a long-debated chicken or egg problem. Did a rise in human population density force people to turn to food production? Or did food production permit a rise in human population density? In principle, one expects the chain of causation to operate in both directions. As I've already discussed, food production tends to lead to increased population densities because it yields more edible calories per acre than does hunting-gathering. On the other hand, human population densities were gradually rising throughout the late Pleistocene anyway, thanks to improvements in human technology for collecting and processing wild foods. As population densities rose, food production became increasingly favored because it provided the increased food outputs needed to feed all those people. That is, the adoption of food production exemplifies what is termed an autocatalytic process, one that catalyzes itself in a positive feedback cycle, going faster and faster once it has started. 
a gradual rise in population densities impelled people to obtain more food by rewarding those who unconsciously took steps toward producing it. Once people began to produce food and became sedentary, they could shorten the birth spacing and produce still more people, requiring still more food. This bidirectional link between food production and population density explains the paradox that food production, while increasing the quantity of edible calories per acre, left the food producers less well-nourished than the hunter-gatherers whom they succeeded. That paradox developed because human population densities rose slightly more steeply than did the availability of food. Taken together, these four factors help us understand why the transition to food production in the Fertile Crescent began around 8,500 B.C., not around 18,500 or 28,500 B.C. At the latter two dates, hunting-gathering was still much more rewarding than incipient food production because wild mammals were still abundant. Wild cereals were not yet abundant, People had not yet developed the inventions necessary for collecting, processing, and storing cereals efficiently, and human population densities were not yet high enough for a large premium to be placed on extracting more calories per acre. A final factor in the transition became decisive at geographic boundaries between hunter-gatherers and food producers. The much denser populations of food producers enabled them to displace or kill hunter-gatherers by their sheer numbers not to mention the other advantages associated with food production, including technology, germs, and professional soldiers. In areas where there were only hunter-gatherers to begin with, those groups of hunter-gatherers who adopted food production outbred those who didn't. As a result, in most areas of the globe suitable for food production, hunter-gatherers met one of two fates. Either they were displaced by neighboring food producers, or else they survived only by adopting food production themselves. In places where they were already numerous, or where geography retarded immigration by food producers, local hunter-gatherers did have time to adopt farming in prehistoric times and thus to survive as farmers. This may have happened in the U.S. Southwest, in the Western Mediterranean, on the Atlantic coast of Europe, and in parts of Japan. However, in Indonesia, tropical Southeast Asia, most of sub-equatorial Africa, and probably in parts of Europe, the hunter-gatherers were replaced by farmers in the prehistoric era, whereas a similar replacement took place in modern times in Australia and much of the western United States. Only where especially potent geographic or ecological barriers made immigration of food producers or diffusion of locally appropriate food-producing techniques very difficult were hunter-gatherers able to persist until modern times in areas suitable for food production. The three outstanding examples are the persistence of Native American hunter-gatherers in California, separated by deserts from the Native American farmers of Arizona, that of Khoisan hunter-gatherers at the Cape of South Africa, in a Mediterranean climate zone unsuitable for the equatorial crops of nearby Bantu farmers, and that of hunter-gatherers throughout the Australian continent, separated by narrow seas from the food producers of Indonesia and New Guinea. Those few peoples who remained hunter-gatherers into the 20th century escaped replacement by food producers because they were confined to areas not fit for food production, especially deserts and Arctic regions. Within the present decade, even they will have been seduced by the attractions of civilization, settled down under pressure from bureaucrats or missionaries, or succumbed to germs. How to make an almond. The unconscious development of ancient crops. If you're a hiker whose appetite is jaded by farm-grown foods, it's fun to try eating wild foods. You know that some wild plants, such as wild strawberries and blueberries, are both tasty and safe to eat. They're sufficiently similar to familiar crops that you can easily recognize the wild berries, even though they're much smaller than those we grow. Adventurous hikers cautiously eat mushrooms, aware that many species can kill us. But not even ardent nut lovers eat wild almonds, of which a few dozen contain enough cyanide, the poison used in Nazi gas chambers, to kill us. The forest is full of many other plants deemed inedible. Yet all crops arose from wild plant species. How did certain wild plants get turned into crops? That question is especially puzzling in regard to the many crops, 
like almonds, whose wild progenitors are lethal or bad-tasting, and to other crops, like corn, that look drastically different from their wild ancestors. What cavewoman or caveman ever got the idea of domesticating a plant, and how was it accomplished? Plant domestication may be defined as growing a plant and thereby, consciously or unconsciously, causing it to change genetically from its wild ancestor in ways making it more useful to human consumers. Crop development is today a conscious, highly specialized effort carried out by professional scientists. They already know about the hundreds of existing crops and set out to develop yet another one. To achieve that goal, they plant many different seeds or roots, select the best progeny and plant their seeds, apply knowledge of genetics to develop good varieties that breed true, and perhaps even use the latest techniques of genetic engineering to transfer specific useful genes. At the Davis campus of the University of California, an entire department, the Department of Pomology, is devoted to apples, and another, the Department of Viticulture and Enology, to grapes and wine. But plant domestication goes back over 10,000 years. Early farmers surely didn't use molecular genetic techniques to arrive at their results. The first farmers didn't even have any existing crop as a model to inspire them to develop new ones. Hence, they couldn't have known that whatever they were doing, they would enjoy a tasty treat as a result. How then did early farmers domesticate plants unwittingly? For example, how did they turn poisonous almonds into safe ones without knowing what they were doing? What changes did they actually make in wild plants besides rendering some of them bigger or less poisonous? Even for valuable crops, the times of domestication vary greatly. For instance, peas were domesticated by 8,000 B.C., olives around 4,000 B.C., strawberries not until the Middle Ages, and pecans not until 1846. Many valuable wild plants yielding food prized by millions of people, such as oaks sought for their edible acorns in many parts of the world, remain untamed even today. What made some plants so much easier or more inviting to domesticate than others? Why did olive trees yield to Stone Age farmers, whereas oak trees continue to defeat our brightest agronomists? What accounts for the great differences among plants in ease of domestication, such that some species were domesticated long ago and others not until the Middle Ages, whereas still other wild plants have proved immune to all our activities? We can deduce many of the answers by examining the well-established sequence in which various crops developed in Southwest Asia's Fertile Crescent. It turns out that the earliest Fertile Crescent crops, such as the wheat and barley and peas domesticated around 10,000 years ago, arose from wild ancestors offering many advantages. They were already edible and gave high yields in the wild. They were easily grown merely by being sown or planted. They grew quickly and could be harvested within a few months of sowing, a big advantage for incipient farmers still on the borderline between nomadic hunters and settled villagers. They could be readily stored, unlike many later crops such as strawberries and lettuce. They were mostly self-pollinating, that is, the crop varieties could pollinate themselves and pass on their own desirable genes unchanged, instead of having to hybridize with other varieties less useful to humans. Finally, their wild ancestors required very little genetic change to be converted into crops. For instance, in wheat, just the mutations for non-shattering stalks and uniform quick germination. A next stage of crop development included the first fruit and nut trees, domesticated around 4000 BC. They comprised olives, figs, dates, pomegranates, and grapes. Compared with cereals and legumes, they had the drawback of not starting to yield food until at least three years after planting, and not reaching full production until after as much as a decade. Thus, growing these crops was possible only for people already fully committed to the settled village life. However, these early fruit and nut trees were still the easiest such crops to cultivate. Unlike later tree domesticates, they could be grown directly by being planted as cuttings or even seeds. Cuttings have the advantage that, once ancient farmers had found or developed a productive tree, they could be sure that all its descendants would remain identical to it. 
A third stage involved fruit trees that proved much harder to cultivate, including apples, pears, plums, and cherries. These trees cannot be grown from cuttings. It's also a waste of effort to grow them from seed, since the offspring, even of an outstanding individual tree of those species, are highly variable and mostly yield worthless fruit. Instead, those trees must be grown by the difficult technique of grafting, developed in China long after the beginnings of agriculture. Not only is grafting hard work even once you know the principle, but the principle itself could have been discovered only through conscious experimentation. The invention of grafting was hardly just a matter of some nomad relieving herself at a latrine and returning later to be pleasantly surprised by the resulting crop of fine fruit. Many of these late-stage fruit trees posed a further problem in that their wild progenitors were the opposite of self-pollinating. They had to be cross-pollinated by another plant belonging to a genetically different variety of their species. Hence, early farmers either had to find mutant trees not requiring cross-pollination, or had consciously to plant genetically different varieties, or else male and female individuals nearby in the same orchard. All those problems delayed the domestication of apples, pears, plums, and cherries until around classical times. At about the same time, though, another group of late domesticates arose with much less effort, as wild plants that established themselves initially as weeds in fields of intentionally cultivated crops. Crops starting out as weeds included rye and oats, turnips and radishes, beets and leeks, and lettuce. Although the detailed sequence that I've just described applies to the Fertile Crescent, partly similar sequences also appeared elsewhere in the world. In particular, the Fertile Crescent's wheat and barley exemplify the class of crops termed cereals or grains, members of the grass family, while Fertile Crescent peas and lentils exemplify pulses, members of the legume family, which includes beans. Cereal crops have the virtues of being fast-growing, high in carbohydrates, and yielding up to a ton of edible food per hectare cultivated. As a result, cereals today account for over half of all calories consumed by humans and include five of the modern world's twelve leading crops— wheat, corn, rice, barley, and sorghum. Many cereal crops are low in protein, but that deficit is made up by pulses, which are often 25% protein— 38% in the case of soybeans. Cereals and pulses together thus provide many of the ingredients of a balanced diet. The domestication of local cereal-pulse combinations launched food production in many areas. The most familiar examples are the combination of wheat and barley with peas and lentils in the Fertile Crescent, the combination of corn with several bean species in Mesoamerica, and the combination of rice and millets with soybeans and other beans in China. Less well-known are Africa's combination of sorghum, African rice and pearl millet with cow peas and ground nuts, and the Andes combination of the non-cereal grain quinoa with several bean species. The Fertile Crescent's early domestication of flax for fiber was paralleled elsewhere. Hemp, four cotton species, yucca and agave variously furnished fiber for rope and woven clothing in China, Mesoamerica, India, Ethiopia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South America, supplemented in several of those areas by wool from domestic animals. Of the centers of early food production, only the eastern United States and New Guinea remained without a fiber crop. Alongside these parallels, there were also some major differences in food production systems around the world. One is that agriculture in much of the old world came to involve broadcast seeding and monoculture fields, and eventually plowing. That is, seeds were sown by being thrown in handfuls, resulting in a whole field devoted to a single crop. Once cows, horses, and other large mammals were domesticated, they were hitched to plows and fields were tilled by animal power. In the New World, however, no animal was ever domesticated that could be hitched to a plow. Instead, fields were always tilled by hand-held sticks or hoes, and seeds were planted individually by hand and not scattered as whole handfuls. Most New World fields thus came to be mixed gardens of many crops planted together, rather than monoculture. Another major difference among agricultural systems involved the main sources of calories and carbohydrates. As we have seen, these were cereals in many areas, 
In other areas, though, that role of cereals was taken over or shared by roots and tubers, which were of negligible importance in the ancient Fertile Crescent and China. Manioc, alias cassava, and sweet potato became staples in tropical South America, potato and oca in the Andes, African yams in Africa, and Indo-Pacific yams and taro in Southeast Asia and New Guinea. Tree crops, notably bananas and breadfruit, also furnished carbohydrate-rich staples in Southeast Asia and New Guinea. Thus, by Roman times, almost all of today's leading crops were being cultivated somewhere in the world. Just as we shall see for domestic animals, too, ancient hunter-gatherers were intimately familiar with local wild plants, and ancient farmers evidently discovered and domesticated almost all of those worth domesticating. Of course, medieval monks did begin to cultivate strawberries and raspberries, and modern plant breeders are still improving ancient crops and have added new minor crops, notably some berries, like blueberries, cranberries, and kiwi fruit, and nuts, macadamias, pecans, and cashews. But these few modern additions have remained of modest importance compared with ancient staples like wheat, corn, and rice. Still, our list of triumphs lacks many wild plants that, despite their value as food, we never succeeded in domesticating. Notable among these failures of ours are oak trees, whose acorns were a staple food of Native Americans in California and the eastern United States, as well as a fallback food for European peasants in famine times of crop failure. Acorns are nutritionally valuable, being rich in starch and oil. Like many otherwise edible wild foods, most acorns do contain bitter tannins, but acorn lovers learned to deal with tannins in the same way that they dealt with bitter chemicals in almonds and other wild plants either by grinding and leaching the acorns to remove the tannins, or by harvesting acorns from the occasional mutant individual oak tree low in tannins. Why have we failed to domesticate such a prized food source as acorns? Why did we take so long to domesticate strawberries and raspberries? What is it about those plants that kept their domestication beyond the reach of ancient farmers capable of mastering such difficult techniques as grafting? It turns out that oak trees have three strikes against them. First, their slow growth would exhaust the patience of most farmers. Sown wheat yields a crop within a few months. A planted almond grows into a nut-bearing tree in three or four years. But a planted acorn may not become productive for a decade or more. Second, oak trees evolved to make nuts of a size and taste suitable for squirrels, which we've all seen burying, digging up, and eating acorns. Oaks grow from the occasional acorn that a squirrel forgets to dig up. With billions of squirrels, each spreading hundreds of acorns every year to virtually any spot suitable for oak trees to grow, we humans don't stand a chance of selecting oaks for the acorns that we wanted. Those same problems of slow growth and fast squirrels probably also explain why beech and hickory trees, heavily exploited as wild trees for their nuts by Europeans and Native Americans, respectively, were also not domesticated. Finally, perhaps the most important difference between almonds and acorns is that bitterness is controlled by a single dominant gene in almonds, but appears to be controlled by many genes in oaks. If ancient farmers planted almonds or acorns from the occasional non-bitter mutant tree, the laws of genetics dictate that half of the nuts from the resulting tree growing up would also be non-bitter in the case of almonds, but almost all would still be bitter in the case of oaks. That alone would kill the enthusiasm of any would-be acorn farmer who had defeated the squirrels and remained patient. As for strawberries and raspberries, we had similar trouble competing with thrushes and other berry-loving birds. Yes, the Romans did tend wild strawberries in their gardens, but with billions of European thrushes defecating wild strawberry seeds in every possible place, including Roman gardens, Strawberries remained the little berries that thrushes wanted, not the big berries that humans wanted. Only with the recent development of protective nets and greenhouses were we finally able to defeat the thrushes and to redesign strawberries and raspberries according to our own standards. We've thus seen that the difference between gigantic supermarket strawberries and tiny wild ones is just one example of the various features distinguishing cultivated plants from their wild ancestors. Those differences arose initially from natural variation among the wild plants themselves. Some of it, such as the variation in berry size or in nut bitterness, would have been readily noticed by ancient farmers. 
Other variations, such as that in seed dispersal mechanisms or seed dormancy, would have gone unrecognized by humans before the rise of modern botany. But whether or not the selection of wild edible plants by ancient hikers relied on conscious or unconscious criteria, the resulting evolution of wild plants into crops was at first an unconscious process. It followed inevitably from our selecting among wild plant individuals and from competition among plant individuals in gardens favoring individuals different from those favored in the wild. That's why Darwin, in his great book on the origin of species, didn't start with an account of natural selection. His first chapter is instead a lengthy account of how our domesticated plants and animals arose through artificial selection by humans. Rather than discussing the Galapagos Island birds that we usually associate with him, Darwin began by discussing how farmers develop varieties of gooseberries. He wrote, I have seen great surprise expressed in horticultural works at the wonderful skill of gardeners, in having produced such splendid results from such poor materials. But the art has been simple, and as far as the final result is concerned, has been followed almost unconsciously. It has consisted in always cultivating the best-known variety, sowing its seeds, and when a slightly better variety chanced to appear, selecting it, and so onwards. Those principles of crop development by artificial selection still serve as our most understandable model of the origin of species by natural selection. Apples or Indians? Why did peoples of some regions fail to domesticate plants? We have just seen how peoples of some regions began to cultivate wild plant species, a step with momentous unforeseen consequences for their lifestyle and their descendants' place in history. Let us now return to our questions. Why did agriculture never arise independently in some fertile and highly suitable areas, such as California, Europe, temperate Australia, and sub-equatorial Africa? Why, among the areas where agriculture did arise independently, did it develop much earlier in some than in others? Two contrasting explanations suggest themselves. Problems with the local people or problems with the locally available wild plants. On the one hand, perhaps almost any well-watered temperate or tropical area of the globe offers enough species of wild plants suitable for domestication. In that case, the explanation for agriculture's failure to develop in some of those areas would lie with cultural characteristics of their people. On the other hand, perhaps at least some humans in any large area of the globe would have been receptive to the experimentation that led to domestication. Only the lack of suitable wild plants might then explain why food production did not evolve in some areas. As we shall see in the next chapter, the corresponding problem for domestication of big wild animals proves easier to solve, because there are many fewer species of them than of plants. The world holds only about 148 species of large, wild, mammalian, terrestrial herbivores or omnivores, the large mammals that could be considered candidates for domestication. Only a modest number of factors determines whether a mammal is suitable for domestication. It's thus straightforward to review a region's big mammals and to test whether the lack of mammal domestication in some regions was due to the unavailability of suitable wild species rather than to local peoples. That approach would be much more difficult to apply to plants because of the sheer number, 200,000, of species of wild flowering plants, the plants that dominate vegetation on the land and that have furnished almost all of our crops. We can't possibly hope to examine all the wild plant species of even a circumscribed area like California and to assess how many of them would have been domesticable. But we shall now see how to get around that problem. When one hears that there are so many species of flowering plants, one's first reaction might be as follows. Surely, with all those wild plant species on Earth, any area with a sufficiently benign climate must have had more than enough species to provide plenty of candidates for crop development. But then reflect that the vast majority of wild plants are unsuitable for obvious reasons. They are woody, they produce no edible fruit, and their leaves and roots are also inedible. Of the 200,000 wild plant species, only a few thousand are eaten by humans, and just a few hundred of these have been more or less domesticated. 
Even of these several hundred crops, most provide minor supplements to our diet and would not by themselves have sufficed to support the rise of civilizations. A mere dozen species account for over 80% of the modern world's annual tonnage of all crops. Those dozen blockbusters are the cereals wheat, corn, rice, barley, and sorghum, the pulse soybean, the roots or tubers potato, manioc, and sweet potato, the sugar sources sugar cane and sugar beet, and the fruit banana. Cereal crops alone now account for more than half of the calories consumed by the world's human populations. With so few major crops in the world, all of them domesticated thousands of years ago, it's less surprising that many areas of the world had no wild native plants at all of outstanding potential. Our failure to domesticate even a single major new food plant in modern times suggests that ancient peoples really may have explored virtually all useful wild plants and domesticated all the ones worth domesticating. Yet some of the world's failures to domesticate wild plants remain hard to explain. The most flagrant cases concern plants that were domesticated in one area but not in another. We can thus be sure that it was indeed possible to develop the wild plant into a useful crop, and we have to ask why that wild species was not domesticated in certain areas. A typical puzzling example comes from Africa. The important cereal sorghum was domesticated in Africa's Sahel zone just south of the Sahara. It also occurs as a wild plant as far south as southern Africa, yet neither it nor any other plant was cultivated in southern Africa until the arrival of the whole crop package that Bantu farmers brought from Africa north of the equator 2,000 years ago. Why did the native peoples of southern Africa not domesticate sorghum for themselves? Equally puzzling is the failure of people to domesticate flax in its wild range in western Europe and North Africa, or einkorn wheat in its wild range in the southern Balkans. Since these two plants were among the first eight crops of the Fertile Crescent, they were presumably among the most readily domesticated of all wild plants. They were adopted for cultivation in those areas of their wild range outside the Fertile Crescent as soon as they arrived with the whole package of food production from the Fertile Crescent. Why then had peoples of those outlying areas not already begun to grow them of their own accord? Similarly, the four earliest domesticated fruits of the Fertile Crescent all had wild ranges stretching far beyond the eastern Mediterranean, where they appear to have been first domesticated. The olive, grape, and fig occurred west to Italy and Spain and northwest Africa, while the date palm extended to all of North Africa and Arabia. These four were evidently among the easiest to domesticate of all wild fruits. Why did peoples outside the Fertile Crescent fail to domesticate them and begin to grow them only when they had already been domesticated in the eastern Mediterranean and arrived thence as crops? Other striking examples involve wild species that were not domesticated in areas where food production never arose spontaneously, even though those wild species had close relatives domesticated elsewhere. For example, the olive Olea europea was domesticated in the eastern Mediterranean. There are about 40 other species of olives in tropical and southern Africa, southern Asia, and eastern Australia, some of them closely related to Olea europea, but none of them was ever domesticated. Similarly, while a wild apple species and a wild grape species were domesticated in Eurasia, there are many related wild apple and grape species in North America, some of which have in modern times been hybridized with the crops derived from their wild Eurasian counterparts in order to improve those crops. Why then didn't Native Americans domesticate those apparently useful apples and grapes themselves? One can go on and on with such examples, but there is a fatal flaw in this reasoning. Plant domestication is not a matter of hunter-gatherers domesticating a single plant and otherwise carrying on unchanged with their nomadic lifestyle. Suppose that North American wild apples really would have evolved into a terrific crop if only Indian hunter-gatherers had settled down and cultivated them. But nomadic hunter-gatherers would not throw over their traditional way of life, settle in villages, and start tending apple orchards unless many other domesticable wild plants and animals were available to make a sedentary food-producing existence competitive with a hunting-gathering existence. How, in short, do we assess the potential of an entire local flora for domestication? 
For those Native Americans who failed to domesticate North American apples, did the problem really lie with the Indians or with the apples? In order to answer this question, we compare three regions that lie at opposite extremes among centers of independent domestication. As we have seen, one of them, the Fertile Crescent, was perhaps the earliest center of food production in the world, and the site of origin of several of the modern world's major crops, and almost all of its major domesticated animals. The other two regions, New Guinea and the eastern United States, did domesticate local crops, but these crops were very few in variety. Only one of them gained worldwide importance, and the resulting food package failed to support extensive development of human technology and political organization, as in the Fertile Crescent. In the light of this comparison, we shall ask, did the flora and environment of the Fertile Crescent have clear advantages over those of New Guinea and the eastern United States? Peoples of the Fertile Crescent domesticated local plants much earlier. They domesticated far more species, domesticated far more productive or valuable species, domesticated a much wider range of types of crops, developed intensified food production and dense human populations more rapidly, and as a result entered the modern world with more advanced technology, more complex political organization, and more epidemic diseases with which to infect other peoples. Differences between the Fertile Crescent, New Guinea, and the eastern United States followed straightforwardly from the differing suites of wild plant and animal species available for domestication, not from limitations of the people themselves. When more productive crops arrived from elsewhere, the sweet potato in New Guinea, the Mexican trinity in the eastern United States, local peoples promptly took advantage of them, intensified food production, and increased greatly in population. By extension, I suggest that areas of the globe where food production never developed indigenously at all, California, Australia, the Argentine Pampas, Western Europe, and so on, may have offered even less in the way of wild plants and animals suitable for domestication than did New Guinea and the eastern United States, where at least a limited food production did arise. Indeed, Mark Blumler's worldwide survey of locally available large seeded wild grasses and a worldwide survey of locally available big mammals agree in showing that all those areas of non-existent or limited indigenous food production were deficient in wild ancestors of domesticable livestock and cereals. Recall that the rise of food production involved a competition between food production and hunting gathering. One might therefore wonder whether all these cases of slow or non-existent rise of food production might instead have been due to an exceptional local richness of resources to be hunted and gathered, rather than to an exceptional availability of species suitable for domestication. In fact, most areas where indigenous food production arose late or not at all offered exceptionally poor rather than rich resources to hunter-gatherers, because most large mammals of Australia and the Americas, but not of Eurasia and Africa, had become extinct toward the end of the Ice Ages. Food production would have faced even less competition from hunting-gathering in these areas than it did in the Fertile Crescent. Hence, these local failures or limitations of food production cannot be attributed to competition from bountiful hunting opportunities. Lest these conclusions be misinterpreted, we should end this chapter with caveats against exaggerating two points, people's readiness to accept better crops and livestock, and the constraints imposed by locally available wild plants and animals. Neither that readiness nor those constraints are absolute. We've already discussed many examples of local peoples adopting more productive crops domesticated elsewhere. Our broad conclusion is that people can recognize useful plants, would therefore have probably recognized better local ones suitable for domestication, if any had existed, and aren't barred from doing so by cultural conservatism or taboos. But a big qualifier must be added to this sentence. In the long run and over large areas... Anyone knowledgeable about human societies can cite innumerable examples of societies that refused crops, livestock, and other innovations that would have been productive. Naturally, I don't subscribe to the obvious fallacy that every society promptly adopts every innovation that would be useful for it. 
The fact is that over entire continents and other large areas containing hundreds of competing societies, some societies will be more open to innovation and some will be more resistant. The ones that do adopt new crops, livestock, or technology may thereby be enabled to nourish themselves better and to outbreed, displace, conquer, or kill off societies resisting innovation. That's an important phenomenon whose manifestations extend far beyond the adoption of new crops. Our other caveat concerns the limits that locally available wild species set on the rise of food production. I'm not saying that food production could never in any amount of time have arisen in all those areas where it actually had not arisen indigenously by modern times. Europeans today who note that Aboriginal Australians entered the modern world as Stone Age hunter-gatherers often assume that the Aborigines would have gone on that way forever. To appreciate the fallacy, consider a visitor from outer space who dropped in on Earth in the year 3000 BC. The spaceling would have observed no food production in the eastern United States because food production did not begin there until around 2500 B.C. Had the visitor of 3000 B.C. drawn the conclusion that limitations posed by the wild plants and animals of the eastern United States foreclosed food production there forever, events of the subsequent millennium would have proved the visitor wrong. Even a visitor to the Fertile Crescent in 9,500 B.C. rather than in 8,500 B.C. could have been misled into supposing the Fertile Crescent permanently unsuitable for food production. That is, my thesis is not that California, Australia, Western Europe, and all the other areas without indigenous food production were devoid of domesticable species and would have continued to be occupied just by hunter-gatherers indefinitely if foreign domesticates or people had not arrived. Instead, I note that regions differed greatly in their available pool of domesticable species, that they varied correspondingly in the date when local food production arose, and that food production had not yet arisen independently in some fertile regions as of modern times. Australia, supposedly the most backward continent, illustrates this point well. In southeastern Australia, the well-watered part of the continent most suitable for food production, Aboriginal societies in recent millennia appear to have been evolving on a trajectory that would eventually have led to indigenous food production. They had already built winter villages. They had begun to manage their environment intensively for fish production by building fish traps, nets, and even long canals. Had Europeans not colonized Australia in 1788 and aborted that independent trajectory, Aboriginal Australians might, within a few thousand years, have become food producers, tending ponds of domesticated fish and growing domesticated Australian yams and small seeded grasses. In that light, we can now answer the question implicit in the title of this chapter. I asked whether the reason for the failure of North American Indians to domesticate North American apples lay with the Indians or with the apples. I'm not thereby implying that apples could never have been domesticated in North America. Recall that apples were historically among the most difficult fruit trees to cultivate and among the last major ones to be domesticated in Eurasia because their propagation requires the difficult technique of grafting. There is no evidence for large-scale cultivation of apples even in the Fertile Crescent and in Europe until classical Greek times, 8,000 years after the rise of Eurasian food production began. If Native Americans had proceeded at the same rate in inventing or acquiring grafting techniques, they too would eventually have domesticated apples. Around the year A.D. 5500, some 8,000 years after the rise of domestication in North America, around 2,500 B.C. Thus, the reason for the failure of Native Americans to domesticate North American apples by the time Europeans arrived lay neither with the people nor with the apples. As far as biological prerequisites for apple domestication were concerned, North American Indian farmers were like Eurasian farmers, and North American wild apples were like Eurasian wild apples. Indeed, some of the supermarket apple varieties now being munched by readers of this chapter have been developed recently by crossing Eurasian apples with wild North American apples. Instead, the reason Native Americans did not domesticate apples lay with the entire suite of wild plant and animal species available to Native Americans.
That sweet's modest potential for domestication was responsible for the late start of food production in North America. Zebras, Unhappy Marriages, and the Anna Karenina Principle Why were most big wild mammal species never domesticated? Domesticable animals are all alike. Every undomesticable animal is undomesticable in its own way. If you think you've already read something like that before, you're right. Just make a few changes, and you have the famous first sentence of Tolstoy's great novel Anna Karenina. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. By that sentence, Tolstoy meant that in order to be happy, a marriage must succeed in many different respects. Sexual attraction, agreement about money, child discipline, religion, in-laws, and other vital issues. Failure in any one of those essential respects can doom a marriage even if it has all the other ingredients needed for happiness. This principle can be extended to understanding much else about life besides marriage. We tend to seek easy, single-factor explanations of success. For most important things, though, success actually requires avoiding many separate possible causes of failure. The Anna Karenina principle explains a feature of animal domestication that had heavy consequences for human history. Namely, that so many seemingly suitable big wild mammal species, such as zebras and peccaries, have never been domesticated, and that the successful domesticates were almost exclusively Eurasian. The importance of domesticated mammals rests on surprisingly few species of big terrestrial herbivores. Only terrestrial mammals have been domesticated, for the obvious reason that aquatic mammals were difficult to maintain and breed until the development of modern sea world facilities. If one defines big as weighing over 100 pounds, then only 14 such species were domesticated before the 20th century. Of those ancient 14, nine became important livestock for people in only limited areas of the globe. The Arabian camel, Bactrian camel, llama, alpaca, distinct breeds of the same ancestral species, donkey, reindeer, water buffalo, yak, banteng, and gaur. Only five species became widespread and important around the world. Those major five of mammal domestication are the cow, sheep, goat, pig, and horse. This list may at first seem to have glaring omissions. What about the African elephants with which Hannibal's armies crossed the Alps? What about the Asian elephants, still used as work animals in Southeast Asia today? No, I didn't forget them, and that raises an important distinction. Elephants have been tamed, but never domesticated. Hannibal's elephants were, and Asian work elephants are, just wild elephants that were captured and tamed. They were not bred in captivity. In contrast, a domesticated animal is defined as an animal selectively bred in captivity and thereby modified from its wild ancestors for use by humans who control the animal's breeding and food supply. That is, domestication involves wild animals being transformed into something more useful to humans. Truly domesticated animals differ in various ways from their wild ancestors. These differences result from two processes— human selection of those individual animals more useful to humans than other individuals of the same species, and automatic evolutionary responses of animals to the altered forces of natural selection operating in human environments as compared with wild environments. We already saw that all of these statements also apply to plant domestication. The ways in which domesticated animals have diverged from their wild ancestors include the following. Many species changed in size. Cows, pigs, and sheep became smaller under domestication, while guinea pigs became larger. Sheep and alpacas were selected for retention of wool and reduction or loss of hair, while cows have been selected for high milk yields. Several species of domestic animals have smaller brains and less developed sense organs than their wild ancestors because they no longer need the bigger brains and more developed sense organs on which their ancestors depended to escape from wild predators. To appreciate the changes that developed under domestication, just compare wolves, the wild ancestors of domestic dogs, with the many breeds of dogs. 
Some dogs are much bigger than wolves, Great Danes, while others are much smaller, Pekingese. Some are slimmer and built for racing, Greyhounds, while others are short-legged and useless for racing, Dachshunds. They vary enormously in hair form and color, and some are even hairless. Polynesians and Aztecs develop dog breeds specifically raised for food. Comparing a dachshund with a wolf, you wouldn't even suspect that the former had been derived from the latter, if you didn't already know it. The wild ancestors of the ancient Fourteen were spread unevenly over the globe. South America had only one such ancestor, which gave rise to the llama and alpaca. North America, Australia, and Sub-Saharan Africa had none at all. The lack of domestic mammals indigenous to Sub-Saharan Africa is especially astonishing, since a main reason why tourists visit Africa today is to see its abundant and diverse wild mammals. In contrast, the wild ancestors of thirteen of the ancient fourteen, including all of the major five, were confined to Eurasia. As elsewhere in this book, my use of the term Eurasia includes in several cases North Africa, which, biogeographically and in many aspects of human culture, is more closely related to Eurasia than to Sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, not all thirteen of these wild ancestral species occurred together throughout Eurasia. No area had all thirteen, and some of the wild ancestors were quite local, such as the Yak, confined in the wild to Tibet and adjacent highland areas. However, many parts of Eurasia did have quite a few of these thirteen species living together in the same area. For example, seven of the wild ancestors occurred in Southwest Asia. This very unequal distribution of wild ancestral species among the continents became an important reason why Eurasians, rather than peoples of other continents, were the ones to end up with guns, germs, and steel. How can we explain the concentration of the ancient fourteen in Eurasia? One reason is simple. Eurasia has the largest number of big terrestrial wild mammal species, whether or not ancestral to a domesticated species. Let's define a candidate for domestication as any terrestrial herbivorous or omnivorous mammal species, one not predominantly a carnivore, weighing on the average over 100 pounds, 45 kilograms. Eurasia has the most candidates, 72 species, just as it has the most species in many other plant and animal groups. That's because Eurasia is the world's largest land mass, and it's also very diverse ecologically, with habitats ranging from extensive tropical rainforests, through temperate forests, deserts, and marshes, to equally extensive tundras. Sub-Saharan Africa has fewer candidates, 51 species, just as it has fewer species in most other plant and animal groups, because it's smaller and ecologically less diverse than Eurasia. Africa has smaller areas of tropical rainforest than does Southeast Asia, and no temperate habitats at all beyond latitude 37 degrees. As I discussed in Chapter 1, the Americas may formerly have had almost as many candidates as Africa, but most of America's big wild mammals, including its horses, most of its camels, and other species likely to have been domesticated had they survived, became extinct about 13,000 years ago. Australia, the smallest and most isolated continent, has always had far fewer species of big wild mammals than has Eurasia, Africa, or the Americas. Just as in the Americas, in Australia, all of those few candidates except the red kangaroo became extinct around the time of the continent's first colonization by humans. Thus, part of the explanation for Eurasia's having been the main site of big mammal domestication is that it was the continent with the most candidate species of wild mammals to start out with, and lost the fewest candidates to extinction in the last 40,000 years. It's also true that the percentage of candidates actually domesticated is highest in Eurasia, 18%, and is especially low in sub-Saharan Africa. No species domesticated out of 51 candidates. Particularly surprising is the large number of species of African and American mammals that were never domesticated, despite their having Eurasian close relatives or counterparts that were domesticated. Why were Eurasia's horses domesticated but not Africa's zebras? Why Eurasia's pigs but not American peccaries or Africa's three species of true wild pigs? Why Eurasia's five species of wild cattle 
aurochs, water buffalo, yak, gaur, bantang, but not the African buffalo or American bison. Why the Asian mouflon sheep, ancestor of our domestic sheep, but not North American bighorn sheep? Did all those peoples of Africa, the Americas, and Australia, despite their enormous diversity, nonetheless share some cultural obstacles to domestication not shared with Eurasian peoples? For example, did Africa's abundance of big wild mammals, available to kill by hunting, make it superfluous for Africans to go to the trouble of tending domestic stock? The answer to that question is unequivocal. No. The interpretation is refuted by five types of evidence. Rapid acceptance of Eurasian domesticates by non-Eurasian peoples, the universal human pension for keeping pets, the rapid domestication of the ancient fourteen, the repeated independent domestications of some of them, and the limited successes of modern efforts at further domestications. First, when Eurasia's major five domestic mammals reached sub-Saharan Africa, they were adopted by the most diverse African peoples wherever conditions permitted. Those African herders thereby achieved a huge advantage over African hunter-gatherers and quickly displaced them. In particular, Bantu farmers who acquired cows and sheep spread out of their homeland in West Africa and within a short time overran the former hunter-gatherers in most of the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. Even without acquiring crops, Khoisan peoples who acquired cows and sheep around 2,000 years ago displaced Khoisan hunter-gatherers over much of southern Africa. The arrival of the domestic horse in West Africa transformed warfare there and turned the area into a set of kingdoms dependent on cavalry. The only factor that prevented horses from spreading beyond West Africa was trypanosome diseases borne by tsetse flies. The same pattern repeated itself elsewhere in the world. Whenever peoples lacking native wild mammal species suitable for domestication finally had the opportunity to acquire Eurasian domestic animals. European horses were eagerly adopted by Native Americans in both North and South America, within a generation of the escape of horses from European settlements. For example, by the 19th century, North America's Great Plains Indians were famous as expert horse-mounted warriors and bison hunters, but they did not even obtain horses until the late 17th century. Sheep acquired from Spaniards similarly transformed Navajo Indian society, and led to, among other things, the weaving of the beautiful woolen blankets for which the Navajo have become renowned. Within a decade of Tasmania's settlement by Europeans with dogs, Aboriginal Tasmanians, who had never before seen dogs, began to breed them in large numbers for use in hunting. Thus, among the thousands of culturally diverse native peoples of Australia, the Americas, and Africa, no universal cultural taboo stood in the way of animal domestication. Surely, if some local wild mammal species of those continents had been domesticable, some Australian, American, and African peoples would have domesticated them and gained great advantage from them, just as they benefited from the Eurasian domestic animals that they immediately adopted when those became available. For instance, consider all the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa living within the range of wild zebras and buffalo. Why wasn't there at least one African hunter-gatherer tribe that domesticated those zebras and buffalo, and that thereby gained sway over other Africans without having to await the arrival of Eurasian horses and cattle? All these facts indicate that the explanation for the lack of native mammal domestication outside Eurasia lay with the locally available wild mammals themselves, not with the local peoples. Dates of domestication provide a third line of evidence confirming Galton's view that early herding peoples quickly domesticated all big mammal species suitable for being domesticated. All species for whose dates of domestication we have archaeological evidence were domesticated between about 8,000 and 2,500 B.C. That is, within the first few thousand years of the sedentary farming herding societies that arose after the end of the last ice age. The era of big mammal domestication began with sheep, goat, and pig, and ended with camels. Since 2500 BC, there have been no significant additions. It's true, for example, that some small mammals were first domesticated long after 2500 BC. For example, rabbits were not domesticated for food until the Middle Ages, mice and rats for laboratory research not until the 20th century, and hamsters for pets not until the 1930s. 
The continuing development of domesticated small mammals isn't surprising, because there are literally thousands of wild species as candidates, and because they were of too little value to traditional societies to warrant the effort of raising them. But big mammal domestication virtually ended 4,500 years ago. By then, all of the world's 148 candidate big species must have been tested innumerable times, with the result that only a few passed the test and no other suitable ones remained. Still a fourth line of evidence that some mammal species are much more suitable than others is provided by the repeated independent domestications of the same species. Genetic evidence based on the portions of our genetic material known as mitochondrial DNA recently confirmed, as had long been suspected, that humped cattle of India and humpless European cattle were derived from two separate populations of wild ancestral cattle that had diverged hundreds of thousands of years ago. That is, Indian peoples domesticated the local Indian subspecies of wild aurochs, Southwest Asians independently domesticated their own Southwest Asian subspecies of aurochs, and North Africans may have independently domesticated the North African aurochs. Similarly, wolves were independently domesticated to become dogs in the Americas and probably in several different parts of Eurasia, including China and Southwest Asia. Modern pigs are derived from independent sequences of domestication in China, Western Eurasia, and possibly other areas as well. These examples re-emphasize that the same few suitable wild species attracted the attention of many different human societies. In all, of the world's 148 big wild terrestrial herbivorous mammals, the candidates for domestication, only 14 passed the test. Why did the other 134 species fail? To which conditions was Francis Galton referring when he spoke of those other species as destined to perpetual wildness? The answer follows from the Anna Karenina principle. To be domesticated, a candidate wild species must possess many different characteristics. Lack of any single required characteristic dooms efforts at domestication, just as it dooms efforts at building a happy marriage. Playing marriage counselor to the zebra-human couple and other ill-sorted pairs, we can recognize at least six groups of reasons for failed domestication. Diet Every time that an animal eats a plant or another animal, the conversion of food biomass into the consumer's biomass involves an efficiency of much less than 100%, typically around 10%. That is, it takes around 10,000 pounds of corn to grow a 1,000-pound cow. If instead you want to grow 1,000 pounds of carnivore, you have to feed it 10,000 pounds of herbivore grown on 100,000 pounds of corn. Even among herbivores and omnivores, many species, like koalas, are too finicky in their plant preferences to recommend themselves as farm animals. As a result of this fundamental inefficiency, no mammalian carnivore has ever been domesticated for food. No, it's not because its meat would be tough or tasteless. We eat carnivorous wild fish all the time, and I can personally attest to the delicious flavor of lion burger. The nearest thing to an exception is the dog, originally domesticated as a sentinel and hunting companion, but breeds of dogs were developed and raised for food in Aztec Mexico, Polynesia, and ancient China. However, regular dog-eating has been a last resort of meat-deprived human societies. The Aztecs had no other domestic mammal, and the Polynesians and ancient Chinese had only pigs and dogs. Human societies blessed with domestic herbivorous mammals have not bothered to eat dogs, except as an uncommon delicacy, as in parts of Southeast Asia today. In addition, dogs are not strict carnivores, but omnivores. If you are so naive as to think that your beloved pet dog is really a meat-eater, just read the list of ingredients on your bag of dog food. The dogs that the Aztecs and Polynesians reared for food were efficiently fattened on vegetables and garbage. Growth Rate To be worth keeping, domesticates must also grow quickly. That eliminates gorillas and elephants, even though they are vegetarians with admirably non-finicky food preferences and represent a lot of meat. What would-be gorilla or elephant rancher would wait 15 years for his herd to reach adult size? Modern Asians who want work elephants find it much cheaper to capture them in the wild and tame them. 
Problems of Captive Breeding We humans don't like to have sex under the watchful eyes of others. Some potentially valuable animal species don't like to either. That's what derailed attempts to domesticate cheetahs, the swiftest of all land animals, despite our strong motivation to do so for thousands of years. Tame cheetahs were prized by ancient Egyptians and Assyrians and modern Indians as hunting animals infinitely superior to dogs. One Mughal emperor of India kept a stable of a thousand cheetahs. But despite those large investments that many wealthy princes made, all of their cheetahs were tamed ones caught in the wild. The prince's efforts to breed cheetahs in captivity failed, and not until 1960 did even biologists in modern zoos achieve their first successful cheetah birth. In the wild, several cheetah brothers chase a female for several days, and that rough courtship over large distances seems to be required to get the female to ovulate or to become sexually receptive. Cheetahs usually refuse to carry out that elaborate courtship ritual inside a cage. A similar problem has frustrated schemes to breed the vicuña, an Andean wild camel whose wool is prized as the finest and lightest of any animals. The ancient Incas obtained vicuña wool by driving wild vicuñas into corrals, shearing them, and then releasing them alive. Modern merchants wanting this luxury wool have had to resort either to the same method or simply to killing wild vicuñas. Despite strong incentives of money and prestige, all attempts to breed vicuñas for wool production in captivity have failed, for reasons that include vicuñas' long and elaborate courtship ritual before mating, a ritual inhibited in captivity, male vicuñas' fierce intolerance of each other, and their requirement for both a year-round feeding territory and a separate year-round sleeping territory. Nasty Disposition Naturally, almost any mammal species that is sufficiently large is capable of killing a human. People have been killed by pigs, horses, camels, and cattle. Nevertheless, some large animals have much nastier dispositions and are more incurably dangerous than are others. Tendencies to kill humans have disqualified many otherwise seemingly ideal candidates for domestication. An obvious example is the grizzly bear. Bear meat is an expensive delicacy. Grizzlies weigh up to 1,700 pounds. They are mainly vegetarians, though also formidable hunters. Their vegetable diet is very broad. They thrive on human garbage, thereby creating big problems in Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks and they grow relatively fast. If they would behave themselves in captivity, grizzlies would be a fabulous meat production animal. The Ainu people of Japan made the experiment by routinely rearing grizzly cubs as part of a ritual. For understandable reasons, though, the Ainu found it prudent to kill and eat the cubs at the age of one year. Keeping grizzly bears for longer would be suicidal. I am not aware of any adult that has been tamed. Another otherwise suitable candidate that disqualifies itself for equally obvious reasons is the African buffalo. It grows quickly up to a weight of a ton and lives in herds that have a well-developed dominance hierarchy, a trait whose virtues will be discussed below. But the African buffalo is considered the most dangerous and unpredictable large mammal of Africa. Anyone insane enough to try to domesticate it either died in the effort or was forced to kill the buffalo before it got too big and nasty. Similarly, hippos, as four-ton vegetarians, would be great barnyard animals if they weren't so dangerous. They kill more people each year than do any other African mammals, including even lions. Few people would be surprised at the disqualification of those notoriously ferocious candidates, but there are other candidates whose dangers are not so well known. For instance, the eight species of wild equids, horses and their relatives, vary greatly in disposition, even though all eight are genetically so close to each other that they will interbreed and produce healthy, though usually sterile, offspring. Two of them, the horse and the North African ass, ancestor of the donkey, were successfully domesticated. Closely related to the North African ass is the Asiatic ass, also known as the onager. Since its homeland includes the Fertile Crescent, the cradle of Western civilization and animal domestication, ancient peoples must have experimented extensively with onagers. We know from Sumerian and later depictions that onagers were regularly hunted, as well as captured and hybridized with donkeys and horses. Some ancient depictions of horse-like animals used for riding or for pulling carts may refer to onagers. 
However, all writers about them, from Romans to modern zookeepers, decry their irascible temper and their nasty habit of biting people. As a result, although similar in other respects to ancestral donkeys, onagers have never been domesticated. Africa's four species of zebras are even worse. Efforts at domestication went as far as hitching them to carts. They were tried out as draft animals in 19th century South Africa, and the eccentric Lord Walter Rothschild drove through the streets of London in a carriage pulled by zebras. Alas, zebras become impossibly dangerous as they grow older. That's not to deny that many individual horses are also nasty, but zebras and onagers are much more uniformly so. Zebras have the unpleasant habit of biting a person and not letting go. They thereby injure even more American zookeepers each year than do tigers. Zebras are also virtually impossible to lasso with a rope, even for cowboys who win rodeo championships by lassoing horses, because of their unfailing ability to watch the rope noose fly toward them and then to duck their head out of the way. Hence it has rarely, if ever, been possible to saddle or ride a zebra, and South Africans' enthusiasm for their domestication waned. Unpredictably aggressive behavior on the part of a large and potentially dangerous mammal is also part of the reason why the initially so promising modern experiments in domesticating elk and eland have not been more successful. Tendency to Panic Big mammalian herbivore species react to danger from predators or humans in different ways. Some species are nervous, fast, and programmed for instant flight when they perceive a threat. Other species are slower, less nervous, seek protection in herds, stand their ground when threatened, and don't run until necessary. Most species of deer and antelope, with the conspicuous exception of reindeer, are of the former type, while sheep and goats are of the latter. Naturally, the nervous species are difficult to keep in captivity. If put into an enclosure, they are likely to panic, and either die of shock or batter themselves to death against the fence in their attempts to escape. That's true, for example, of gazelles, which for thousands of years were the most frequently hunted game species in some parts of the Fertile Crescent. There is no mammal species that the first settled peoples of that area had more opportunity to domesticate than gazelles. But no gazelle species has ever been domesticated. Just imagine trying to herd an animal that bolts, blindly bashes itself against walls, can leap up to nearly 30 feet, and can run at a speed of 50 miles an hour. Social Structure Almost all species of domesticated large mammals prove to be ones whose wild ancestors share three social characteristics. They live in herds, they maintain a well-developed dominance hierarchy among herd members, and the herds occupy overlapping home ranges rather than mutually exclusive territories. For example, herds of wild horses consist of one stallion, up to half a dozen mares, and their foals. Mare A is dominant over mares B, C, D, and E. Mare B is submissive to A, but dominant over C, D, and E. C is submissive to B and A, but dominant over D and E, and so on. When the herd is on the move, its members maintain a stereotyped order. In the rear, the stallion. In the front, the top-ranking female, followed by her foals in order of age, with the youngest first and behind her the other mares in order of rank, each followed by her foals in order of age. In that way, many adults can coexist in the herd without constant fighting and with each knowing its rank. That social structure is ideal for domestication because humans, in effect, take over the dominance hierarchy. Domestic horses of a pack line follow the human leader as they would normally follow the top-ranking female. Herds or packs of sheep Goats, cows, and ancestral dogs, wolves, have a similar hierarchy. As young animals grow up in such a herd, they imprint on the animals that they regularly see nearby. Under wild conditions, those are members of their own species, but captive young herd animals also see humans nearby and imprint on humans as well. Such social animals lend themselves to herding. Since they are tolerant of each other, they can be bunched up. Since they instinctively follow a dominant leader and will imprint on humans as that leader, they can readily be driven by a shepherd or sheepdog. Herd animals do well when penned in crowded conditions because they are accustomed to living in densely packed groups in the wild. In contrast, members of most solitary territorial animal species cannot be herded. 
They do not tolerate each other, they do not imprint on humans, and they are not instinctively submissive. Whoever saw a line of cats, solitary and territorial in the wild, following a human or allowing themselves to be herded by a human? Every cat lover knows that cats are not submissive to humans in the way dogs instinctively are. Cats and ferrets are the sole territorial mammal species that were domesticated, because our motive for doing so was not to herd them in large groups raised for food, but to keep them as solitary hunters or pets. While most solitary territorial species thus haven't been domesticated, it's not conversely the case that most herd species can be domesticated. Most can't, for one of several additional reasons. First, herds of many species don't have overlapping home ranges, but instead maintain exclusive territories against other herds. It's no more possible to pen two such herds together than to pen two males of a solitary species. Second, many species that live in herds for part of the year are territorial in the breeding season, when they fight and do not tolerate each other's presence. That's true of most deer and antelope species, again with the exception of reindeer, and it's one of the main factors that has disqualified all the social antelope species for which Africa is famous from being domesticated. While one's first association to African antelope is vast, dense herds spreading across the horizon, in fact, the males of those herds space themselves into territories and fight fiercely with each other when breeding. Hence, those antelope cannot be maintained in crowded enclosures in captivity, as can sheep or goats or cattle. Territorial behavior similarly combines with a fierce disposition and a slow growth rate to banish rhinos from the farmyard. Finally, many herd species, including again most deer and antelope, do not have a well-defined dominance hierarchy and are not instinctively prepared to become imprinted on a dominant leader, hence to become misimprinted on humans. As a result, though many deer and antelope species have been tamed, think of all those true Bambi stories, one never sees such tame deer and antelope driven in herds, like sheep. That problem also derailed domestication of North American bighorn sheep, which belong to the same genus as Asiatic mouflon sheep, ancestor of our domestic sheep. Bighorn sheep are suitable to us and similar to mouflons in most respects, except a crucial one. They lack the mouflons' stereotypical behavior, whereby some individuals behave submissively toward other individuals whose dominance they acknowledge. Spacious Skies and Tilted Axes Why did food production spread at different rates on different continents? On a map of the world, compare the shapes and orientations of the continents. You'll be struck by an obvious difference. The Americas span a much greater distance north to south, 9,000 miles, than east to west, only 3,000 miles at the widest, narrowing to a mere 40 miles at the Isthmus of Panama. That is, the major axis of the Americas is north-south. The same is also true, though to a less extreme degree, for Africa. In contrast, the major axis of Eurasia is east-west. What effect, if any, did those differences on the orientation of the continent's axes have on human history? This chapter will be about what I see as their enormous, sometimes tragic, consequences. Axis orientations affected the rate of spread of crops and livestock, and possibly also of writing, wheels, and other inventions. That basic feature of geography thereby contributed heavily to the very different experiences of Native Americans, Africans, and Eurasians in the last 500 years. Food production's spread proves as crucial to understanding geographic differences in the rise of guns, germs, and steel as did its origins, which we considered in the preceding chapters. That's because, as we saw, there were no more than nine areas of the globe, perhaps as few as five, where food production arose independently. Yet already in prehistoric times, food production became established in many other regions besides those few areas of origins. All those other areas became food producing as a result of the spread of crops, livestock, and knowledge of how to grow them, and in some cases, as a result of migrations of farmers and herders themselves. The main such spreads of food production were from Southwest Asia to Europe, Egypt and North Africa, Ethiopia, Central Asia, and the Indus Valley, from the Sahel and West Africa to East and South Africa, 
From China to tropical Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Korea, and Japan, and from Mesoamerica to North America. Moreover, food production, even in its areas of origin, became enriched by the addition of crops, livestock, and techniques from other areas of origin. Just as some regions proved much more suitable than others for the origins of food production, the ease of its spread also varied greatly around the world. Some areas that are ecologically very suitable for food production never acquired it in prehistoric times at all, even though areas of prehistoric food production existed nearby. The most conspicuous such examples are the failure of both farming and herding to reach Native American California from the U.S. Southwest or to reach Australia from New Guinea and Indonesia, and the failure of farming to spread from South Africa's Natal province to South Africa's Cape. Even among all those areas where food production did spread in the prehistoric era, the rates and dates of spread varied considerably. At the one extreme was its rapid spread along east-west axes, from Southwest Asia both west to Europe and Egypt and east to the Indus Valley, at an average rate of about 0.7 miles per year, and from the Philippines east to Polynesia at 3.2 miles per year. At the opposite extreme was its slow spread along north-south axes, at less than 0.5 miles per year from Mexico northward to the U.S. southwest, at less than 0.3 miles per year for corn and beans from Mexico northward to become productive in the eastern United States around A.D. 900, and at 0.2 miles per year for the llama from Peru north to Ecuador. These differences could be even greater if corn was not domesticated in Mexico as late as 3,500 B.C., as I assumed conservatively for these calculations, and as some archaeologists now assume, but if it was instead domesticated considerably earlier, as most archaeologists used to assume, and many still do. There were also great differences in the completeness with which suites of crops and livestock spread, again implying stronger or weaker barriers to their spreading. For instance, while most of Southwest Asia's founder crops and livestock did spread west to Europe and east to the Indus Valley, neither of the Andes' domestic mammals— the llama alpaca and the guinea pig, ever reached Mesoamerica in pre-Columbian times. That astonishing failure cries out for explanation. After all, Mesoamerica did develop dense farming populations and complex societies, so there can be no doubt that Andean domestic animals, if they had been available, would have been valuable for food, transport, and wool. Except for dogs, Mesoamerica was utterly without indigenous mammals to fill those needs. Some South American crops, nevertheless, did succeed in reaching Mesoamerica, such as manioc, sweet potatoes, and peanuts. What selective barrier let those crops through but screened out llamas and guinea pigs? A subtler expression of this geographically varying ease of spread is the phenomenon termed preemptive domestication. Most of the wild plant species from which our crops were derived vary genetically from area to area, because alternative mutations had become established among the wild ancestral populations of different areas. Similarly, the changes required to transform wild plants into crops can in principle be brought about by alternative new mutations or alternative courses of selection to yield equivalent results. In this light, one can examine a crop widespread in prehistoric times and ask whether all of its varieties show the same wild mutation or same transforming mutation. The purpose of this examination is to try to figure out whether the crop was developed in just one area or else independently in several areas. If one carries out such a genetic analysis for major ancient New World crops, many of them prove to include two or more of those alternative wild variants or two or more of those alternative transforming mutations. This suggests that the crop was domesticated independently in at least two different areas and that some varieties of the crop inherited the particular mutation of one area, while other varieties of the same crop inherited the mutation of another area. On this basis, botanists conclude that lima beans, Phaseolus lunatus, common beans, Phaseolus vulgaris, and chili peppers of the Capsicum annuum chinense group were all domesticated on at least two separate occasions, once in Mesoamerica and once in South America, and that the squash Cucurba de pepo and the seed plant goosefoot were also domesticated independently at least twice, once in Mesoamerica and once in the eastern United States. 
In contrast, most ancient Southwest Asian crops exhibit just one of the alternative wild variants or alternative transforming mutations, suggesting that all modern varieties of that particular crop stem from only a single domestication. What does it imply if the same crop has been repeatedly and independently domesticated in several different parts of its wild range, and not just once and in a single area? We have already seen that plant domestication involves the modification of wild plants so that they become more useful to humans by virtue of larger seeds, a less bitter taste, or other qualities. Hence, if a productive crop is already available, incipient farmers will surely proceed to grow it rather than start all over again by gathering its not-yet-so-useful wild relative and re-domesticating it. Evidence for just a single domestication thus suggests that, once a wild plant had been domesticated, the crop spread quickly to other areas throughout the wild plant's range, preempting the need for other independent domestications of the same plant. However, when we find evidence that the same wild ancestor was domesticated independently in different areas, we infer that the crop spread too slowly to preempt its domestication elsewhere. The evidence for predominantly single domestications in Southwest Asia, but frequent multiple domestications in the Americas, might thus provide more subtle evidence that crops spread more easily out of Southwest Asia than in the Americas. Rapid spread of a crop may preempt domestication, not only of the same wild ancestral species somewhere else, but also of related wild species. If you're already growing good peas, it's of course pointless to start from scratch to domesticate the same wild ancestral pea again, but it's also pointless to domesticate closely related wild pea species that for farmers are virtually equivalent to the already domesticated pea species. All of Southwest Asia's founder crops preempted domestication of any of their close relatives throughout the whole expanse of Western Eurasia. In contrast, the New World presents many cases of equivalent and closely related but nevertheless distinct species having been domesticated in Mesoamerica and South America. For instance, 95% of the cotton grown in the world today belongs to the cotton species Gisipium hirsutum, which was domesticated in prehistoric times in Mesoamerica. However, prehistoric South American farmers instead grew the related cotton, Gisipium barbadens. Evidently, Mesoamerican cotton had such difficulty reaching South America that it failed in the prehistoric era to preempt the domestication of a different cotton species there, and vice versa. Chili peppers, squashes, amaranths, and kenopods are other crops of which different but related species were domesticated in Mesoamerica and South America since no species was able to spread fast enough to preempt the others. We thus have many different phenomena converging on the same conclusion, that food production spread more readily out of Southwest Asia than in the Americas, and possibly also than in Sub-Saharan Africa. Those phenomena include food production's complete failure to reach some ecologically suitable areas, the differences in its rate and selectivity of spread, and the differences in whether the earliest domesticated crops preempted re-domestications of the same species or domestications of close relatives. What was it about the Americas and Africa that made the spread of food production more difficult there than in Eurasia? To answer this question, let's begin by examining the rapid spread of food production out of Southwest Asia, the Fertile Crescent. Soon after food production arose there, somewhat before 8000 BC, a centrifugal wave of it appeared in other parts of western Eurasia and North Africa, farther and farther removed from the Fertile Crescent, to the west and east. I have redrawn a striking map assembled by the geneticist Daniel Zohari and botanist Maria Hopf, in which they illustrate how the wave had reached Greece and Cyprus and the Indian subcontinent by 6500 BC, Egypt soon after 6000 BC, Central Europe by 5400 BC, Southern Spain by 5200 BC, and Britain around 3500 BC. In each of those areas, food production was initiated by some of the same suite of domestic plants and animals that launched it in the Fertile Crescent. In addition, the Fertile Crescent package penetrated Africa southward to Ethiopia at some still uncertain date. However, Ethiopia also developed many indigenous crops, and we do not yet know whether it was those crops or the arriving Fertile Crescent crops that launched Ethiopian food production. 
Of course, not all pieces of the package spread to all those outlying areas. For example, Egypt was too warm for einkorn wheat to become established. In some outlying areas, elements of the package arrived at different times. For instance, sheep preceded cereals in southwestern Europe. Some outlying areas went on to domesticate a few local crops of their own, such as poppies in Western Europe and watermelons, possibly in Egypt. But most food production in outlying areas depended initially on fertile crescent domesticates. Their spread was soon followed by that of other innovations originating in or near the fertile crescent, including the wheel, writing, metalworking techniques, milking, fruit trees, and beer and wine production. Why did the same plant package launch food production throughout Western Eurasia? Was it because the same set of plants occurred in the wild in many areas, were found useful there just as in the Fertile Crescent, and were independently domesticated? No, that's not the reason. First, many of the Fertile Crescent's founder crops don't even occur in the wild outside Southwest Asia. For instance, none of the eight main founder crops except barley grows wild in Egypt. Egypt's Nile Valley provides an environment similar to the Fertile Crescent's Tigris and Euphrates Valleys. Hence, the package that worked well in the latter valleys also worked well enough in the Nile Valley to trigger the spectacular rise of indigenous Egyptian civilization. But the foods to fuel that spectacular rise were originally absent in Egypt. The Sphinx and pyramids were built by people fed on crops originally native to the Fertile Crescent, not to Egypt. Second, even for those crops whose wild ancestor does occur outside of Southwest Asia, we can be confident that the crops of Europe and India were mostly obtained from Southwest Asia and were not local domesticates. For example, wild flax occurs west to Britain and Algeria and east to the Caspian Sea, while wild barley occurs east even to Tibet. However, for most of the Fertile Crescent's founding crops, all cultivated varieties in the world today share only one arrangement of chromosomes out of the multiple arrangements found in the wild ancestor. Or else they share only a single mutation, out of many possible mutations, by which the cultivated varieties differ from the wild ancestor in characteristics desirable to humans. For instance, all cultivated peas share the same recessive gene that prevents ripe pods of cultivated peas from spontaneously popping open and spilling their peas, as wild pea pods do. Evidently, most of the Fertile Crescent's founder crops were never domesticated again elsewhere after their initial domestication in the Fertile Crescent. Had they been repeatedly domesticated independently, they would exhibit legacies of those multiple origins in the form of varied chromosomal arrangements or varied mutations. Hence, these are typical examples of the phenomenon of preemptive domestication that we discussed above. The quick spread of the Fertile Crescent package preempted any possible other attempts, within the Fertile Crescent or elsewhere, to domesticate the same wild ancestors. Once the crop had become available, there was no further need to gather it from the wild and thereby set it on the path to domestication again. The ancestors of most of the founder crops have wild relatives, in the Fertile Crescent and elsewhere, that would also have been suitable for domestication. For example, peas belong to the genus Pism, which consists of two wild species, Pism sativum, the one that became domesticated to yield our garden peas, and Pism fulvum, which was never domesticated. Yet wild peas of Pism fulvum taste good, either fresh or dried, and are common in the wild. Similarly, wheats, barley, lentil, chickpea, beans, and flax all have numerous wild relatives besides the ones that became domesticated. Some of those related beans and barleys were indeed domesticated independently in the Americas or China, far from the early site of domestication in the Fertile Crescent. But in western Eurasia only one of several potentially useful wild species was domesticated, probably because that one spread so quickly that people soon stopped gathering the other wild relatives and ate only the crop. Again, as we discussed above, the crop's rapid spread preempted any possible further attempts to domesticate its relatives as well as to redomesticate its ancestor. Why was the spread of crops from the Fertile Crescent so rapid? The answer depends partly on that east-west axis of Eurasia with which I opened this chapter. Localities distributed east and west of each other at the same latitude share exactly the same day length and its seasonal variations. To a lesser degree, they also tend to share similar diseases, regimes of temperature and rainfall, and habitats or biomes. 
types of vegetation. For example, southern Italy, northern Iran, and Japan, all located at about the same latitude, but lying successively 4,000 miles east or west of each other, are more similar to each other in climate than each is to a location lying even a mere thousand miles due south. On all the continents, the habitat type known as tropical rainforest is confined to within about 10 degrees latitude of the equator, while Mediterranean scrub habitats, such as California's chaparral and Europe's maquis, lie between about 30 and 40 degrees of latitude. But the germination, growth, and disease resistance of plants are adapted to precisely those features of climate. Seasonal changes of day length, temperature, and rainfall constitute signals that stimulate seeds to germinate, seedlings to grow, and mature plants to develop flowers, seeds, and fruit. Each plant population becomes genetically programmed, through natural selection, to respond appropriately to signals of the seasonal regime under which it has evolved. Those regimes vary greatly with latitude. For example, day length is constant throughout the year at the equator, but at temperate latitudes it increases as the months advance from the winter solstice to the summer solstice, and it then declines again through the next half of the year. The growing season, that is the months with temperatures and day lengths suitable for plant growth, is shortest at high latitudes and longest toward the equator. Plants are also adapted to the diseases prevalent at their latitude. Woe betide the plant whose genetic program is mismatched to the latitude of the field in which it is planted. Imagine a Canadian farmer foolish enough to plant a race of corn adapted to growing farther south, in Mexico. The unfortunate corn plant following its Mexico-adapted genetic program would prepare to thrust up its shoots in March, only to find itself still buried under ten feet of snow. Should the plant become genetically reprogrammed so as to germinate at a time more appropriate to Canada, say late June, the plant would still be in trouble for other reasons. Its genes would be telling it to grow at a leisurely rate, sufficient only to bring it to maturity in five months. That's a perfectly safe strategy in Mexico's mild climate, but in Canada a disastrous one that would guarantee the plant's being killed by autumn frosts before it had produced any mature corn cobs. The plant would also lack genes for resistance to diseases of northern climates, while uselessly carrying genes for resistance to diseases of southern climates. All those features make low-latitude plants poorly adapted to high-latitude conditions and vice versa. As a consequence, most fertile crescent crops grow well in France and Japan, but poorly at the equator. Animals, too, are adapted to latitude-related features of climate. In that respect, we are typical animals, as we know by introspection. Some of us can't stand cold northern winters with their short days and characteristic germs, while others of us can't stand hot tropical climates with their own characteristic diseases. In recent centuries, overseas colonists from cool northern Europe have preferred to emigrate to the similarly cool climates of North America, Australia, and South Africa, and to settle in the cool highlands within equatorial Kenya and New Guinea. Northern Europeans who were sent out to hot tropical lowland areas used to die in droves of diseases such as malaria, to which tropical peoples had evolved some genetic resistance. That's part of the reason why fertile crescent domesticates spread west and east so rapidly. They were already well adapted to the climates of the regions to which they were spreading. For instance, once farming crossed from the plains of Hungary into Central Europe around 5,400 B.C., it spread so quickly that the sites of the first farmers in the vast area from Poland west to Holland, marked by their characteristic pottery with linear decorations, were nearly contemporaneous. By the time of Christ, cereals of fertile crescent origin were growing over the 10,000-mile expanse from the Atlantic coast of Ireland to the Pacific coast of Japan. That west-east expansion of Eurasia is the largest land distance on Earth. Thus, Eurasia's west-east axis allowed fertile crescent crops quickly to launch agriculture over the band of temperate latitudes from Ireland to the Indus Valley and to enrich the agriculture that arose independently in eastern Asia. Conversely, Eurasian crops that were first domesticated far from the Fertile Crescent but at the same latitudes were able to diffuse back to the Fertile Crescent. Today, when seeds are transported over the whole globe by ship and plane, we take it for granted that our meals are a geographic mishmash. A typical American fast-food restaurant meal would include chicken, 
first domesticated in China, and potatoes from the Andes, or corn from Mexico, seasoned with black pepper from India and washed down with a cup of coffee of Ethiopian origin. Already, though, by two thousand years ago, Romans were also nourishing themselves with their own hodgepodge of foods that mostly originated elsewhere. Of Roman crops, only oats and poppies were native to Italy. Roman staples were the Fertile Crescent Founder Package, supplemented by quince, originating in the Caucasus, millet and cumin, domesticated in Central Asia, cucumber, sesame and citrus fruit, from India, and chicken, rice, apricots, peaches, and foxtail millet, originally from China. Even though Rome's apples were at least native to Western Eurasia, they were grown by means of grafting techniques that had developed in China and spread westward from there. While Eurasia provides the world's widest band of land at the same latitude, and hence the most dramatic example of rapid spread of domesticates, there are other examples as well. Rivaling in speed the spread of the Fertile Crescent Package was the eastward spread of a subtropical package that was initially assembled in South China and that received additions on reaching tropical Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and New Guinea. Within 1,600 years, that resulting package of crops, including bananas, taro, and yams, and domestic animals, chickens, pigs, and dogs, had spread more than 5,000 miles eastward into the tropical Pacific to reach the islands of Polynesia. A further likely example is the east-west spread of crops within Africa's wide Sahel zone, but paleobotanists have yet to work out the details. Contrast the ease of east-west diffusion in Eurasia with the difficulties of diffusion along Africa's north-south axis. Most of the Fertile Crescent founder crops reached Egypt very quickly and then spread as far south as the cool highlands of Ethiopia, beyond which they didn't spread. South Africa's Mediterranean climate would have been ideal for them, but the 2,000 miles of tropical conditions between Ethiopia and South Africa posed an insuperable barrier. Instead, African agriculture south of the Sahara was launched by the domestication of wild plants, such as sorghum and African yams, indigenous to the Sahel Zone and to tropical West Africa, and adapted to the warm temperatures, summer rains, and relatively constant day lengths of those low latitudes. Similarly, the spread southward of fertile crescent domestic animals through Africa was stopped or slowed by climate and disease, especially by trypanosome diseases carried by tsetse flies. The horse never became established farther south in West Africa's kingdoms north of the equator. The advance of cattle, sheep, and goats halted for 2,000 years at the northern edge of the Serengeti Plains, while new types of human economies and livestock breeds were being developed. Not until the period A.D. 1 to 200, some 8,000 years after livestock were domesticated in the Fertile Crescent, did cattle, sheep, and goats finally reach South Africa. Tropical African crops had their own difficulties spreading south in Africa, arriving in South Africa with black African farmers, the Bantu, just after those Fertile Crescent livestock did. However, those tropical African crops could never be transmitted across South Africa's Fish River, beyond which they were stopped by Mediterranean conditions to which they were not adapted. The result was the all-too-familiar course of the last two millennia of South African history. Some of South Africa's indigenous Khoisan peoples, otherwise known as Hottentots and Bushmen, acquired livestock but remained without agriculture. They became outnumbered and were replaced, northeast of the Fish River, by black African farmers, whose southward spread halted at that river. Only when European settlers arrived by sea in 1652, bringing with them their fertile crescent crop package, could agriculture thrive in South Africa's Mediterranean zone. The collisions of all those peoples produced the tragedies of modern South Africa, the quick decimation of the Khoisan by European germs and guns, a century of wars between Europeans and blacks, another century of racial oppression, and now efforts by Europeans and blacks to seek a new mode of coexistence in the former Khoisan lands. Contrast also the ease of diffusion in Eurasia with its difficulties along the Americas' north-south axis. The distance between Mesoamerica and South America, say between Mexico's highlands and Ecuador's, is only 1,200 miles, approximately the same as the distance in Eurasia separating the Balkans from Mesopotamia. 
The Balkans provided ideal growing conditions for most Mesopotamian crops and livestock, and received those domesticates as a package within two thousand years of its assembly in the Fertile Crescent. That rapid spread preempted opportunities for domesticating those and related species in the Balkans. Highland Mexico and the Andes would similarly have been suitable for many of each other's crops and domestic animals. A few crops, notably Mexican corn, did indeed spread to the other region in the pre-Columbian era. But other crops and domestic animals failed to spread between Mesoamerica and South America. The cool highlands of Mexico would have provided ideal conditions for raising llamas, guinea pigs, and potatoes, all domesticated in the cool highlands of the South American Andes. Yet the northward spread of those Andean specialties was stopped completely by the hot, intervening lowlands of Central America. Five thousand years after llamas had been domesticated in the Andes, the Olmecs, Maya, Aztecs, and all other native societies of Mexico remained without pack animals and without any edible domestic mammals except for dogs. Conversely, domestic turkeys of Mexico and domestic sunflowers of the eastern United States might have thrived in the Andes, but their southward spread was stopped by the intervening tropical climates. The mere 700 miles of north-south distance prevented Mexican corn, squash, and beans from reaching the U.S. southwest for several thousand years after their domestication in Mexico, and Mexican chili peppers and chenopods never did reach it in prehistoric times. For thousands of years after corn was domesticated in Mexico, it failed to spread northward into eastern North America because of the cooler climates and shorter growing season prevailing there. At some time between A.D. 1 and A.D. 200, corn finally appeared in the eastern United States, but only as a very minor crop. Not until around A.D. 900, after hardy varieties of corn adapted to northern climates had been developed, could corn-based agriculture contribute to the flowering of the most complex Native American society of North America, the Mississippian culture, a brief flowering ended by European-introduced germs arriving with and after Columbus. Recall that most fertile crescent crops prove, upon genetic study, to derive from only a single domestication process, whose resulting crop spread so quickly that it preempted any other incipient domestications of the same or related species. In contrast, many apparently widespread Native American crops prove to consist of related species or even of genetically distinct varieties of the same species independently domesticated in Mesoamerica, South America, and the eastern United States. Closely related species replace each other geographically among the amaranths, beans, canopods, chili peppers, cottons, squashes, and tobaccos. Different varieties of the same species replace each other among the kidney beans, lima beans, the chili pepper capsicum manuum chinens, and the squash cucurba de pepo. Those legacies of multiple independent domestications may provide further testimony to the slow diffusion of crops along the Americas' north-south axis. Africa and the Americas are thus the two largest land masses with a predominantly north-south axis and resultingly slow diffusion. In certain other parts of the world, slow north-south diffusion was important on a smaller scale. These other examples include the snail's pace of crop exchange between Pakistan's Indus Valley and South India, the slow spread of South Chinese food production into peninsular Malaysia, and the failure of tropical Indonesian and New Guinean food production to arrive in prehistoric times in the modern farmlands of southwestern and southeastern Australia, respectively. Those two corners of Australia are now the continent's breadbaskets, but they lie more than 2,000 miles south of the equator. Farming there had to await the arrival from faraway Europe, on European ships, of crops adapted to Europe's cool climate and short growing season. I have been dwelling on latitude, readily assessed by a glance at a map, because it is a major determinant of climate, growing conditions, and ease of spread of food production. However, latitude is of course not the only such determinant, and it is not always true that adjacent places at the same latitude have the same climate, though they do necessarily have the same day length. Topographic and ecological barriers, much more pronounced on some continents than on others, were locally important obstacles to diffusion. 
For instance, crop diffusion between the U.S. Southeast and Southwest was very slow and selective, although these two regions are at the same latitude. That's because much of the intervening area of Texas and the southern Great Plains was dry and unsuitable for agriculture. A corresponding example within Eurasia involved the eastern limit of fertile crescent crops, which spread rapidly westward to the Atlantic Ocean and eastward to the Indus Valley without encountering a major barrier. However, farther eastward in India, the shift from predominantly winter rainfall to predominantly summer rainfall contributed to a much more delayed extension of agriculture, involving different crops and farming techniques, into the Ganges plain of northeastern India. Still farther east, temperate areas of China were isolated from western Eurasian areas with similar climates by the combination of the Central Asian desert, Tibetan plateau, and Himalayas. The initial development of food production in China was therefore independent of that at the same latitude in the Fertile Crescent and gave rise to entirely different crops. However, even those barriers between China and western Eurasia were at least partly overcome during the second millennium BC when West Asian wheat, barley, and horses reached China. By the same token, the potency of a 2,000-mile north-south shift as a barrier also varies with local conditions. Fertile crescent food production spread southward over that distance to Ethiopia, and Bantu food production spread quickly from Africa's Great Lakes region south to Natal, because in both cases the intervening areas had similar rainfall regimes and were suitable for agriculture. In contrast, crop diffusion from Indonesia south to southwestern Australia was completely impossible, and diffusion over the much shorter distance from Mexico to the U.S. southwest and southeast was slow, because the intervening areas were deserts hostile to agriculture. The lack of a high-elevation plateau in Mesoamerica south of Guatemala and Mesoamerica's extreme narrowness south of Mexico and especially in Panama were at least as important as the latitudinal gradient in throttling crop and livestock exchanges between the highlands of Mexico and the Andes. Continental differences in axis orientation affected the diffusion not only of food production, but also of other technologies and inventions. For example, around 3000 BC, the invention of the wheel in or near Southwest Asia spread rapidly west and east across much of Eurasia within a few centuries, whereas the wheels invented independently in prehistoric Mexico never spread south to the Andes. Similarly, the principle of alphabetic writing, developed in the western part of the Fertile Crescent by 1500 BC, spread west to Carthage and east to the Indian subcontinent within about a thousand years. But the Mesoamerican writing systems that flourished in prehistoric times for at least 2,000 years never reached the Andes. Naturally, wheels and writing aren't directly linked to latitude and day length in the way crops are. Instead, the links are indirect, especially via food production systems and their consequences. The earliest wheels were parts of ox-drawn carts used to transport agricultural produce. Early writing was restricted to elites supported by food-producing peasants, and it served purposes of economically and socially complex food-producing societies, such as royal propaganda, goods inventories, and bureaucratic record-keeping. In general, societies that engaged in intense exchanges of crops, livestock, and technologies related to food production were more likely to become involved in other exchanges as well. America's patriotic song, America the Beautiful, invokes our spacious skies, our amber waves of grain, from sea to shining sea. Actually, that song reverses geographic realities. As in Africa, in the Americas, the spread of native crops and domestic animals was slowed by constricted skies and environmental barriers. No waves of native grain ever stretched from the Atlantic to the Pacific coast of North America, from Canada to Patagonia, or from Egypt to South Africa, while amber waves of wheat and barley came to stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific across the spacious skies of Eurasia. That faster spread of Eurasian agriculture, compared with that of Native American and Sub-Saharan African agriculture, played a role, as the next part of this book will show, in the more rapid diffusion of Eurasian writing, metallurgy, technology, and empires. To bring up all those differences isn't to claim that widely distributed crops are admirable, or that they testify to the superior ingenuity of early Eurasian farmers. 
They reflect instead the orientation of Eurasia's axis compared with that of the Americas or Africa. Around those axes turned the fortunes of history. Lethal Gift of Livestock The Evolution of Germs Some of us adults, even more of our children, pick up infectious diseases from our pets. Usually they remain no more than a nuisance, but a few have evolved into something far more serious. The major killers of humanity throughout our recent history, smallpox, flu, tuberculosis, malaria, plague, measles, and cholera, are infectious diseases that evolved from diseases of animals, even though most of the microbes responsible for our own epidemic illnesses are paradoxically now almost confined to humans. Because diseases have been the biggest killers of people, they have also been decisive shapers of history. Until World War II, more victims of war died of war-borne microbes than of battle wounds. All those military histories glorifying great generals oversimplify the ego-deflating truth. The winners of past wars were not always the armies with the best generals and weapons, but were often merely those bearing the nastiest germs to transmit to their enemies. The grimmest examples of germs' role in history come from the European conquest of the Americas that began with Columbus's voyage of 1492. Numerous as were the Native American victims of the murderous Spanish conquistadors, they were far outnumbered by the victims of murderous Spanish microbes. Why was the exchange of nasty germs between the Americas and Europe so unequal? Why didn't Native American diseases instead decimate the Spanish invaders, spread back to Europe, and wipe out 95% of Europe's population? Similar questions arise for the decimation of many other native peoples by Eurasian germs, as well as for the decimation of would-be European conquistadors in the tropics of Africa and Asia. Thus, questions of the animal origins of human disease lie behind the broadest pattern of human history and behind some of the most important issues in human health today. Think of AIDS, an explosively spreading human disease that appears to have evolved from a virus resident in wild African monkeys. Why did the rise of agriculture launch the evolution of our crowd infectious diseases? One reason is that agriculture sustains much higher human population densities than does the hunting-gathering lifestyle, on the average 10 to 100 times higher. In addition, hunter-gatherers frequently shift camp and leave behind their own piles of feces with accumulated microbes and worm larvae. But farmers are sedentary and live amid their own sewage, thus providing microbes with a short path from one person's body into another's drinking water. Some farming populations make it even easier for their own fecal bacteria and worms to infect new victims by gathering their feces and urine and spreading them as fertilizer in the fields where people work. Irrigation agriculture and fish farming provide ideal living conditions for the snails carrying schistosomiasis and for flukes that burrow through our skin as we wade through feces-laden water. Sedentary farmers become surrounded not only by their feces, but also by disease-transmitting rodents attracted by the farmers' stored food. The forest clearings made by African farmers also provide ideal breeding habitats for malaria-transmitting mosquitoes. If the rise of farming was thus a bonanza for our microbes, the rise of cities was a greater one, as still more densely packed human populations festered under even worse sanitation conditions. Not until the beginning of the 20th century did Europe's urban populations finally become self-sustaining. Before then, constant immigration of healthy peasants from the countryside was necessary to make up for the constant deaths of city dwellers from crowd diseases. Another bonanza was the development of world trade routes, which by Roman times effectively joined the populations of Europe, Asia, and North Africa into one giant breeding ground for microbes. That's when smallpox finally reached Rome as the plague of Antoninus, which killed millions of Roman citizens between A.D. 165 and 180. Similarly, bubonic plague first appeared in Europe as the plague of Justinian, A.D. 542-43. But plague didn't begin to hit Europe with full force as the Black Death epidemics until A.D. 1346, when a new route for overland trade with China provided rapid transit along Eurasia's east-west axis for flea-infested furs from plague-ridden areas of Central Asia to Europe. 
Today, our jet planes have made even the longest intercontinental flights briefer than the duration of any human infectious disease. That's how an Aero Linnaeus Argentinas airplane, stopping in Lima, Peru in 1991, managed to deliver dozens of cholera-infected people that same day to my city of Los Angeles, over 3,000 miles from Lima. The explosive increase in world travel by Americans and in immigration to the United States is turning us into another melting pot, this time of microbes that we previously dismissed as just causing exotic diseases in far-off countries. Thus, when the human population became sufficiently large and concentrated, we reached the stage in our history at which we could at last evolve and sustain crowd diseases confined to our own species. But that conclusion presents a paradox. Such diseases could never have existed before then. Instead, they had to evolve as new diseases. Where did those new diseases come from? Evidence has recently been emerging from molecular studies of the disease-causing microbes themselves. For many of the microbes responsible for our unique diseases, molecular biologists can now identify the microbes' closest relatives. These also prove to be agents of crowd infectious diseases, but ones confined to various species of our domestic animals and pets. Among animals, too, epidemic diseases require large, dense populations and don't afflict just any animal. They're confined mainly to social animals providing the necessary large population. Hence, when we domesticated social animals, such as cows and pigs, they were already afflicted by epidemic diseases just waiting to be transferred to us. For example, measles virus is most closely related to the virus causing rinderpest. That nasty epidemic disease affects cattle and many wild cud-chewing mammals, but not humans. Measles, in turn, don't afflict cattle. The close similarity of the measles virus to the rinderpest virus suggests that the latter transferred from cattle to humans and then evolved into the measles virus by changing its properties to adapt to us. That transfer is not at all surprising, considering that many peasant farmers live and sleep close to cows and their feces, urine, breath, sores, and blood. Our intimacy with cattle has been going on for the 9,000 years since we domesticated them, ample time for the rinderpest virus to discover us nearby. Others of our familiar infectious diseases can similarly be traced back to diseases of our animal friends. Given our proximity to the animals we love, we must be getting constantly bombarded by their microbes. Those invaders get winnowed by natural selection, and only a few of them succeed in establishing themselves as human diseases. A quick survey of current diseases lets us trace out four stages in the evolution of a specialized human disease from an animal precursor. The first stage is illustrated by dozens of diseases that we now and then pick up directly from our pets and domestic animals. They include cat scratch fever from our cats, leptospirosis from our dogs, psittacosis from our chickens and parrots, and brucellosis from our cattle. We're similarly liable to pick up diseases from wild animals, such as the tularemia that hunters can get from skinning wild rabbits. All those microbes are still at an early stage in their evolution into specialized human pathogens. They still don't get transmitted directly from one person to another, and even their transfer to us from animals remains uncommon. In the second stage, a former animal pathogen evolves to the point where it does get transmitted directly between people and causes epidemics. However, the epidemic dies out for any of several reasons, such as being cured by modern medicine or being stopped when everybody around has already been infected and either becomes immune or dies. For example, a previously unknown fever termed Onyongyong fever appeared in East Africa in 1959 and proceeded to infect several million Africans. It probably arose from a virus of monkeys and was transmitted to humans by mosquitoes. The fact that patients recovered quickly and became immune to further attack helped the new disease die out quickly. Closer to home for Americans, Fort Bragg fever was the name applied to a new leptospiral disease that broke out in the United States in the summer of 1942 and soon disappeared. A fatal disease vanishing for another reason was New Guinea's laughing sickness, transmitted by cannibalism and caused by a slow-acting virus from which no one has ever recovered. 
Kuru was on its way to exterminating New Guinea's foray tribe of 20,000 people until the establishment of Australian government control around 1959 ended cannibalism and thereby the transmission of Kuru. The annals of medicine are full of accounts of diseases that sound like no disease known today, but that once caused terrifying epidemics and then disappeared as mysteriously as they had come. The English sweating sickness, which swept and terrified Europe between 1485 and 1552, and the Picardy sweats of 18th and 19th century France, are just two of the many epidemic illnesses that vanished long before modern medicine had devised methods for identifying the responsible microbes. A third stage in the evolution of our major diseases is represented by former animal pathogens that did establish themselves in humans, that have not, not yet, died out, and that may or may not still become major killers of humanity. The future remains very uncertain for Lassa fever, caused by a virus derived probably from rodents. Lassa fever was first observed in 1969 in Nigeria, where it causes a fatal illness so contagious that Nigerian hospitals have been closed down if even a single case appears. Better established is Lyme disease, caused by a spirochete that we get from the bite of ticks carried by mice and deer. Although the first known human cases in the United States appeared only as recently as 1962, Lyme disease is already reaching epidemic proportions in many parts of our country. The future of AIDS, derived from monkey viruses and first documented in humans around 1959, is even more secure, from the virus's perspective. The final stage of this evolution is represented by the major long-established epidemic diseases confined to humans. These diseases must have been the evolutionary survivors of far more pathogens that tried to make the jump to us from animals, and mostly failed. What is actually going on in those stages as an exclusive disease of animals transforms itself into an exclusive disease of humans? One transformation involves a change of intermediate vector. When a microbe relying on some arthropod vector for transmission switches to a new host, the microbe may be forced to find a new arthropod as well. For example, typhus was initially transmitted between rats by rat fleas, which sufficed for a while to transfer typhus from rats to humans. Eventually, typhus microbes discovered that human body lice offered a much more efficient method of traveling directly between humans. Now that Americans have mostly deloused themselves, typhus has discovered a new route into us by infecting eastern North American flying squirrels and then transferring to people whose attics harbor flying squirrels. In short, diseases represent evolution in progress, and microbes adapt by natural selection to new hosts and vectors. But compared with cows' bodies, ours offer different immune defenses, lice, feces, and chemistries. In that new environment, a microbe must evolve new ways to live and to propagate itself. In several instructive cases, doctors or veterinarians have actually been able to observe microbes evolving those new ways. The best studied case involves what happened when myxomatosis hit Australian rabbits. The myxovirus, native to a wild species of Brazilian rabbit, had been observed to cause a lethal epidemic in European domestic rabbits, which are a different species. Hence, the virus was intentionally introduced to Australia in 1950 in the hopes of ridding the continent of its plague of European rabbits, foolishly introduced in the 19th century. In the first year, Mixo produced a gratifying, to Australian farmers, 99.8% mortality rate in infected rabbits. Unfortunately for the farmers, the death rate then dropped in the second year to 90% and eventually to 25%, frustrating hopes of eradicating rabbits completely from Australia. The problem was that the Mixo virus evolved to serve its own interests, which differed from ours as well as from those of the rabbits. The virus changed so as to kill fewer rabbits and to permit lethally infected ones to live longer before dying. As a result, a less lethal myxovirus spreads baby viruses to more rabbits than did the original highly virulent myxo. For a similar example in humans, we have only to consider the surprising evolution of syphilis. Today, our two immediate associations to syphilis are genital sores and a very slowly developing disease leading to the death of many untreated victims only after many years. 
However, when syphilis was first definitely recorded in Europe in 1495, its pustules often covered the body from the head to the knees, caused flesh to fall off people's faces, and led to death within a few months. By 1546, syphilis had evolved into the disease with the symptoms so well known to us today. Apparently, just as with myxomatosis, those syphilis spirochetes that evolved so as to keep their victims alive for longer were thereby able to transmit their spirochete offspring into more victims. The importance of lethal microbes in human history is well illustrated by Europeans' conquest and depopulation of the New World. Far more Native Americans died in bed from Eurasian germs than on the battlefield from European guns and swords. Those germs undermined Indian resistance by killing most Indians and their leaders and by sapping the survivors' morale. For instance, in 1519, Cortés landed on the coast of Mexico with 600 Spaniards to conquer the fiercely militaristic Aztec Empire with a population of many millions. A Cortés reached the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, escaped with the loss of only two-thirds of his force, and managed to fight his way back to the coast, demonstrates both Spanish military advantages and the initial naivete of the Aztecs. But when Cortés's next onslaught came, the Aztecs were no longer naive and fought street by street with the utmost tenacity. What gave the Spaniards a decisive advantage was smallpox, which reached Mexico in 1520 with one infected slave arriving from Spanish Cuba. The resulting epidemic proceeded to kill nearly half of the Aztecs, including Emperor Cuitlahuac. Aztec survivors were demoralized by the mysterious illness that killed Indians and spared Spaniards, as if advertising the Spaniards' invincibility. By 1618, Mexico's initial population of about 20 million had plummeted to about 1.6 million. Pizarro had similarly grim luck when he landed on the coast of Peru in 1531 with 168 men to conquer the Inca Empire of Millions. Fortunately for Pizarro and unfortunately for the Incas, smallpox had arrived overland around 1526, killing much of the Inca population, including both the Emperor Huayna Capac and his designated successor. The result of the thrones being left vacant was that two other sons of Huayna Capac, Atahualpa and Huascar, became embroiled in a civil war that Pizarro exploited to conquer the divided Incas. When we in the United States think of the most populous New World societies existing in 1492, only those of the Aztecs and the Incas tend to come to our minds. We forget that North America also supported populous Indian societies in the most logical place, the Mississippi Valley, which contains some of our best farmland today. In that case, however, conquistadors contributed nothing directly to the society's destruction. Eurasian germs, spreading in advance, did everything. When Hernando de Soto became the first European conquistador to march through the southeastern United States in 1540, he came across Indian town sites abandoned two years earlier because the inhabitants had died in epidemics. These epidemics had been transmitted from coastal Indians infected by Spaniards visiting the coast. The Spaniards' microbes spread to the interior in advance of the Spaniards themselves. De Soto was still able to see some of the densely populated Indian towns lining the lower Mississippi. After the end of his expedition, it was a long time before Europeans again reached the Mississippi Valley. But Eurasian microbes were now established in North America and kept spreading. By the time of the next appearance of Europeans on the lower Mississippi, that of French settlers in the late 1600s, almost all of those big Indian towns had vanished. Their relics are great mound sites of the Mississippi Valley. Only recently have we come to realize that many of the mound-building societies were still largely intact when Columbus reached the New World, and that they collapsed, probably as a result of disease, between 1492 and the systematic European exploration of the Mississippi. When I was young, American schoolchildren were taught that North America had originally been occupied by only about one million Indians. That low number was useful in justifying the white conquest of what could be viewed as an almost empty continent. However, archaeological excavations and scrutiny of descriptions left by the very first European explorers on our coasts now suggest an initial number of around 20 million Indians. For the New World as a whole, the Indian population decline in the century or two following Columbus's arrival 
is estimated to have been as large as 95%. The main killers were old-world germs to which Indians had never been exposed and against which they therefore had neither immune nor genetic resistance. Smallpox, measles, influenza, and typhus competed for top rank among the killers. As if these had not been enough, diphtheria, malaria, mumps, pertussis, plague, tuberculosis, and yellow fever came up close behind. In countless cases, whites were actually there to witness the destruction occurring when the germs arrived. For example, in 1837, the Mandan Indian tribe, with one of the most elaborate cultures in our Great Plains, contracted smallpox from a steamboat traveling up the Missouri River from St. Louis. The population of one Mandan village plummeted from 2,000 to fewer than 40 within a few weeks. While over a dozen major infectious diseases of old world origins became established in the New World, perhaps not a single major killer reached Europe from the Americas. The sole possible exception is syphilis, whose area of origin remains controversial. The one-sidedness of that exchange of germs becomes even more striking when we recall that large, dense human populations are a prerequisite for the evolution of our crowd infectious diseases. If recent reappraisals of the pre-Columbian New World population are correct, it was not far below the contemporary population of Eurasia. Some New World cities like Tenochtitlan were among the world's most populous cities at the time. Why didn't Tenochtitlan have awful germs waiting for the Spaniards? One possible contributing factor is that the rise of dense human populations began somewhat later in the New World than in the Old World. Another is that the three most densely populated American centers, the Andes, Mesoamerica, and the Mississippi Valley, never became connected by regular fast trade into one huge breeding ground for microbes in the way that Europe, North Africa, India, and China became linked in Roman times. Those factors still don't explain, though, why the New World apparently ended up with no lethal crowd epidemics at all. Tuberculosis DNA has been reported from the mummy of a Peruvian Indian who died a thousand years ago, but the identification procedure used did not distinguish human tuberculosis from a closely related pathogen, Mycobacterium bovis, that is widespread in wild animals. Instead, what must be the main reason for the failure of lethal crowd epidemics to arise in the Americas becomes clear when we pause to ask a simple question. From what microbes could they conceivably have evolved? We've seen that Eurasian crowd diseases evolved out of diseases of Eurasian herd animals that became domesticated. Whereas many such animals existed in Eurasia, only five animals of any sort became domesticated in the Americas. The turkey in Mexico and the U.S. Southwest, the llama alpaca and the guinea pig in the Andes, the Muscovy duck in tropical South America, and the dog throughout the Americas. In turn, we also saw that this extreme paucity of domestic animals in the New World reflects the paucity of wild starting material. About 80% of the big wild mammals of the Americas became extinct at the end of the last ice age, around 13,000 years ago. The few domesticates that remained to Native Americans were not likely sources of crowd diseases compared with cows and pigs. Muscovy ducks and turkeys don't live in enormous flocks, and they're not cuddly species, like young lambs, with which we have much physical contact. Guinea pigs may have contributed a trypanosome infection, like Chagas's disease or Leishmaniasis, to our catalogue of woes, but that's uncertain. Initially, most surprising is the absence of any human disease derived from llamas or alpacas, which it's tempting to consider the Andean equivalent of Eurasian livestock. However, llamas had four strikes against them as a sort of human pathogens. They were kept in smaller herds than were sheep and goats and pigs. Their total numbers were never remotely as large as those of the Eurasian populations of domestic livestock, since llamas never spread beyond the Andes. People don't drink and get infected by llama milk, and llamas aren't kept indoors in close association with people. In contrast, human mothers in the New Guinea highlands often nurse piglets, and pigs as well as cows are frequently kept inside the huts of peasant farmers. The historical importance of animal-derived diseases extends far beyond the collision of the old and the new worlds. Eurasian germs played a key role in decimating native peoples in many other parts of the world, including Pacific Islanders, Aboriginal Australians, and the Khoisan peoples, 
Hottentots and Bushmen of Southern Africa. Cumulative mortalities of these previously unexposed peoples from Eurasian germs ranged from 50% to 100%. For instance, the Indian population of Hispaniola declined from around 8 million when Columbus arrived in A.D. 1492 to zero by 1535. Measles reached Fiji with a Fijian chief returning from a visit to Australia in 1875 and proceeded to kill about one quarter of all Fijians then alive. After most Fijians had already been killed by epidemics beginning with the first European visit in 1791. Syphilis, gonorrhea, tuberculosis, and influenza, arriving with Captain Cook in 1779, followed by a big typhoid epidemic in 1804 and numerous minor epidemics, reduced Hawaii's population from around half a million in 1779 to 84,000 in 1853, the year when smallpox finally reached Hawaii and killed around 10,000 of the survivors. These examples could be multiplied almost indefinitely. However, germs did not act solely to Europeans' advantage. While the New World and Australia did not harbor native epidemic diseases awaiting Europeans, tropical Asia, Africa, Indonesia, and New Guinea certainly did. Malaria throughout the tropical Old World, cholera in tropical Southeast Asia, and yellow fever in tropical Africa were, and still are, the most notorious of the tropical killers. They posed the most serious obstacle to European colonization of the tropics, and they explain why the European colonial partitioning of New Guinea and most of Africa was not accomplished until nearly 400 years after the European partitioning of the New World began. Furthermore, once malaria and yellow fever did become transmitted to the Americas by European ship traffic, they emerged as the major impediment to the colonization of the New World tropics as well. A familiar example is the role of these two diseases in aborting the French effort and nearly aborting the ultimately successful American effort to construct the Panama Canal. Bearing all these facts in mind, let's try to regain our sense of perspective about the role of germs in answering Yali's question. There is no doubt that Europeans developed a big advantage in weaponry, technology, and political organization over most of the non-European peoples that they conquered— but that advantage alone doesn't fully explain how initially so few European immigrants came to supplant so much of the native population of the Americas and some other parts of the world. That might not have happened without Europe's sinister gift to other continents, the germs evolving from Eurasians' long intimacy with domestic animals. Blueprints and Borrowed Letters The Evolution of Writing Nineteenth-century authors tended to interpret history as a progression from savagery to civilization. Key hallmarks of this transition included the development of agriculture, metallurgy, complex technology, centralized government, and writing. Of these, writing was traditionally the one most restricted geographically. Until the expansions of Islam and of colonial Europeans, it was absent from Australia, Pacific Islands, sub-equatorial Africa, and the whole New World except for a small part of Mesoamerica. As a result of that confined distribution, peoples who pride themselves on being civilized have always viewed writing as the sharpest distinction raising them above barbarians or savages. Knowledge brings power. Hence, writing brings power to modern societies by making it possible to transmit knowledge with far greater accuracy and in far greater quantity and detail from more distant lands and more remote times. Of course, some peoples, notably the Incas, manage to administer empires without writing, and civilized peoples don't always defeat barbarians, as Roman armies facing the Huns learned. But the European conquests of the Americas, Siberia, and Australia illustrate the typical recent outcome. Writing marched together with weapons, microbes, and centralized political organization as a modern agent of conquest. The commands of the monarchs and merchants who organized colonizing fleets were conveyed in writing. The fleets set their courses by maps and written sailing directions prepared by previous expeditions. Written accounts of earlier expeditions motivated later ones by describing the wealth and fertile lands awaiting the conquerors. The accounts taught subsequent explorers what conditions to expect and helped them prepare themselves. 
The resulting empires were administered with the aid of writing. While all those types of information were also transmitted by other means in pre-literate societies, writing made the transmission easier, more detailed, more accurate, and more persuasive. Why then did only some peoples and not others develop writing, given its overwhelming value? For example, why did no traditional hunters-gatherers evolve or adopt writing? Among island empires, why did writing arise in Minoan Crete, but not in Polynesian Tonga? How many separate times did writing evolve in human history, under what circumstances, and for what uses? Of those peoples who did develop it, why did some do so much earlier than others? For instance, today almost all Japanese and Scandinavians are literate, but most Iraqis are not. Why did writing nevertheless arise nearly 4,000 years earlier in Iraq? The diffusion of writing from its sites of origin also raises important questions. Why, for instance, did it spread to Ethiopia and Arabia from the Fertile Crescent, but not to the Andes from Mexico? Did writing systems spread by being copied, or did existing systems merely inspire neighboring peoples to invent their own systems? Given a writing system that works well for one language, how do you devise a system for a different language? Similar questions arise whenever one tries to understand the origins and spread of many other aspects of human culture, such as technology, religion, and food production. The historian interested in such questions about writing has the advantage that they can often be answered in unique detail by means of the written record itself. We shall therefore trace writing's development not only because of its inherent importance, but also for the general insights into cultural history that it provides. With the possible exceptions of the Egyptian, Chinese, and Easter Island writing to be considered later, all other writing systems, devised anywhere in the world at any time, appear to have been descendants of systems modified from, or at least inspired by, Sumerian or early Mesoamerican writing. One reason why there were so few independent origins of writing is the great difficulty of inventing it. The other reason is that other opportunities for the independent invention of writing were preempted by Sumerian or early Mesoamerican writing and their derivatives. We know that the development of Sumerian writing took at least hundreds, possibly thousands of years. As we shall see, the prerequisites for those developments consisted of several features of human society that determined whether a society would find writing useful and whether the society could support the necessary specialist scribes. Many other human societies besides those of the Sumerians and early Mexicans, such as those of ancient India, Crete, and Ethiopia, evolved these prerequisites. However, the Sumerians and early Mexicans happened to have been the first to evolve them in the Old World and the New World, respectively. Once the Sumerians and early Mexicans had invented writing, the details or principles of their writing spread rapidly to other societies before they could go through the necessary centuries or millennia of independent experimentation with writing themselves. Thus, that potential for other independent experiments was preempted or aborted. The spread of writing has occurred by either of two contrasting methods, which find parallels throughout the history of technology and ideas. Someone invents something and puts it to use. How do you, another would-be user, then design something similar for your own use, knowing that other people have already got their own model built and working? Such transmission of inventions assumes a whole spectrum of forms. At the one end lies blueprint copying, when you copy or modify an available detailed blueprint. At the opposite end lies idea diffusion, when you receive little more than the basic idea and have to reinvent the details. Knowing that it can be done stimulates you to try to do it yourself, but your eventual specific solution may or may not resemble that of the first inventor. To take a recent example, historians are still debating whether blueprint copying or idea diffusion contributed more to Russia's building of an atomic bomb. Did Russia's bomb-building efforts depend critically on blueprints of the already constructed American bomb stolen and transmitted to Russia by spies? Or was it merely that the revelation of America's A-bomb at Hiroshima at last convinced Stalin of the feasibility of building such a bomb, and that Russian scientists then reinvented the principles in an independent crash program with little detailed guidance from earlier American effort? Similar questions arise for the history of the development of wheels, pyramids, and gunpowder. Let us now return to the main question with which we began this chapter. 
Why did writing arise in and spread to some societies, but not to many others? Convenient starting points for our discussion are the limited capabilities, uses, and users of early writing systems. Early scripts were incomplete, ambiguous, or complex, or all three. For example, the oldest Sumerian cuneiform writing could not render normal prose, but was a mere telegraphic shorthand, whose vocabulary was restricted to names, numerals, units of measure, words for objects counted, and a few adjectives. That's as if a modern American court clerk were forced to write John 27 Fat Sheep because English writing lacked the necessary words and grammar to write, we order John to deliver the 27 fat sheep that he owes to the government. Later Sumerian cuneiform did become capable of rendering prose, but it did so by a messy system with mixtures of logograms, phonetic signs, and unpronounced determinatives totaling hundreds of separate signs. Linear B, the writing of Mycenaean Greece, was at least simpler, being based on a syllabary of about 90 signs plus logograms. Offsetting that virtue, Linear B was quite ambiguous. It omitted any consonant at the end of a word, and it used the same sign for several related consonants. For instance, one sign for both L and R, another for P and B and PH, and still another for G and K and KH. We know how confusing we find it when native-born Japanese people speak English without distinguishing L and R. Imagine the confusion if our alphabet did the same while similarly homogenizing the other consonants that I mentioned. It's as if we were to spell the words rap, lap, lab, and laugh identically. A related limitation is that few people ever learned to write these early scripts. Knowledge of writing was confined to professional scribes in the employ of the king or temple. For instance, there was no hint that Linear B was used or understood by any Mycenaean Greek beyond small cadres of palace bureaucrats. Since individual Linear B scribes can be distinguished by their handwriting on preserved documents, we can say that all preserved Linear B documents from the palaces of Knossos and Pylos are the work of a mere 75 and 40 scribes, respectively. The uses of these telegraphic, clumsy, ambiguous early scripts were as restricted as the number of their users. Anyone hoping to discover how Sumerians of 3000 BC thought and felt is in for a disappointment. Instead, the first Sumerian texts are emotionless accounts of palace and temple bureaucrats. About 90% of the tablets in the earliest known Sumerian archives, from the city of Uruk, are clerical records of goods paid in, workers given rations, and agricultural products distributed. Only later, as Sumerians progressed beyond logograms to phonetic writing, did they begin to write prose narratives, such as propaganda and myths. Mycenaean Greeks never even reached that propaganda and myths stage. One-third of all Linear B tablets from the Palace of Knossos are accountants' records of sheep and wool, while an inordinate proportion of writing at the Palace of Pylos consists of records of flax. Linear B was inherently so ambiguous that it remained restricted to palace accounts, whose context and limited word choices made the interpretation clear. Not a trace of its use for literature has survived. The Iliad and Odyssey were composed and transmitted by non-literate bards for non-literate listeners, and not committed to writing until the development of the Greek alphabet hundreds of years later. Similarly restricted uses characterize early Egyptian, Mesoamerican, and Chinese writing. Early Egyptian hieroglyphs recorded religious and state propaganda and bureaucratic accounts. Preserved Maya writing was similarly devoted to propaganda, births and accessions and victories of kings, and astronomical observations of priests. The oldest preserved Chinese writing of the late Shang dynasty consists of religious divination about dynastic affairs, incised into so-called oracle bones. A sample Shang text, The king, reading the meaning of the crack, in a bone cracked by heating, said, If the child is born on a king day, it will be extremely auspicious. To us today, it is tempting to ask why societies with early writing systems accepted the ambiguities that restricted writing to a few functions and a few scribes. But even to pose that question is to illustrate the gap between ancient perspectives and our own expectations of mass literacy. 
the intended restricted uses of early writing provided a positive disincentive for devising less ambiguous writing systems. The kings and priests of ancient Sumer wanted writing to be used by professional scribes to record numbers of sheep owed in taxes, not by the masses to write poetry and hatch plots. As the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss put it, ancient writing's main function was to facilitate the enslavement of other human beings. Personal uses of writing by non-professionals came only much later, as writing systems grew simpler and more expressive. For instance, with the fall of Mycenaean Greek civilization around 1200 BC, Linear B disappeared, and Greece returned to an age of pre-literacy. When writing finally returned to Greece in the 8th century BC, the new Greek writing, its users and its uses were very different. The writing was no longer an ambiguous syllabary mixed with logograms, but an alphabet borrowed from the Phoenician consonantal alphabet and improved by the Greek invention of vowels. In place of lists of sheep, legible only to scribes and read only in palaces, Greek alphabetic writing from the moment of its appearance was a vehicle of poetry and humor to be read in private homes. For instance, the first preserved example of Greek alphabetic writing, scratched onto an Athenian wine jug of about 740 B.C., is a line of poetry announcing a dancing contest. Whoever of all dancers performs most nimbly will win this vase as a prize. The next example is three lines of dactylic hexameter scratched onto a drinking cup. I am Nestor's delicious drinking cup. Whoever drinks from this cup swiftly will the desire of fair-crowned Aphrodite seize him. The earliest preserved examples of the Etruscan and Roman alphabets are also inscriptions on drinking cups and wine containers. Only later did the alphabet's easily learned vehicle of private communication become co-opted for public or bureaucratic purposes. Thus, the developmental sequence of uses for alphabetic writing was the reverse of that for the earlier systems of logograms and syllabaries. The limited uses and users of early writing suggest why writing appeared so late in human evolution. All of the likely or possible independent inventions of writing in Sumer, Mexico, China, and Egypt, and all of the early adaptations of those invented systems, for example, those in Crete, Iran, Turkey, the Indus Valley, and the Maya area, involved socially stratified societies with complex and centralized political institutions, whose necessary relation to food production we shall explore in a later chapter. Early writing served the needs of those political institutions, such as record-keeping and royal propaganda, and the users were full-time bureaucrats nourished by stored food surpluses grown by food-producing peasants. Writing was never developed or even adopted by hunter-gatherer societies because they lacked both the institutional uses of early writing and the social and agricultural mechanisms for generating the food surpluses required to feed scribes. Thus, food production and thousands of years of societal evolution following its adoption were as essential for the evolution of writing as for the evolution of microbes causing human epidemic diseases. Writing arose independently only in the Fertile Crescent, Mexico, and probably China, precisely because those were the first areas where food production emerged in their respective hemispheres. Once writing had been invented by those few societies, it then spread, by trade and conquest and religion, to other societies with similar economies and political organizations. While food production was thus a necessary condition for the evolution or early adoption of writing, it was not a sufficient condition. At the beginning of this chapter, I mentioned the failure of some food-producing societies with complex political organization to develop or adopt writing before modern times. Those cases, initially so puzzling to us moderns accustomed to viewing writing as indispensable to a complex society, included one of the world's largest empires as of A.D. 1520, the Inca Empire of South America. They also included Tonga's maritime proto-empire, the Hawaiian state emerging in the late 18th century, all of the states and chiefdoms of sub-equatorial Africa and sub-Saharan West Africa before the arrival of Islam, and the largest native North American societies, those of the Mississippi Valley and its tributaries. Why did all those societies fail to acquire writing despite their sharing prerequisites with societies that did do so? 
Here we have to remind ourselves that the vast majority of societies with writing acquired it by borrowing it from neighbors or by being inspired by them to develop it, rather than by independently inventing it themselves. The societies without writing that I just mentioned are ones that got a later start on food production than did Sumer, Mexico, and China. The only uncertainty in this statement concerns the relative dates for the onset of food production in Mexico and in the Andes, the eventual Inca realm. Given enough time, the societies lacking writing might also have eventually developed it on their own. Had they been located nearer to Sumer, Mexico, and China, they might instead have acquired writing or the idea of writing from those centers, just as did India, the Maya, and most other societies with writing. But they were too far from the first centers of writing to have acquired it before modern times. The importance of isolation is most obvious for Hawaii and Tonga, both of which were separated by at least 4,000 miles of ocean from the nearest societies with writing. The other societies illustrate the important point that distance as the crow flies is not an appropriate measure of isolation for humans. The Andes, West Africa's kingdoms, and the mouth of the Mississippi River lay only about 1,200, 1,500, and 700 miles, respectively, from societies with writing in Mexico, North Africa, and Mexico, respectively. These distances are considerably less than the distances the alphabet had to travel from its homeland on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean to reach Ireland, Ethiopia, and Southeast Asia within 2,000 years of its invention. But humans are slowed by ecological and water barriers that crows can fly over. The states of North Africa, with writing, and West Africa, without writing, were separated from each other by Saharan desert, unsuitable for agriculture and cities. The deserts of northern Mexico similarly separated the urban centers of southern Mexico from the chiefdoms of the Mississippi Valley. Communication between southern Mexico and the Andes required either a sea voyage or else a long chain of overland contacts via the narrow, forested, never-urbanized Isthmus of Darien. Hence, the Andes, West Africa, and the Mississippi Valley were effectively rather isolated from societies with writing. That's not to say that those societies without writing were totally isolated. West Africa eventually did receive Fertile Crescent domestic animals across the Sahara, and later accepted Islamic influence, including Arabic writing. Corn diffused from Mexico to the Andes and, more slowly, from Mexico to the Mississippi Valley. But we already saw that the north-south axes and ecological barriers within Africa and the Americas retarded the diffusion of crops and domestic animals. The history of writing illustrates strikingly the similar ways in which geography and ecology influenced the spread of human inventions. Necessity's Mother – The Evolution of Technology Technology, in the form of weapons and transport, provides the direct means by which certain peoples have expanded their realms and conquered other peoples. That makes it the leading cause of history's broadest pattern. But why were Eurasians, rather than Native Americans or Sub-Saharan Africans, the ones to invent firearms, ocean-going ships, and steel equipment? The differences extend to most other significant technological advances, from printing presses to glass and steam engines. Why were all those inventions Eurasian? Why were all New Guineans and Native Australians in A.D. 1800 still using stone tools like ones discarded thousands of years ago in Eurasia and most of Africa, even though some of the world's richest copper and iron deposits are in New Guinea and Australia, respectively. All those facts explain why so many lay people assume that Eurasians are superior to other peoples in inventiveness and intelligence. If, on the other hand, no such difference in human neurobiology exists to account for continental differences in technological development, what does account for them? An alternative view rests on the heroic theory of invention. Technological advances seem to come disproportionately from a few very rare geniuses, such as Johannes Gutenberg, James Watt, Thomas Edison, and the Wright brothers. They were Europeans or descendants of European emigrants to America. So were Archimedes and other rare geniuses of ancient times. Could such geniuses have equally well been born in Tasmania or Namibia? Does the history of technology depend on nothing more than accidents of the birthplaces of a few inventors? 
Still another alternative view holds that it is a matter not of individual inventiveness, but of the receptivity of whole societies to innovation. Some societies seem hopelessly conservative, inward-looking, and hostile to change. That's the impression of many Westerners who have attempted to help third-world peoples and ended up discouraged. The people seem perfectly intelligent as individuals. The problem seems instead to lie with their societies. How else can one explain why the Aborigines of northeastern Australia failed to adopt bows and arrows, which they saw being used by Torres Straits Islanders with whom they traded? Might all the societies of an entire continent be unreceptive, thereby explaining technology's slow pace of development there? In this chapter, we shall finally come to grips with a central problem of this book, the question of why technology did evolve at such different rates on different continents. Where do innovations actually come from? For all societies except the few past ones that were completely isolated, much or most new technology is not invented locally but is instead borrowed from other societies. The relative importance of local invention and of borrowing depends mainly on two factors, the ease of invention of the particular technology and the proximity of the particular society to other societies. Some inventions arose straightforwardly from a handling of natural raw materials. Such inventions developed on many independent occasions in world history at different places and times. One example, which we have already considered at length, is plant domestication, with at least nine independent origins. Another is pottery, which may have arisen from observations of the behavior of clay, a very widespread natural material, when dried or heated. Pottery appeared in Japan around 14,000 years ago, in the Fertile Crescent in China by around 10,000 years ago, and in Amazonia, Africa's Sahel Zone, the U.S. Southeast, and Mexico thereafter. An example of a much more difficult invention is writing, which does not suggest itself by observation of any natural material. As we have seen, it had only a few independent origins, and the alphabet arose apparently only once in world history. Other difficult inventions include the water wheel, rotary quern, tooth gearing, magnetic compass, windmill, and camera obscura, all of which were invented only once or twice in the old world and never in the new world. Such complex inventions were usually acquired by borrowing, because they spread more rapidly than they could be independently invented locally. A clear example is the wheel, which is first attested around 3400 BC near the Black Sea, and then turns up within the next few centuries over much of Europe and Asia. All those early Old World wheels are of a peculiar design. A solid wooden circle constructed of three planks fastened together, rather than a rim with spokes. In contrast, the sole wheels of Native American societies, depicted on Mexican ceramic vessels, consisted of a single piece, suggesting a second independent invention of the wheel, as one would expect from other evidence for the isolation of New World from Old World civilizations. No one thinks that that same peculiar Old World wheel design appeared repeatedly by chance at many separate sites of the Old World within a few centuries of each other, after seven million years of wheelless human history. Instead, the utility of the wheel surely caused it to diffuse rapidly east and west over the Old World from its sole site of invention. Other examples of complex technologies that diffused east and west in the ancient Old World from a single West Asian source include door locks, pulleys, rotary querns, windmills, and the alphabet. A New World example of technological diffusion is metallurgy, which spread from the Andes via Panama to Mesoamerica. When a widely useful invention does crop up in one society, it then tends to spread in either of two ways. One way is that other societies see or learn of the invention, are receptive to it, and adopt it. The second is that societies lacking the invention find themselves at a disadvantage vis-à-vis -vis the inventing society, and they become overwhelmed and replaced if the disadvantage is sufficiently great. A simple example is the spread of muskets among New Zealand's Maori tribes. One tribe, the Ngapui, adopted muskets from European traders around 1818. Over the course of the next 15 years, New Zealand was convulsed by the so-called musket wars, 
as musketless tribes either acquired muskets or were subjugated by tribes already armed with them. The outcome was that musket technology had spread throughout the whole of New Zealand by 1833. All surviving Maori tribes now had muskets. When societies do adopt a new technology from the society that invented it, the diffusion may occur in many different contexts. They include peaceful trade, as in the spread of transistors from the United States to Japan in 1954, espionage, the smuggling of silkworms from Southeast Asia to the Mideast in A.D. 552, emigration, the spread of French glass and clothing manufacturing techniques over Europe by the 200,000 Huguenots expelled from France in 1685, and war. A crucial case of the last was the transfer of Chinese papermaking techniques to Islam, made possible when an Arab army defeated a Chinese army at the Battle of Talas River in Central Asia in A.D. 751, found some papermakers among the prisoners of war, and brought them to Samarkand to set up paper manufacture. We saw that cultural diffusion can involve either detailed blueprints or just vague ideas, stimulating a reinvention of details. While the preceding chapter illustrated those alternatives for the spread of writing, they also apply to the diffusion of technology. The preceding paragraph gave examples of blueprint copying, whereas the transfer of Chinese porcelain technology to Europe provides an instance of long, drawn-out idea diffusion. Porcelain, a fine-grained, translucent pottery, was invented in China around the 7th century A.D., when it began to reach Europe by the Silk Road in the 14th century, with no information about how it was manufactured, it was much admired, and many unsuccessful attempts were made to imitate it. Not until 1707 did the German alchemist Johann Böttger, after lengthy experiments with processes and with mixing various minerals and clays together, hit upon the solution and establish the now famous Meissen porcelain works. More or less independent later experiments in France and England led to Sèvres, Wedgwood, and Spode porcelains. Thus, European potters had to reinvent Chinese manufacturing methods for themselves, but they were stimulated to do so by having models of the desired product before them. Depending on their geographic location, societies differ in how readily they can receive technology by diffusion from other societies. The most isolated people on earth in recent history were the aboriginal Tasmanians, living without ocean-going watercraft on an island a hundred miles from Australia, itself the most isolated continent. The Tasmanians had no contact with other societies for 10,000 years and acquired no new technology other than what they invented themselves. Australians and New Guineans, separated from the Asian mainland by the Indonesian island chain, received only a trickle of inventions from Asia. The societies most accessible to receiving inventions by diffusion were those embedded in major continents. In these societies, technology developed most rapidly because they accumulated not only their own inventions but also those of other societies. For example, medieval Islam, centrally located in Eurasia, acquired inventions from India and China and inherited ancient Greek learning. The importance of diffusion and of geographic location in making it possible is strikingly illustrated by some otherwise incomprehensible cases of societies that abandoned powerful technologies. We tend to assume that useful technologies, once acquired, inevitably persist until superseded by better ones. In reality, technologies must be not only acquired but also maintained, and that too depends on many unpredictable factors. Any society goes through social movements or fads in which economically useless things become valued or useful things devalued temporarily. Nowadays, when almost all societies on earth are connected to each other, we cannot imagine a fads going so far that an important technology would actually be discarded. A society that temporarily turned against a powerful technology would continue to see it being used by neighboring societies and would have the opportunity to reacquire it by diffusion, or would be conquered by neighbors if it failed to do so. But such fads can persist in isolated societies. A famous example involves Japan's abandonment of guns. Firearms reached Japan in A.D. 1543, when two Portuguese adventurers armed with harquebuses, primitive guns, arrived on a Chinese cargo ship. 
The Japanese were so impressed by the new weapon that they commenced indigenous gun production, greatly improved gun technology, and by AD 1600 owned more and better guns than any other country in the world. But there were also factors working against the acceptance of firearms in Japan. The country had a numerous warrior class, the samurai, for whom swords rated as class symbols and works of art, and as means for subjugating the lower classes. Japanese warfare had previously involved single combats between samurai swordsmen, who stood in the open, made ritual speeches, and then took pride in fighting gracefully. Such behavior became lethal in the presence of peasant soldiers ungracefully blasting away with guns. In addition, guns were a foreign invention and grew to be despised, as did other things foreign in Japan after 1600. The samurai-controlled government began by restricting gun production to a few cities, then introduced a requirement of a government license for producing a gun, then issued licenses only for guns produced for the government, and finally reduced government orders for guns until Japan was almost without functional guns again. Contemporary European rulers also included some who despised guns and tried to restrict their availability. But such measures never got far in Europe, where any country that temporarily swore off firearms would be promptly overrun by gun-toting neighboring countries. Only because Japan was a populous, isolated island could it get away with its rejection of the powerful new military technology. Its safety and isolation came to an end in 1853, when the visit of Commander Perry's U.S. fleet bristling with cannons convinced Japan of its need to resume gun manufacture. That rejection, and China's abandonment of ocean-going ships, as well as of mechanical clocks and water-driven spinning machines, are well-known historical instances of technological reversals in isolated or semi-isolated societies. Other such reversals occurred in prehistoric times. The extreme case is that of Aboriginal Tasmanians, who abandoned even bone tools and fishing to become the society with the simplest technology in the modern world. Aboriginal Australians may have adopted and then abandoned bows and arrows. Taurus Islanders abandoned canoes, while Gawa Islanders abandoned and then readopted them. Pottery was abandoned throughout Polynesia. Most Polynesians and many Melanesians abandoned the use of bows and arrows in war. Polar Eskimos lost the bow and arrow and the kayak, while Dorset Eskimos lost the bow and arrow, bow drill, and dogs. These examples, at first so bizarre to us, illustrate well the roles of geography and of diffusion in the history of technology. Without diffusion, fewer technologies are acquired and more existing technologies are lost. Human technology developed from the first stone tools in use by two and a half million years ago to the 1996 laser printer that replaced my already outdated 1992 laser printer and that was used to print this book's manuscript. The rate of development was undetectably slow at the beginning, when hundreds of thousands of years passed with no discernible change in our stone tools and with no surviving evidence for artifacts made of other materials. Today, technology advances so rapidly that it is reported in the daily newspaper. In this long history of accelerating development, one can single out two especially significant jumps. The first, occurring between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago, probably was made possible by genetic changes in our bodies. Namely, by evolution of the modern anatomy permitting modern speech or modern brain function, or both. That jump led to bone tools, single-purpose stone tools, and compound tools. The second jump resulted from our adoption of a sedentary lifestyle, which happened at different times in different parts of the world, as early as 13,000 years ago in some areas and not even today in others. For the most part, that adoption was linked to our adoption of food production, which required us to remain close to our crops, orchards, and stored food surpluses. Sedentary living was decisive for the history of technology because it enabled people to accumulate non-portable possessions. Nomadic hunter-gatherers are limited to technology that can be carried. If you move often and lack vehicles or draft animals, you confine your possessions to babies, weapons, and a bare minimum of other absolute necessities small enough to carry. You can't be burdened with pottery and printing presses as you shift camp. 
That practical difficulty probably explains the tantalizingly early appearance of some technologies, followed by a long delay in their further development. For example, the earliest attested precursors of ceramics are fired clay figurines made in the area of modern Czechoslovakia 27,000 years ago, long before the oldest known fired clay vessels from Japan 14,000 years ago. The same area of Czechoslovakia at the same time has yielded the earliest evidence for weaving, otherwise not attested until the oldest known basket appears around 13,000 years ago and the oldest known woven cloth around 9,000 years ago. Despite these very early first steps, neither pottery nor weaving took off until people became sedentary and thereby escaped the problem of transporting pots and looms. Besides permitting sedentary living and hence the accumulation of possessions, food production was decisive in the history of technology for another reason. It became possible for the first time in human evolution to develop economically specialized societies consisting of non-food-producing specialists fed by food-producing peasants. But we already saw that food production arose at different times in different continents. In addition, as we've seen in this chapter, local technology depends, for both its origin and its maintenance, not only on local invention but also on the diffusion of technology from elsewhere. That consideration tended to cause technology to develop most rapidly on continents with few geographic and ecological barriers to diffusion, either within that continent or on other continents. Finally, each society on a continent represents one more opportunity to invent and adopt a technology, because societies vary greatly in their innovativeness for many separate reasons. Hence, all other things being equal, technology develops fastest in large productive regions with large human populations, many potential inventors, and many competing societies. Let us now summarize how variations in these three factors time of onset of food production, barriers to diffusion and human population size, led straightforwardly to the observed intercontinental differences in the development of technology. Eurasia, effectively including North Africa, is the world's largest landmass, encompassing the largest number of competing societies. It was also the landmass with the two centers where food production began the earliest, the Fertile Crescent and China. Its east-west major axis permitted many inventions adopted in one part of Eurasia to spread relatively rapidly to societies at similar latitudes and climates elsewhere in Eurasia. Its breadth along its minor axis, north-south, contrasts with the Americas' narrowness at the Isthmus of Panama. It lacks the severe ecological barriers transecting the major axes of the Americas and Africa. Thus, geographic and ecological barriers to diffusion of technology were less severe in Eurasia than in other continents. Thanks to all these factors, Eurasia was the continent on which technology started its post-Pleistocene acceleration earliest and resulted in the greatest local accumulation of technologies. North and South America are conveniently regarded as separate continents, but they have been connected for several million years, pose similar historical problems, and may be considered together for comparison with Eurasia. The Americas form the world's second-largest land mass, significantly smaller than Eurasia. However, they are fragmented by geography and by ecology. The Isthmus of Panama, only 40 miles wide, virtually transects the Americas geographically, as do the Isthmus's Darien rainforests and the northern Mexican desert ecologically. The latter desert separated advanced human societies of Mesoamerica from those of North America, while the Isthmus separated advanced societies of Mesoamerica from those of the Andes and Amazonia. In addition, the main axis of the Americas is north-south, forcing most diffusion to go against a gradient of latitude and climate rather than to operate within the same latitude. For example, wheels were invented in Mesoamerica and llamas were domesticated in the central Andes by 3000 BC. But 5000 years later, the Americas' sole beast of burden and sole wheels had still not encountered each other, even though the distance separating Mesoamerica's Maya societies from the northern border of the Inca Empire, 1200 miles, was far less than the 8000 miles separating wheel and horse sharing France and China. Those factors seem to me to account for the Americas' technological lag behind Eurasia. 
Sub-Saharan Africa is the world's third largest land mass, considerably smaller than the Americas. Throughout most of human history, it was far more accessible to Eurasia than were the Americas, but the Saharan Desert is still a major ecological barrier separating Sub-Saharan Africa from Eurasia plus North Africa. Africa's north-south axis posed a further obstacle to the diffusion of technology, both between Eurasia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and within the Sub-Saharan region itself. As an illustration of the latter obstacle, pottery and iron metallurgy arose in or reached Sub-Saharan Africa's Sahel Zone, north of the equator, at least as early as they reached Western Europe. However, pottery did not reach the southern tip of Africa until around A.D. 1, and metallurgy had not yet diffused overland to the southern tip by the time that it arrived there from Europe on ships. Finally, Australia is the smallest continent. The very low rainfall and productivity of most of Australia makes it effectively even smaller as regards its capacity to support human populations. It is also the most isolated continent. In addition, food production never arose indigenously in Australia. Those factors combined to leave Australia the sole continent still without metal artifacts in modern times. The continent's populations 10,000 years ago, just before the rise of food production, are not known but surely stood in the same sequence, since many of the areas producing the most food today would also have been productive areas for hunter-gatherers 10,000 years ago. The differences in population are glaring. Eurasia's, including North Africa's, is nearly six times that of the Americas, nearly eight times that of Africa's, and 230 times that of Australia's. Larger populations mean more inventors and more competing societies. All these effects that continental differences in area, population, ease of diffusion, and onset of food production exerted on the rise of technology became exaggerated because technology catalyzes itself. Eurasia's considerable initial advantage thereby was translated into a huge lead as of A.D. 1492, for reasons of Eurasia's distinctive geography rather than of distinctive human intellect. The New Guineans whom I know include potential Edisons, but they directed their ingenuity toward the technological problems appropriate to their situations. The problems of surviving without any imported items in the New Guinea jungle, rather than the problem of inventing phonographs. From Egalitarianism to Kleptocracy The Evolution of Government and Religion Cultural anthropologists attempting to describe the diversity of human societies often divide them into as many as half a dozen categories. Any such attempt to define stages of any evolutionary or developmental continuum, whether of musical styles, human life stages, or human societies, is doubly doomed to imperfection. First, because each stage grows out of some previous stage, the lines of demarcation are inevitably arbitrary. For example, is a 19-year-old person an adolescent or a young adult? Second, developmental sequences are not invariant, so examples pigeonholed under the same stage are inevitably heterogeneous. Brahms and Liszt would turn in their graves to know that they are now grouped together as composers of the Romantic period. Nevertheless, arbitrarily delineated stages provide a useful shorthand for discussing the diversity of music and of human societies, provided one bears in mind the above caveats. In that spirit, we shall use a simple classification based on just four categories, band, tribe, chieftain, and state, to understand societies. Bands are the tiniest societies, consisting typically of five to eighty people, most or all of them close relatives by birth or by marriage. In effect, a band is an extended family, or several related extended families. Today, bands, still living autonomously, are almost confined to the most remote parts of New Guinea and Amazonia, but within modern times there were many others that have only recently fallen under state control or been assimilated or exterminated. They include many or most African pygmies, southern African San hunter-gatherers, so-called bushmen, aboriginal Australians, Eskimos, Inuit, and Indians of some resource-poor areas of the Americas, such as Tierra del Fuego and the northern boreal forests. 
All those modern bands are or were nomadic hunter-gatherers rather than settled food producers. Probably all humans lived in bands until at least 40,000 years ago, and most still did as recently as 11,000 years ago. Bands lack many institutions that we take for granted in our own society. They have no permanent single base of residence. The band's land is used jointly by the whole group instead of being partitioned among subgroups or individuals. There is no regular economic specialization except by age and sex. All able-bodied individuals forage for food. There are no formal institutions, such as laws, police, and treaties, to resolve conflicts within and between bands. Band organization is often described as egalitarian. There is no formalized social stratification into upper and lower classes, no formalized or hereditary leadership, and no formalized monopolies of information and decision-making. However, the term egalitarian should not be taken to mean that all band members are equal in prestige and contribute equally to decisions. Rather, the term merely means that any band leadership is informal and acquired through qualities such as personality, strength, intelligence, and fighting skills. My own experience with bands comes from the swampy lowland area of New Guinea, where the Fayu live, a region known as the Lakes Plains. There, I still encounter extended families of a few adults with their dependent children and elderly, living in crude temporary shelters along streams and traveling by canoe and on foot. Why do peoples of the Lakes Plains continue to live as nomadic bands when most other New Guinea peoples and almost all other peoples elsewhere in the world now live in settled larger groups? The explanation is that the region lacks dense local concentrations of resources that would permit many people to live together, and that, until the arrival of missionaries bringing crop plants, it also lacked native plants that could have permitted productive farming. The band's food staple is the sago palm tree, whose core yields a starchy pith when the palm reaches maturity. The bands are nomadic because they must move when they have cut the mature sago trees in an area. Band numbers are kept low by diseases, especially malaria, by the lack of raw materials in the swamp, even stone for tools must be obtained by trade, and by the limited amount of food that the swamp yields for humans. Similar limitations on the resources accessible to existing human technology prevail in the regions of the world recently occupied by other bands. Our closest animal relatives, the gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos of Africa, also live in bands. All humans presumably did so too, until improved technology for extracting food allowed some hunter-gatherers to settle in permanent dwellings in some resource-rich areas. The band is the political, economic, and social organization that we inherited from our millions of years of evolutionary history. Our development beyond it all took place within the last few tens of thousands of years. The first of those stages beyond the band is termed the tribe, which differs in being larger, typically comprising hundreds rather than dozens of people, and usually having fixed settlements. However, some tribes and even chiefdoms consist of herders who move seasonally. Tribal organization is exemplified by New Guinea Highlanders, whose political unit before the arrival of colonial government was a village or else a close-knit cluster of villages. This political definition of tribe is thus often much smaller than what linguists and cultural anthropologists would define as a tribe, namely, a group that shares language and culture. For example, in 1964, I began to work among a group of Highlanders known as the Foray. By linguistic and cultural standards, there were then 12,000 Foray speaking two mutually intelligible dialects and living in 65 villages of several hundred people each. But there was no political unity whatsoever among villages of the Foray language group. Each hamlet was involved in a kaleidoscopically changing pattern of war and shifting alliances with all neighboring hamlets, regardless of whether the neighbors were Foray or speakers of a different language. Tribes, recently independent and now variously subordinated to national states, still occupy much of New Guinea, Melanesia, and Amazonia. Similar tribal organization in the past is inferred from archaeological evidence of settlements that were substantial but lack the archaeological hallmarks of chiefdoms that I shall explain below. That evidence suggests that tribal organization began to emerge around 13,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent and later in some other areas. 
A prerequisite for living in settlements is either food production or else a productive environment with especially concentrated resources that can be hunted and gathered within a small area. That's why settlements, and by inference tribes, began to proliferate in the Fertile Crescent at that time, when climate changes and improved technology combined to permit abundant harvests of wild cereals. Besides differing from a band by virtue of its settled residence and its larger numbers, a tribe also differs in that it consists of more than one formally recognized kinship group, termed clans, which exchange marriage partners. Land belongs to a particular clan, not to the whole tribe. However, the number of people in a tribe is still low enough that everyone knows everyone else by name and relationships. For other types of human groups as well, a few hundred seems to be an upper limit for group size compatible with everyone's knowing everybody. In our state society, for instance, school principals are likely to know all their students by name if the school contains a few hundred children, but not if it contains a few thousand children. One reason why the organization of human government tends to change from that of a tribe to that of a chiefdom in societies with more than a few hundred members is that the difficult issue of conflict resolution between strangers becomes increasingly acute in larger groups. A fact further diffusing potential problems of conflict resolution in tribes is that almost everyone is related to everyone else, by blood or marriage or both. Those ties of relationships binding all tribal members make police, laws, and other conflict-resolving institutions of larger societies unnecessary, since any two villagers getting into an argument will share many kin, who apply pressure on them to keep it from becoming violent. In traditional New Guinea society, if a New Guinean happened to encounter an unfamiliar New Guinean while both were away from their respective villages, the two engaged in a long discussion of their relatives, in an attempt to establish some relationship and hence some reason why the two should not attempt to kill each other. Despite all of these differences between bands and tribes, many similarities remain. Tribes still have an informal, egalitarian system of government. Information and decision-making are both communal. In the New Guinea highlands, I have watched village meetings where all adults in the village were present, sitting on the ground, and individuals made speeches without any appearance of one person's chairing the discussion. Many highland villages do have someone known as the big man, the most influential man of the village, but that position is not a formal office to be filled and carries only limited power. The big man has no independent decision-making authority, knows no diplomatic secrets, and can do no more than attempt to sway communal decisions. Big men achieve that status by their own attributes. The position is not inherited. Tribes also share with bands an egalitarian social system without ranked lineages or classes. Not only is status not inherited, no member of a traditional tribe or band can become disproportionately wealthy by his or her own efforts because each individual has debts and obligations to many others. It is therefore impossible for an outsider to guess, from appearances, which of all the adult men in a village is the big man. He lives in the same type of hut, wears the same clothes or ornaments, or is as naked as everyone else. Like bands, tribes lack a bureaucracy, police force, and taxes. Their economy is based on reciprocal exchanges between individuals or families, rather than on a redistribution of tribute paid to some central authority. Economic specialization is slight. Full-time crafts specialists are lacking, and every able-bodied adult, including the big man, participates in growing, gathering, or hunting food. I recall one occasion when I was walking past a garden in the Solomon Islands, saw a man digging and waving at me in the distance, and realized to my astonishment that it was a friend of mine named Falatau. He was the most famous woodcarver of the Solomons, an artist of great originality, but that did not free him of the necessity to grow his own sweet potatoes. Since tribes thus lack economic specialists, they also lack slaves, because there are no specialized menial jobs for a slave to perform. Just as musical composers of the classical period range from C.P.E. Bach to Schubert and thereby cover the whole spectrum from Baroque composers to Romantic composers, Tribes also shade into bands at one extreme and into chiefdoms at the opposite extreme. 
In particular, a tribe big man's role in dividing the meat of pigs slaughtered for feasts points to the role of chiefs in collecting and redistributing food and goods, now reconstrued as tribute, in chiefdoms. Similarly, presence or absence of public architecture is supposedly one of the distinctions between tribes and chiefdoms, but large New Guinea villages often have cult houses, known as House Tamburan, on the Sepik River, that presage the temples of chiefdoms. Although a few bands and tribes survive today on remote and ecologically marginal lands outside state control, fully independent chiefdoms had disappeared by the early 20th century because they tended to occupy prime land coveted by states. However, as of A.D. 1492, chiefdoms were still widespread over much of the eastern United States, in productive areas of South and Central America and sub-Saharan Africa that had not yet been subsumed under native states, and in all of Polynesia. The archaeological evidence discussed below suggests that chiefdoms arose by around 5,500 B.C. in the Fertile Crescent and by around 1,000 B.C. in Mesoamerica and the Andes. Let us consider the distinctive features of chiefdoms, very different from modern European and American states and, at the same time, from bands and simple tribal societies. As regards population size, chiefdoms were considerably larger than tribes, ranging from several thousand to several tens of thousands of people. That size created serious potential for internal conflict because, for any person living in a chiefdom, the vast majority of other people in the chiefdom were neither closely related by blood or marriage, nor known by name. With the rise of chiefdoms around 7,500 years ago, people had to learn, for the first time in history, how to encounter strangers regularly without attempting to kill them. Part of the solution to that problem was for one person, the chief, to exercise a monopoly on the right to use force. In contrast to a tribe's big man, a chief held a recognized office filled by hereditary right. Instead of the decentralized anarchy of a village meeting, the chief was a permanent centralized authority, made all significant decisions, and had a monopoly on critical information, such as what a neighboring chief was privately threatening or what harvest the gods had supposedly promised. Unlike big men, chiefs could be recognized from afar by visible distinguishing features, such as a large fan worn over the back on Rennell Island in the southwest Pacific. A commoner encountering a chief was obliged to perform ritual marks of respect, such as, on Hawaii, prostrating oneself. The chief's orders might be transmitted through one or two levels of bureaucrats, many of whom were themselves low-ranked chiefs. However, in contrast to state bureaucrats, chiefdom bureaucrats had generalized rather than specialized roles. In Polynesian Hawaii, the same bureaucrats, termed konohiki, extracted tribute and oversaw irrigation and organized labor corvées for the chief, whereas state societies have separate tax collectors, water district managers, and draft boards. A chiefdom's large population in a small area required plenty of food, obtained by food production in most cases, by hunting-gathering in a few especially rich areas. For example, American Indians of the Pacific Northwest Coast, such as the Kwakutl, Nootka, and Tlingit Indians, lived under chiefs in villages without any agriculture or domestic animals because the rivers and sea were so rich in salmon and halibut. The food surpluses generated by some people, relegated to the rank of commoners, went to feed the chiefs, their families, bureaucrats, and crafts specialists, who variously made canoes, adzes, or spittoons, or worked as bird catchers or tattooers. Luxury goods, consisting of those specialized crafts products, or else rare objects obtained by long-distance trade, were reserved for chiefs. For example, Hawaiian chiefs had feather cloaks, some of them consisting of tens of thousands of feathers and requiring many human generations for their manufacture, by commoner cloakmakers, of course. That concentration of luxury goods often makes it possible to recognize chiefdoms archaeologically by the fact that some graves, those of chiefs, contain much richer goods than other graves, those of commoners, in contrast to the egalitarian burials of earlier human history. Some ancient complex chiefdoms can also be distinguished from tribal villages by the remains of elaborate public architecture, such as temples, 
and by a regional hierarchy of settlements, with one site, the site of the paramount chief, being obviously larger and having more administrative buildings and artifacts than other sites. Like tribes, chiefdoms consisted of multiple hereditary lineages living at one site. However, whereas the lineages of tribal villages are equal-ranked clans, in a chiefdom all members of the chief's lineage had hereditary perquisites. In effect, the society was divided into hereditary chief and commoner classes, with the Hawaiian chiefs themselves subdivided into eight hierarchically ranked lineages, each concentrating its marriages within its own lineage. Furthermore, since chiefs required menial servants as well as specialized craftspeople, chiefdoms differed from tribes in having many jobs that could be filled by slaves, typically obtained by capture in raids. The most distinctive economic feature of chiefdoms was their shift from reliance solely on the reciprocal exchanges characteristic of bands and tribes, by which A gives B a gift while expecting that B, at some unspecified future time, will give a gift of comparable value to A. We modern state-dwellers indulge in such behavior on birthdays and holidays, but most of our flow of goods is achieved instead by buying and selling from money according to the law of supply and demand. While continuing reciprocal exchanges and without marketing or money, chiefdoms developed an additional new system termed a redistributive economy. A simple example would involve a chief receiving wheat at harvest time from every farmer in the chiefdom, then throwing a feast for everybody and serving bread, or else storing the wheat and gradually giving it out again in the months between harvests. When a large portion of the goods received from commoners was not redistributed to them but was retained and consumed by the chiefly lineages and craftspeople, the redistribution became tribute, a precursor of taxes that made its first appearance in chiefdoms. From the commoners, the chiefs claimed not only goods but also labor for construction of public works, which again might return to benefit the commoners. For example, irrigation systems to help feed everybody, or instead benefit mainly the chiefs, for instance, lavish tombs. We have been talking about chiefdoms generically as if they were all the same. In fact, chiefdoms varied considerably. Larger ones tended to have more powerful chiefs, more ranks of chiefly lineages, greater distinctions between chiefs and commoners, more retention of tribute by the chiefs, more layers of bureaucrats, and grander public architecture. For instance, societies on small Polynesian islands were effectively rather similar to tribal societies with a big man, except that the position of chief was hereditary. The chief's hut looked like any other hut. There were no bureaucrats or public works. The chief redistributed most goods he received back to the commoners, and land was controlled by the community. But on the largest Polynesian islands, such as Hawaii, Tahiti, and Tonga, chiefs were recognizable at a glance by their ornaments, Public works were erected by large labor forces, most tribute was retained by the chiefs, and all land was controlled by them. A further gradation among societies with ranked lineages was from those where the political unit was a single autonomous village to those consisting of a regional assemblage of villages in which the largest village with a paramount chief controlled the smaller villages with lesser chiefs. The political, economic, and social institutions most familiar to us today are those of states, which now rule all of the world's land area except for Antarctica. Many early states and all modern ones have had literate elites, and many modern states have literate masses as well. Vanished states tended to leave visible archaeological hallmarks, such as ruins of temples with standardized designs, at least four levels of settlement sizes, and pottery styles covering tens of thousands of square miles. We thereby know that states arose around 3700 B.C. in Mesopotamia and around 300 B.C. in Mesoamerica, over 2,000 years ago in the Andes, China, and Southeast Asia, and over 1,000 years ago in West Africa. In modern times, the formation of states out of chiefdoms has been observed repeatedly. Thus, we possess much more information about past states and their formation and about past chiefdoms, tribes, and bands. Proto-states extend many features of large, paramount, multi-village chiefdoms. They continue the increase in size from bands to tribes to chiefdoms. 
Whereas chiefdom's populations range from a few thousand to a few tens of thousands, the population of most modern states exceed one million, and China's exceeds one billion. The paramount chief's location may become the state's capital city. Other population centers of states outside the capital may also qualify as true cities, which are lacking in chiefdoms. Cities differ from villages in their monumental public works, palaces of rulers, accumulation of capital from tribute or taxes, and concentration of people other than food producers. Early states had a hereditary leader with a title equivalent to king, like a super-paramount chief and exercising an even greater monopoly of information, decision-making, and power. Even in democracies today, crucial knowledge is available only to a few individuals who control the flow of information to the rest of the government and consequently control decisions. For instance, in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1963, information and discussions that determined whether nuclear war would engulf half a billion people were initially confined by President Kennedy to a ten-member executive committee of the National Security Council that he himself appointed. Then he limited final decisions to a four-member group consisting of himself and three of his cabinet ministers. Central control is more far-reaching, and economic redistribution in the form of tribute, renamed taxes, more extensive in states than in chiefdoms. Economic specialization is more extreme, to the point where today not even farmers remain self-sufficient. Hence the effect on society is catastrophic when state government collapses, as happened in Britain upon the removal of Roman troops, administrators, and coinage between A.D. 407 and 411. Even the earliest Mesopotamian states exercised centralized control of their economies. Their food was produced by four specialist groups, cereal farmers, herders, fishermen, and orchard and garden growers, from each of which the state took the produce and to each of which it gave out the necessary supplies, tools, and foods other than the type of food that this group produced. The state supplied seeds and plow animals to the cereal farmers, took wool from the herders, exchanged the wool by long-distance trade for metal and other essential raw materials, and paid out food rations to the laborers who maintained the irrigation systems on which the farmers depended. Many, perhaps most, early states adopted slavery on a much larger scale than did chiefdoms. That was not because chiefdoms were more kindly disposed toward defeated enemies, but because the greater economic specialization of states, with more mass production and more public works, provided more uses for slave labor. In addition, the larger scale of state warfare made more captives available. A chiefdom's one or two levels of administration are greatly multiplied in states, as anyone who has seen an organizational chart of any government knows. Along with the proliferation of vertical levels of bureaucrats, there is also horizontal specialization. Instead of Konohiki carrying out every aspect of administration for a Hawaiian district, state governments have several separate departments, each with its own hierarchy, to handle water management, taxes, military draft, and so on. Even small states have more complex bureaucracies than large chiefdoms. For instance, the West African state of Maradi had a central administration with over 130 titled offices. Internal conflict resolution within states has become increasingly formalized by laws, a judiciary, and police. The laws are often written because many states, with conspicuous exceptions, such as that of the Incas, have had literate elites, writing having been developed around the same time as the formation of the earliest states in both Mesopotamia and Mesoamerica. In contrast, no early chiefdom, not on the verge of statehood, developed writing. Early states had state religions and standardized temples. Many early kings were considered divine and were accorded special treatment in innumerable respects. For example, the Aztec and Inca emperors were both carried about in litters. Servants went ahead of the Inca emperor's litter and swept the ground clear and the Japanese language includes special forms of the pronoun you for use only in addressing the emperor. Early kings were themselves the head of the state religion, or else had separate high priests. The Mesopotamian temple was the center not only of religion, but also of economic redistribution, writing, and crafts technology. All these features of states carry to an extreme the developments that led from tribes to chiefdoms. In addition, though, states have diverged from chiefdoms in several new directions. 
The most fundamental such distinction is that states are organized on political and territorial lines, not on the kinship lines that defined bands, tribes, and simple chiefdoms. Furthermore, bands and tribes always, and chiefdoms usually, consist of a single ethnic and linguistic group. States, though, especially the so-called empires formed by amalgamation or conquest of states, are regularly multi-ethnic and multilingual. State bureaucrats are not selected mainly on the basis of kinship, as in chiefdoms, but are professionals, selected at least partly on the basis of training and ability. In later states, including most today, the leadership often became non-hereditary, and many states abandoned the entire system of formal hereditary classes carried over from chiefdoms. How did small, non-centralized, kin-based societies evolve into large centralized ones, in which most members are not closely related to each other? Having reviewed the stages in this transformation from bands to states, we now ask what impelled societies thus to transform themselves. At many moments in history, states have arisen independently, or as cultural anthropologists say, pristinely, that is, in the absence of any pre-existing surrounding states. Pristine state origins took place at least once, possibly many times, on each of the continents except Australia and North America. Prehistoric states included those of Mesopotamia, North China, the Nile and Indus Valleys, Mesoamerica, the Andes, and West Africa. Native states in contact with European states have arisen from chiefdoms repeatedly in the last three centuries in Madagascar, Hawaii, Tahiti, and many parts of Africa. Chiefdoms have arisen pristinely even more often, in all of the same regions and in North America's southeast and Pacific Northwest, the Amazon, Polynesia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. All these origins of complex societies give us a rich database for understanding their development. Of the many theories addressing the problem of state origins, the simplest denies that there is any problem to solve. Aristotle considered states the natural condition of human society, requiring no explanation. His error was understandable, because all the societies with which he would have been acquainted, Greek societies of the 4th century BC, were states. However, we now know that as of AD 1492, much of the world was instead organized into chiefdoms, tribes, or bands. State formation does demand an explanation. The next theory is the most familiar one. The French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau speculated that states are formed by a social contract, a rational decision reached when people calculated their self-interest, came to the agreement that they would be better off in a state than in simpler societies, and voluntarily did away with their simpler societies. But observation and historical records have failed to uncover a single case of a state's being formed in that ethereal atmosphere of dispassionate farsightedness. Smaller units do not voluntarily abandon their sovereignty and merge into larger units. They do so only by conquest or under external duress. A third theory, still popular with some historians and economists, sets out from the undoubted fact that in both Mesopotamia and North China and Mexico, large-scale irrigation systems began to be constructed around the time that states started to emerge. The theory also notes that any big, complex system for irrigation or hydraulic management requires a centralized bureaucracy to construct and maintain it. The theory then turns an observed rough correlation in time into a postulated chain of cause and effect. Supposedly, Mesopotamians and North Chinese and Mexicans foresaw the advantages that a large-scale irrigation system would bring them, even though there was at the time no such system within thousands of miles, or anywhere on Earth, to illustrate for them those advantages. Those far-sighted people chose to merge their inefficient little chiefdoms into a larger state capable of blessing them with large-scale irrigation. However, this hydraulic theory of state formation is subject to the same objections leveled against social contract theories in general. More specifically, it addresses only the final stage in the evolution of complex societies. It says nothing about what drove the progression from bands to tribes to chiefdoms during all the millennia before the prospect of large-scale irrigation loomed up on the horizon. When historical or archaeological dates are examined in detail, they fail to support the view of irrigation as the driving force for state formation. In Mesopotamia, North China, Mexico, and Madagascar, 
small-scale irrigation systems already existed before the rise of states. Construction of large-scale irrigation systems did not accompany the emergence of states, but came only significantly later in each of those areas. In most of the states formed over the Maya area of Mesoamerica and the Andes, irrigation systems always remained small-scale ones that local communities could build and maintain themselves. Thus, even in those areas where complex systems of hydraulic management did emerge, they were a secondary consequence of states that must have formed for other reasons. What seems to me to point to a fundamentally correct view of state formation is an undoubted fact of much wider validity than the correlation between irrigation and the formation of some states, namely that the size of the regional population is the strongest single predictor of societal complexity. As we have seen, bands number a few dozen individuals, tribes a few hundred, chiefdoms a few thousand to a few tens of thousands, and states generally over about fifty thousand. In addition to that coarse correlation between regional population size and type of society, band, tribe, and so on, there is a finer trend, within each of those categories, between population and societal complexity. For instance, the chiefdoms with large populations proved to be the most centralized, stratified, and complex ones. These correlations suggest strongly that regional population size or population density or population pressure has something to do with the formation of complex societies. But the correlations do not tell us precisely how population variables function in a chain of cause and effect whose outcome is a complex society. To trace out that chain, let us now remind ourselves how large, dense populations themselves arise. Then we can examine why a large but simple society could not maintain itself. With that as background, we shall finally return to the question of how a simpler society actually becomes more complex as the regional population increases. We have seen that large or dense populations arise only under conditions of food production, or at least under exceptionally productive conditions for hunting-gathering. Some productive hunter-gatherer societies reached the organizational level of chiefdoms, but none reached the level of states. All states nourish their citizens by food production. These considerations, along with the just-mentioned correlation between regional population size and societal complexity, have led to a protracted chicken-or-egg debate about the causal relations between food production, population variables, and societal complexity. Is it intensive food production that is the cause, triggering population growth and somehow leading to a complex society? Or are large populations and complex societies instead the cause, somehow leading to intensification of food production? Posing the question in that either-or form misses the point. Intensified food production and societal complexity stimulate each other by autocatalysis. That is, population growth leads to societal complexity by mechanisms that we shall discuss, while societal complexity in turn leads to intensified food production and thereby to population growth. Complex centralized societies are uniquely capable of organizing public works, including irrigation systems, long-distance trade, including the importation of metals to make better agricultural tools, and activities of different groups of economic specialists, such as feeding herders with farmers' cereal and transferring the herders' livestock to farmers for use as plow animals. All of these capabilities of centralized societies have fostered intensified food production and hence population growth throughout history. In addition, food production contributes in at least three ways to specific features of complex societies. First, it involves seasonally pulsed inputs of labor. When the harvest has been stored, the farmer's labor becomes available for a centralized political authority to harness. In order to build public works advertising state power, such as the Egyptian pyramids, or to build public works that could feed more mouths, such as Polynesian Hawaii's irrigation systems or fish ponds, or to undertake wars of conquest to form larger political entities. Second, food production may be organized so as to generate stored food surpluses which permit economic specialization and social stratification. The surpluses can be used to feed all tiers of a complex society, the chiefs, bureaucrats, and other members of the elite, 
the scribes, craftspeople, and other non-food producing specialists, and the farmers themselves during times that they are drafted to construct public works. Finally, food production permits or requires people to adopt sedentary living, which is a prerequisite for accumulating substantial possessions, developing elaborate technology and crafts, and constructing public works. The importance of fixed residence to a complex society explains why missionaries and governments, whenever they make first contact with previously uncontacted nomadic tribes or bands in New Guinea or the Amazon, universally have two immediate goals. One goal, of course, is the obvious one of pacifying the nomads, that is, dissuading them from killing missionaries, bureaucrats, or each other. The other goal is to induce the nomads to settle in villages so that the missionaries and bureaucrats can find the nomads, bring them services such as medical care and schools, and proselytize and control them. Thus, food production, which increases population size, also acts in many ways to make features of complex societies possible. But that doesn't prove that food production and large populations make complex societies inevitable. How can we account for the empirical observation that band or tribal organization just does not work for societies of hundreds of thousands of people, and that all existing large societies have complex, centralized organization? We can cite at least four obvious reasons. One reason is the problem of conflict between unrelated strangers. That problem grows astronomically as the number of people making up the society increases. Relationships within a band of 20 people involve only 190 two-person interactions. 20 people times 19 divided by 2. But a band of 2,000 would have 1,999,000 dyads. Each of those dyads represents a potential time bomb that could explode in a murderous argument. Each murder in band and tribal societies usually leads to an attempted revenge killing, starting one more unending cycle of murder and counter-murder that destabilizes the society. In a band where everyone is closely related to everyone else, people related simultaneously to both quarreling parties step in to mediate quarrels. In a tribe where many people are still close relatives and everyone at least knows everybody else by name, mutual relatives and mutual friends mediate the quarrel. But once the threshold of several hundred, below which everyone can know everyone else, has been crossed, increasing numbers of dyads become pairs of unrelated strangers. When strangers fight, few people present will be friends or relatives of both combatants with self-interest in stopping the fight. Instead, many onlookers will be friends or relatives of only one combatant and will side with that person, escalating the two-person fight into a general brawl. Hence, a large society that continues to leave conflict resolution to all of its members is guaranteed to blow up. That factor alone would explain why societies of thousands can exist only if they develop centralized authority to monopolize force and resolve conflicts. A second reason is the growing impossibility of communal decision-making with increasing population size. Decision-making by the entire adult population is still possible in New Guinea villages small enough that news and information quickly spread to everyone, that everyone can hear everyone else in a meeting of the whole village, and that everyone who wants to speak at the meeting has the opportunity to do so. But all those prerequisites for communal decision-making become unattainable in much larger communities. Even now, in these days of microphones and loudspeakers, we all know that a group meeting is no way to resolve issues for a group of thousands of people. Hence, a large society must be structured and centralized if it is to reach decisions effectively. A third reason involves economic considerations. Any society requires means to transfer goods between its members. One individual may happen to acquire more of some essential commodity on one day and less on another. Because individuals have different talents, one individual consistently tends to wind up with an excess of some essentials and a deficit of others. In small societies with few pairs of members, the resulting necessary transfers of goods can be arranged directly between pairs of individuals or families by reciprocal exchanges. But the same mathematics that makes direct pairwise conflict resolution inefficient in large societies makes direct pairwise economic transfers also inefficient. Large societies can function economically only if they have a redistributive economy in addition to a reciprocal economy. Goods in excess of an individual's needs must be transferred from the individual to a centralized authority, 
which then redistributes the goods to individuals with deficits. A final consideration mandating complex organization for large societies has to do with population densities. Large societies of food producers have not only more members but also higher population densities than do small bands of hunter-gatherers. Each band of a few dozen hunters occupies a large territory within which they can acquire most of the resources essential to them. They can obtain their remaining necessities by trading with neighboring bands during intervals between band warfare. As population density increases, the territory of that band-sized population of a few dozen would shrink to a small area, with more and more of life's necessities having to be obtained outside the area. For instance, one couldn't just divide Holland's 16,000 square miles and 16 million people into 800,000 individual territories, each encompassing 13 acres and serving as home to an autonomous band of 20 people who remained self-sufficient, confined within their 13 acres, occasionally taking advantage of a temporary truce to come to the borders of their tiny territory in order to exchange some trade items and brides with the next band. Such spatial realities require that densely populated regions support large and complexly organized societies. Considerations of conflict resolution, decision-making, economics, and space thus converge in requiring large societies to be centralized. But centralization of power inevitably opens the door, for those who hold the power are privy to information, make the decisions, and redistribute the goods, to exploit the resulting opportunities to reward themselves and their relatives. To anyone familiar with any modern grouping of people, that's obvious. As early societies developed, those acquiring centralized power gradually established themselves as an elite, perhaps originating as one of several formerly equal-ranked village clans that became more equal than the others. Epilogue Yali's question went to the heart of the current human condition and of post-Pleistocene human history. Now that we have completed this brief tour over the continents, how shall we answer Yali? I would say to Yali, the striking differences between the long-term histories of peoples of the different continents have been due not to innate differences in the people themselves, but to differences in their environments. I expect that if the populations of Aboriginal Australia and Eurasia could have been interchanged during the late Pleistocene, the original Aboriginal Australians would now be the ones occupying most of the Americas and Australia, as well as Eurasia, while the original Aboriginal Eurasians would be the ones now reduced to downtrodden population fragments in Australia. One might at first be inclined to dismiss this assertion as meaningless, because the experiment is imaginary and my claim about its outcome cannot be verified. But historians are nevertheless able to evaluate related hypotheses by retrospective tests. For instance, one can examine what did happen when European farmers were transplanted to Greenland or the U.S. Great Plains, and when farmers stemming ultimately from China emigrated to the Chatham Islands, the rainforests of Borneo, or the volcanic soils of Java or Hawaii. These tests confirm that the same ancestral peoples either ended up extinct or returned to living as hunter-gatherers, or went on to build complex states depending on their environments. Similarly, Aboriginal Australian hunter-gatherers variously transplanted to Flinders Island, Tasmania, or southeastern Australia ended up extinct or as hunter-gatherers with the modern world's simplest technology or as canal builders intensively managing a productive fishery depending on their environments. Of course, the continents differ in innumerable environmental features affecting trajectories of human societies, but a mere laundry list of every possible difference does not constitute an answer to Yali's question. Just four sets of differences appear to me to be the most important ones. The first set consists of continental differences in the wild plant and animal species available as starting materials for domestication. That's because food production was critical for the accumulation of food surpluses that could feed non-food producing specialists and for the buildup of large populations enjoying a military advantage through mere numbers even before they had developed any technological or political advantage. For both of those reasons, all developments of economically complex, socially stratified, politically centralized societies beyond the level of small nascent chiefdoms were based on food production. 
but most wild animal and plant species have proved unsuitable for domestication. Food production has been based on relatively few species of livestock and crops. It turns out that the number of wild candidate species for domestication varied greatly among the continents because of differences in continental areas and also, in the case of big mammals, in late Pleistocene extinctions. These extinctions were much more severe in Australia and the Americas than in Eurasia or Africa. As a result, Africa ended up biologically somewhat less well-endowed than the much larger Eurasia, the Americas still less so, and Australia even less so, as did Yali's New Guinea, with one-seventh of Eurasia's area and with all of its original big mammals extinct in the late Pleistocene. On each continent, animal and plant domestication was concentrated in a few especially favorable homelands, accounting for only a small fraction of the continent's total area. In the case of technological innovations and political institutions as well, most societies acquire much more from other societies than they invent themselves. Thus, diffusion and migration within a continent contribute importantly to the development of its societies, which tend in the long run to share each other's developments, insofar as environments permit, because of the processes illustrated in such simple form by Maori New Zealand's musket wars. That is, societies initially lacking an advantage either acquire it from societies possessing it, or, if they fail to do so, are replaced by those other societies. Hence, a second set of factors consists of those affecting rates of diffusion and migration, which differed greatly among continents. They were most rapid in Eurasia because of its east-west major axis and its relatively modest ecological and geographical barriers. The reasoning is straightforward for movements of crops and livestock, which depend strongly on climate and hence on latitude. But similar reasoning also applies to the diffusion of technological innovations, insofar as they are best suited without modification to specific environments. Diffusion was slower in Africa, and especially in the Americas, because of those continents' north-south major axes and geographic and ecological barriers. It was also difficult in traditional New Guinea, where rugged terrain and the long backbone of high mountains prevented any significant progress toward political and linguistic unification. Related to these factors affecting diffusion within continents is a third set of factors influencing diffusion between continents, which may also help build up a local pool of domesticates and technology. Ease of intercontinental diffusion has varied because some continents are more isolated than others. Within the last 6,000 years, it has been easiest from Eurasia to Sub-Saharan Africa, supplying most of Africa's species of livestock. But interhemispheric diffusion made no contribution to Native America's complex societies, isolated from Eurasia at low latitudes by broad oceans and at high latitudes by geography and by a climate suitable just for hunting-gathering. To Aboriginal Australia, isolated from Eurasia by the water barriers of the Indonesian archipelago, Eurasia's sole proven contribution was the dingo. The fourth and last set of factors consists of continental differences in area or total population size. A larger area or population means more potential inventors, more competing societies, more innovations available to adopt, and more pressure to adopt and retain innovations because societies failing to do so will tend to be eliminated by competing societies. That fate befell African pygmies and many other hunter-gatherer populations displaced by farmers. Conversely, it also befell the stubborn, conservative Greenland Norse farmers, replaced by Eskimo hunter-gatherers, whose subsistence methods and technology were far superior to those of the Norse under Greenland conditions. Among the world's land masses, area and the number of competing societies were largest for Eurasia, much smaller for Australia and New Guinea, and especially for Tasmania. The Americas, despite their large aggregate area, were fragmented by geography and ecology and functioned effectively as several poorly connected smaller continents. Those four sets of factors constitute big environmental differences that can be quantified objectively and that are not subject to dispute. While one can contest my subjective impression that New Guineans are on the average smarter than Eurasians, one cannot deny that New Guinea has a much smaller area and far fewer big animal species than Eurasia. But mention of these environmental differences invites among historians the label geographic determinism, which raises hackles. 
The label seems to have unpleasant connotations, such as that human creativity counts for nothing or that we humans are passive robots helplessly programmed by climate, fauna, and flora. Of course, these fears are misplaced. Without human inventiveness, all of us today would still be cutting our meat with stone tools and eating it raw, like our ancestors of a million years ago. All human societies contain inventive people. It's just that some environments provide more starting materials and more favorable conditions for utilizing inventions than do other environments.